Hey, everybody, we're doing another firefighter podcast today. I've got two great guests, Frank Ricci, who is a former uh, union leader from uh, the firefighters union from New Haven, and PJ Norwood, another Connecticut firefighter, retired. And um, this is the biggest firefighter podcast in the country, but we're, we're playing it simultaneously on, on my own podcast. So I want to thank both of our, uh, our guests. They're going to be asking me questions today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, PJ. Welcome to my show. Honored to be on your show, sir. Thank you very much. And make sure you check out the book, Command Presence, Increase Your Influence. Welcome to Politics and Tactics. We have a great show for you today. PJ, can you introduce our distinguished guest? We have a guest today that has continuously been fighting for our health by fighting against corporations for over 40 years. He is someone who is not afraid to rock the boat. He's been so successful against corporate America, the media and the government have worked very hard to silence him, which has not worked out so well. So now they attack his character. These attacks have not stopped him, but yes, has impacted the public opinion of our guest today. Today is our high honor to have Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on our show a man whose unwavering commitment to the environment, science, and upholding our founding principles enshrined in the First Amendment has left a permanent mark on our nation. Born into a legacy of public service, RFK Jr. faced significant adversity and challenges throughout his life, but yet he has persevered with remarkable resilience. His fight to clean up America's rivers and hold chemical companies accountable for their pollution required not only immense political courage, but also an unyielding dedication to the well-being of our communities and natural resources. RFK Jr. encourages healthy debate and honest conversation. He was involved with one of our friends, attorney Rob Boulat, who held 3M accountable for the deception of the environmental and health impacts from PFAS. This fight was highlighted in the movie Dark Waters. RFK Jr. has also demonstrated immense courage in questioning political narratives pushing back against those who pervert science for their own advantage. His staunch defense of the First Amendment and his relentless advocacy for transparency and truth have further solidified his reputation as a fearless champion for America. Through his tireless efforts, RFK Jr. has shown that one person's perseverance can indeed make America a better place. RFK Jr., thank you for joining us today. As president, please highlight what is your vision for your administration, and how does that vision benefit members of the fire service? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, BJ, and thanks, Frank, for having me on this show. I've been looking forward to this. Um, as you know, I represented a lot of the firefighters during the pandemic on mandate issues uh, in Los Angeles. We helped out in Chicago. We won the case in, uh, in New York. And I've worked uh, across the country on uh, on the PFAS issues, and in, 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 you know, beginning with Rob Balot's case, and then one of my organizations, the Tennessee Riverkeeper, um, uh, brought the case against 3M. At 3M is now uh, agreed next year to stop producing PFAS and PFOAs and all these or ever chemicals that it's been selling to us and poisoning firefighters for many years. Uh, the uh, firefighters now have the, uh, probably the highest cancer rate of any profession. 67% uh, of firefighters will get cancer. It's astronomical. And uh, clearly a lot of that is from, is from the PFAS. And I hope we get to talk more about that later in the show. Um, in terms of my presidency, I, you know, I, I ran for president. I, I didn't intend to run for president. I wasn't sitting around uh, waiting for an opportunity to run for the White House. Um, I, I ran because I saw our country abandoning its values, particularly during COVID when we saw this, this use for the first time of government forced orthodox of, um, censorship. Uh, we saw the violation of uh, the First Amendment, right to worship, when all the 
churches were closed for a year with no due process, no just compensation, no scientific citation. We saw property rights uh, in the Fifth Amendment uh, abandoned uh, as the government closed down 3.3 million businesses, again, with no public hearings, no environmental impact statements, no, no scientific citations, and then they got rid of jury trials. The Seventh Amendment guarantee of jury trials and, and the Fourth Amendment prohibition against un, uh, warrantless searches and seizures with all this track and trace surveillance. And uh, firefighters uh, across the country were at the front line firefighters and cops, you know, and we had this wonderful um, police chief, John Catanza, and, uh, in, in Chicago, who said, my men are not going to, my, my men and women are not going to get vaccinated. And 1,500 of them threatened to walk off the job, and they, uh, and they, and they just, the city just backed down and said, okay, cops and firefighters don't have to take the jab. Um, so I saw that happening, and then I saw uh, so many other things. I saw my party, the Democratic Party, that I've been a lifelong member, abandon the middle class, abandon cops, abandon firefighters, abandon labor unions, and become the, the party of big tech and these kind of global elites. Uh, I saw the destruction of the middle class in this country, particularly during COVID, when we kept Walmart open, we kept Amazon open, we closed down all these 3.3 million businesses, 41% of black owned businesses will never reopen. Um, I want, and, and I saw this explosion of chronic disease that we're seeing now in our country when my uncle was president, 6% of American kids had chronic disease today and 60%. When I was a little boy, uh, a typical pediatrician would see one case of diabetes in his lifetime, in a 40 or 50 year career. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door is pre-diabetic or diabetic, and nobody's asking, why is this happening? Uh, the autism rates, well, you all know kids with autism, our parents of kids with autism, we didn't know that when I was a kid. I, I knew nobody, and I was at the spear tip of the, the battle to get, to get rights for people with intellectual disabilities. My aunt Eunice Shriver founded Special Olympics. I worked in Special Olympics from when I was eight years old. We never saw any autistic kid. I, in fact, in my age group, 70 year old men, the autism rates today are one in 10,000 today. And my kids' generation is one in every 34 kids, according to CDC, one in every 22 boys. Something happened where we're mass poisoning this generation of kids with autoimmune disease, neurological disease, obesity. Kids didn't suddenly get lazy and start liking food. This is poisoning that's happening, and we're we are killing them, and we're killing our firefighters with you know with the turnout gear, with the uh, uh, aqueous foams, with the. Uh, you know, with a, the, the burning furniture that is loaded with PFOA. So I'm go, I want to end this toxic assault on the American public and the chronic disease epidemic that's now costing us uh, $4.3 trillion a year, five times our military budget. Speaking of the military, I want to wind down our military commitments abroad. The forever wars are destroying our country. They're, they're destroying our our economy, they're, they're uh, destroying the safety and undermining the safety of and the reputation, the moral authority of America across the globe. When my uncle was president, um, he made the resolution not to get America into wars, but instead to project economic power abroad. And that's what we're going to do under the new Kennedy administration. There is no more because of my uncle's commitment. He, said, he told his best friend, Ben Bradley, who asked him, What's, what, what do you want in your gravestone? And my uncle said, he, he kept the peace. He said, the primary job of president of the United States is to keep the country out of war. And, you know, he kept us out of Laos in 1961. He kept us out of Cuba in 1961, out of Berlin during the Checkpoint Charlie crisis in 62. He kept us out of Cuba again in 63. 
He, he refused to send combat troops to Vietnam despite the demands of everybody in his administration, the intelligence apparatus, uh, the, the brass at the Pentagon. They said that we needed 250,000 combat troops in Vietnam or the government was going to collapse. And he said, it's their government. He ended up under pressure sending 16,000 military advisors, mainly Green Berets, and they weren't allowed to participate under the rules of engagement in fighting, but they did anyway. And in October of 1963, he learned that a Green Beret had been killed, and he asked Walt Rostow to give a full casualty list. And Walt Rostow brought him a casualty list that showed that 75 Americans had died. And he said, that's too many. I'm bringing them all home. And that afternoon, October 22nd, 1963, he signed National Security Order 263, ordering all U.S. military personnel home from Vietnam by the end of uh, 65, with the first thousand coming home in November, so the next month, the end of November. Uh, just before that evacuation happened on November 22nd, one month after he signed that order, he was murdered. President Johnson came in, remanded the order, sent 250,000 troops to Vietnam, and it became our war. And, and Nixon brought that up to 560,000. My father ran against the war in 68. He was killed. Um, um, Martin Luther King, who became a primary peace act activist in our country, was killed a month before my father. And since, and we sent all the, you know, 560,000 Americans over there. 56,000 never came back, including my cousin, uh, George Skagel, who died in the Tet Offensive. Um, but my uncle refused to send troops abroad anytime, combat troops abroad anytime to his, during his administration. And, but he did send, he said he didn't want African kids and Latin American kids when they heard the United States of America to think of a man in a military uniform. He said he wanted to, th to think of a Peace Corps volunteer and the Alliance for Progress, USAID, which he started to rise, raise up to end run the oligarchs and raise up the military to give aid directly to the poor, to build the middle classes in those countries and the economic stability that would create the foundation for a middle class, for stable middle class in those countries. As a result of that, there's now more statues to my uncle, more boulevards named after him, more hospitals, schools, universities, parks, neighborhoods in Africa, Latin America, and Asia than any other U.S. president, probably more than any other president, all the other presidents combined. And that, you know, was the power, the moral authority of our, of our foreign policy when we project economic power abroad and not military power. Oh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to end the chronic disease epidemic. I'm going to get every American kid into a home. I'm going to build 10 million homes a year. We've got a housing shortage now. And that is really the death now of the American middle class. If our kids can't get into homes, that means they can't get equity, which means they can't borrow money and they can't start a business. They can't pursue their entrepreneurial impulses, and we go from being an ownership society to a rental society, and that is, uh, that's a colonial model, it's a feudal model, and it's not what America is supposed to be. We need to get all of these kids into homes, and that is going to be the primary thing that I do, and to end the chronic disease epidemic, and we need to stop, we need to stop spending money on the military. We now have $34 trillion in debt. We're paying more for the service of that debt than our entire military budget. Within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar that we spend, that we collect in taxes is going to go to servicing that debt. Within 10 years, 100%. And, and the, guy, the two guys who are running for president against me, they can't fix this because they're the ones who ran, ran up the debt. President Trump said he's going to balance the budget. Instead, he spent more money, $8 trillion in four years, more money than every president in the United States history combined since George Washington to George W. Bush, 283 years of history. And, and President Biden is in a race to catch up with him. President Biden is now 
running up another trillion dollars every 90 days. So, you know, we're we're dead. We're, this is existential to our country, and neither of these guys can fix it. Um, I'm going to fix it. So those are, I, I say, you know, I also want to end the division in this country, to end the polarization. I think my campaign has been all about that, and that's why I attract roughly a third Republicans, a third Democrats, and a third independents, because I've refused to engage in the vitriol the hatred, the polarization, the finger pointing. I, you know, I said when I gave my announcement speech, if I'm successful at the end of this campaign, I, a lot of Americans are going to forget they're Republicans or Democrats and just remember that they're Americans. And that's, you know, that's one of my objectives. Bobby, I, I applaud you for talking to everybody. And here today, you're talking to the American Fire Service. You're talking to career firefighters and volunteers. So here, you took time from your campaign to speak to the middle class because firefighters make up that middle class. You know, you look at any, the men and women of the fire service, they would make their spouse a widow and their kids orphans for the community they serve. They're out there answering the call every day. And I always say, that the American Fire Service represents the very best in America. You call 911 and they just show up. No paperwork, just ready to help. But yet we find chemicals in our gear that were put in there not to help us, but what I believe was to give chemical companies a to protect their advantage and to reduce competition. So PJ can you ask a question about forever chemicals and kind of bring this in focus? Cause what I really appreciate and admire about Bobby Kennedy is that you give the little guy, the voice like David Whiteside. It's about the fisherman on the side of the river. Who's dependent on that water. The mom who has to give his kids breakfast in the morning. It's about clean water. And you give a voice to those who wouldn't have a voice, the middle class, the ones that couldn't afford to buy that high, get that high dollar law firm. PJ. Yeah, Bobby, thank you. And, you know, as you've already mentioned, and we've talked about in your intro, you fought really hard to clean up our rivers, especially with your work with Tennessee River Keepers and David Whiteside, who even sued DuPont for PFAS, for PFAS issues, and they won. As firefighters, we know the cancer rate is automatically higher than the average citizen. What we did not know is the mere gear, the protective clothing that we wear, is also loaded with those same PFASs contributing to those high cancer rates that you already mentioned. Thankfully, through a mutual friend, Diane Cotter, and her quest to make sense of her husband's Paul's cancer diagnosis, today PFAS is a daily conversation in firehouses across America. You have already put a lot of work in on this, but as President of the United States, what would you do to further eliminate PFAS, and how will that directly impact our firefighters? Yeah, I mean, here, first of all, let me just talk about PFAS for a while. We brought, I think it was 2015 or 2016, we brought the case that was, um, that, you know, they find, uh, that Mark Ruffalo, my, Mark Ballad, who is my law partner, uh, brought the case against in in Cleveland, Ohio, or Cincinnati, Ohio, on the um, on the PF, original PFAS case, and and they and um, um, Mark Ruffalo made the movie about him, Dark Waters. We took that case at Waterkeeper Line. Waterkeeper is the group I co-founded. And it, it began on the Hudson River in 1966 with a blue-collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who mobilized to reclaim the Hudson River from its polluters. And when, when I started working there in the early 80s, the Hudson was catching fire. It was turning colors every week, depending on what color they were painting the trucks at the GM plant in Terrytown. It was dead water for 20 mile stretches north of New York City, south of Albany, zero dissolved oxygen in the water. The fish were gone. Today, it's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean, north of the equator. And the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson inspired the creation of river keepers all over our country and the rest of the world. We now have 350 water keepers, river keepers, sound keepers, bay keepers. 
um, lake keepers. There, we own the keeper name. We license these groups to get started. Each one has to have a patrol boat. They each have to be willing to sue polluters, and they each have uh, have to have a full time water keeper. We have one of those on the Tennessee River in Nashville. The gentleman that you mentioned, David Whiteside. And David discovered high, high levels of um, of PFAS in the fish in the river and in, in, in the southern states, particularly Tennessee, have the highest levels of fish consumption in the country. They have, you know, they have big, big recreational fishing communities and people and eat the fish. It's a subsistence fishery. And people are being poisoned, methodically, systematically poisoned by the, you know, the um, 3M plant and then DuPont is the other big maker. Well, they, you know, this is a, is a huge profit center for them. And they market it as a flame retardant. So um, they, they put it in, uh, it's, it's the basis for the aqueous foams that firefighter, firefighters get hit in three different ways. One, it's in all of our furniture, you know, beginning in the 80s. And it's in all of our, um, it's in foam rubber. It's in our childhood pajamas, children's pajamas. And when firefighters go into those buildings, they are breathing, you know, when they, when it incinerates, that stuff gets in the air. That's one. Number two, it's in the uh, aqueous foams that the firefighters use, particularly at airports, et cetera, but they practice with those foams. So they're there and it volatizes out of those foams very easily. So they're breathing it and it's getting on their skin and it, there, there's dermal penetration and there's all these other kind of factors for getting into your body. And it's highly, highly carcinogenic. Uh, the, the, the last place, but and probably the largest factor, is the turnout gear. And you mentioned uh, Paul Cotter and Diane Cotter. Diane has been an incredible activist who went to war when her her husband got testicular cancer. And this is a very active, uh, life loving man who is engaged in everything, and it just. He got these, te these terrible cancers, which are now very common with firefighters. Cancers most associated with PFAS, testicular cancer, kidney cancers, bladder cancers, prostate cancers, and ultimately brain cancers as well. And firefighters have the highest cancer rate of any profession right now. Um, cancer is the, the second biggest um, killer of firefighters after cardiac arrest, and it's approaching cardiac arrest uh, and um, and it's you know we believe and the science shows that you know firefighters have other factors through cancer because they're breathing smoke all the time there's all kinds of carcinogens and incinerated material uh, probably the biggest and, and you're looking at these particular kind of cancers testicular cancer and a lot of times firefighters will notice that there's a deterioration in their crotch area of the turnout gear that these little holes form and that's that those are those PFAS volatizing, deteriorating, and they're going into your skin. So with a turnout gear that's supposed to protect your life, it's actually killing you. And uh and Diane has been this extraordinary activist exposing this to the American public. And people are waking up to this and 3M because of the litigation, 3M has uh, has pledged that they're getting out of the business. But if you look at the, you know, they've known for a long time that this carcinogenic, they've hit it, and they go, you know, they've seduced the firefighters because they go, they finance the firefighters' conventions. These companies put up their, you know, their booths and they proclaim the fact that they're paying. They there's advertisements in all the firefighters magazines saying we got your back. Well, you know, we 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 got your back pocket because we're taking your money, but we don't have your back. We're killing you, you know. And uh, so, and Diane's been great, really great about exposing that to the American public. What I'm going to do as president, I you know, I I recognize the power that these industries 
have over Congress, over the right, they own the regulatory agencies. All of these agencies have been captured by the industries they're supposed to regulate. There's been this corrupt merger of state and corporate power. And I've sued all these agencies. I've sued CDC, NIH, probably, uh, I've probably sued CDC more than any other attorney. I've sued EPA repeatedly. I've sued FDA. I've sued the USDA, which is giving us the Department of Agriculture all this poison process. There's a thousand ingredients in our food in this country that are illegal in Europe. Illegal. And we have the highest chronic disease epidemic. And nobody else has anything like this. In fact, during COVID, we had the highest death rate of any country in the world. We had 16% of the COVID deaths in the United States. We only have 4.2% of the global population. We literally had the worst record of any country in the world. Whatever we were doing in this country was wrong. People should run away from it. CDC, when you ask them, they say, oh, it wasn't our fault. It was because Americans are so sick, which is weird because they're the ones who are in charge of that. Oh, they've presided over this. They said the, the average person who died from COVID had 3.8 chronic disease. So they had, they had asthma, they had maybe obesity, they maybe have an asthma, and one other thing. But why, no other country in the world is anything like this. We are literally the sickest country in the world. We spend more on healthcare than any other country, and we have the sickest population. And it's because they're mass poisoning us. And so how do you stop that? It's very difficult to do it through legislation because, you know, when I brought the Monsanto cases, we had 40,000 clients who were home gardeners mainly who got uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from using Roundup, which the active ingredient of Roundup is a, is a chemical called glyphosate. And everybody said, even if you can prove that glyphosate causes these cancer, you can never get rid of it because 95% of the herbicides in the world are that one Roundup. And they, they own the corn industry, they own Cargill, they own Monsanto, these the biggest corporations in the world, and they own the agricultural um, committees, and it's impossible to challenge them. They own the regulatory agencies. Here's how we did it. We had 40,000 people who got home gardeners who got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from using Roundup. We, we brought multi-district litigation against them. We had enough science by that time, about 15 or 20 studies that all said they were animal studies, epidemiological studies, uh, clinical study, uh, observational studies, bench trial studies, all of these different a mishmash of studies that all said the same thing, that, that this causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Once you get that critical mass of, of, of studies, you can, you can surpass the threshold that's called the Daubert threshold in federal courts where a federal judge, before he lets you go to a jury with a case in which you're saying a chemical exposure caused such and such a, an effect, he has to make, make an independent determination that sufficient science, a sufficient threshold of science, a critical mass of a whole different blend of studies is out there that supports this. So that's called the Daubert threshold. And we just surpassed that with Monsanto. Once we did that, we were able to go to court. The way that multi-district litigation works is you 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 get a whole bunch of cases and then you try them one at a time till somebody says uncle. The first case we tried in San Francisco, we won two hundred eighty nine million dollars. The second case, and that was a, a gardener, or a superintendent, school superintendent, African American who had been forced against his will to spray Roundup with a leaky backpack. He got non Hodgkin's lymphoma all over his body. The second case we tried in Oakland, we won $89 million. The third case was a couple of home gardeners that have been spraying together for years. First, their laboratory retriever who was with them every day in the garden died of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the two of them got it at the exact same time. And we asked the jury in that case for a billion dollars. And they came back with 2.2 .2 billion. And at that point, 
Monsanto came to the negotiating table and said, we're done, let's settle this. They settled it for 13 billion and they agreed to take Roundup or to take glyphosate out of Roundup for home gardening purposes. So that's how you beat them. You get enough science out there. And right now, CDC you know, is looking at all these chronic diseases. What's causing um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis epidemic? What's causing the juvenile diabetes epidemic? What's causing food allergies? Why did food allergies suddenly appear in 1989? Peanut allergies and all these other allergies, anaphylaxis, eczema, all of them appear like around 1989. Something happened. All these neurological disorders that appeared around 1989, uh, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette's syndrome, ASD, autism, narcolepsy, all of these things that we never heard of when I was a kid, suddenly exploded around 1989. Kids who were born after 1989, they're epidemic. What happened? And so like, there's a whole bunch of different exposures that could explain it. There's high fructose corn syrup. There's PFOAs and PFAS, ASs, the forever chemicals that are not only in firefighter gear, they're in Teflon. They're in that we started cooking with around that time. You know, they're in all of our pots and pans. They're in our Bobby, they're trouble. in polar they're in polar bears, and polar bears haven't been eating firefighters, yeah. <laughs> but they just put more of it in the firefighting gear. And I just gotta echo what you say. Thank God and bless Paul and Diane for bringing this forward because at the time, and I, I applaud the unions for what they're doing now, but at the time she had to face some of that tough adversity that you faced in your life. But without the family legacy, without the the law on her side and just pushing and persistence and just trying to bring this issue to the forefront and everybody questioned her, but her persistence brought it through. So we really thank Diane for bringing this up and we thank you for always questioning science because that's what science is, looking at the data. We looked at Detroit, LA, New York City, New Haven, and we're like, well, why aren't the cancer rates higher in these cities where firefighters are exposed more often to the products of combustion? And we know because of those flame retardants that we're breathing in a chemical cocktail of hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen sulfide, acrolin, all of these nasty reactors. But yet our cancer rates are across the board from paid and career firefighters. And it was Diane who really made us look and said, well, what's the commonality? between all these firefighters that have these PFAS and these forever chemicals in their bloodstream, it's we all wear turnout gear. So I think your voice is very important for not only the fire service, but for America. Now I'm sitting here in beautiful Wallingford, Connecticut, blue collar town, a little connection to your family. President Kennedy went to Choate Rosemary Hall in our town. So that's a source of pride in Wallingford, Connecticut. But he was also part of the first televised debate between Richard Nixon and himself. And I think the debates are so important to the fabric of America. And we've seen this institutional, we kind of witnessed this institutional norm diminished a little bit when we found out through emails that Donna Brazil was caught giving Hillary the questions. We're hoping that these debates are engineering to keep you out of the debates to further diminish this critical part of fair elections. Can you tell firefighters in America, what's the status of getting you in the debates? Because I think your voice needs to be heard because I think you're willing to talk to anybody. Yeah. I mean, I'm willing to talk to anybody. Uh, I, um, but, and I, they ought to let me on the debate. My, I meet the metrics that, you know, they've, they've talked about. I'm at 15% in the polls that they want me to be in. You know, they asked for four polls. We gave them five from a specific list of polling firms. And, um, and, and I, I'm on the, I'll be on the ballot and uh, by the, by June 20th, I'll have enough signatures to get on the ballot. Uh, to earn in enough states to earn 340 electoral votes, and they only want 270. And, and incidentally, President Biden, President Trump won't be on any state at that point because they have an expectation that they're going to get the Democratic and Republican nomination. We don't know. 
Uh, but they're not, they themselves are not on the ballot anywhere, and I am. So I actually qualify more than, than they do, and we have filed a complaint with the FEC, which if it was an honest agency and not a captured agency, uh, they would order me on the debate stage. Uh, but, I, you know, neither of these gentlemen, neither President Biden or President Trump, wants to debate me. Um, they, I don't think either of them can talk about the really big issues that you know are are um, are uh, are facing the existential issues that are facing this nation. They'll talk about uh, you know LGBT rights, and they'll talk about abortion, and they'll talk about guns. They'll talk about the border, which is a really critical issue, and they do differ on that. I think we should need to shut down the border right away. Um, but the, the really big issues, the big issues that are going to destroy our country, the, uh, the, the debt, the $34 trillion debt that is, you know, growing exponentially, uh, the chronic disease epidemic, the addiction to war, uh, the, the polarization, uh, the, you know, the, the, the emergence of AI, okay? And, you know, neither of them is going to talk about that AI Anybody who looks at what's happening with AI right now should be terrified. You know, AI has this tremendous potential to help our country and to help humanity, but it also has the potential to enslave us. And, you know, Elon Musk famously said, AI first, it's going to take our jobs, then it's going to kill us. And, um, and you know, we, you, it's going to give our intelligence agencies, intelligence agencies all across the world, the capacity to manipulate human behavior in ways that nobody even understands that um, to change our, percept our, our perceptions of reality in dramatic, dramatic ways. And we need to regulate it. We need to regulate it in a very thoughtful way because we want to make sure that the industry, the innovators, the entrepreneurs stay here in the United States because there's tremendous growth potential. So you can't over-regulate it here but we need to um, make agreements with other nations about how it's going to be regulated and, re and, and make sure to protect humanity. Because this is really a spiritual warfare, and it's a war not between Republicans and Democrats. The, 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 the conflict between Republicans and Democrats are orchestrated. This is really a battle by elites against the rest of us. And you know, um, and and it, it is a spiritual battle, and AI is going to play a, a critical. AI is either going to be used by the public to hold government responsible, or it's going to be used by the government to subdue and enslave the public. And we need to make sure that it's used in the in the way that actually benefits humanity and democracy. And Bobby, I don't think President Bobby, Biden, President Trump, has ever even considered anything about it. And there, and it's going to happen in the next three years. Uh, we need to make sure that we have somebody in office who can deal with this with a level of sophistication and concern and sensitivity that I don't think either of them is, is capable of. Speaking of the dangers to the republic. As a battalion chief retired in New Haven, I oversaw special operations, and I had the distinct honor of being on the product protection detail for former President Carter when he came to give a speech at Yale. And where are we at with Secret Service protection for you? If we can't protect our <laughs> candidates in America, how can we expect America to be that shining city on the hill? We've tragically lost your uncle, we lost your father. I'm sure your father would be very proud of your accomplishments today. But here you're running for president to give a voice to the middle class. And yet, as far as I know, you still haven't been given Secret Service protection. Can you speak to that? Because that's a concern for the fire service, because we're the ones that answer the calls when things go wrong. Yeah, and I, I'm the first candidate, you know, but the Secret Service protection was only given to nominees of the parties after their conventions prior to 1968. And my father, of course, was assassinated that year. And that year, immediately after his shooting, all of the uh, presidential candidates, Gene McCarthy, George Wallace, Hubert Humphrey, 
Richard Nixon were immediately given protection. And um, and that's been, the Congress then passed a rule that all candidates 120 days out are, who meet certain metrics, are, are polling metrics are entitled to Secret Service protection, but prior to 120 days, the president has discretion Give it to people who you know who need it. Um, so I've been, you know, uh, the Secret Service actually was very good when they dealt with us, and we gave them a 68-page threat assessment that showed numerous death threats to me. And then also, you know, since I announced, there have been several attacks on um, my home. There's been three people who've made it into my yard or one of them, a mentally ill person who made it to the second floor of my home. I'm worried not about my own safety. I'm worried about my family's safety. I'm worried about bystanders and every presidential assassination attempt. There's been uh, virtually every one of them. There's been bystanders injured. You know, there were six people shot with my father, including one of his best friends, Paul Schrade, who took a bullet to his head. Uh, when my uncle was shot, there were numerous other people, including Governor John Conley, who was also shot at that time. Um, and I've, I've made this clear to the Biden White House. President Biden has a bust of my father behind him at the Oval Office. I'm sure he knows what happened to my father. Um, I've had, in fact, a, a guy show up uh, a couple of months ago at one of my speeches in Los Angeles who was carrying uh, concealed weapons uh, that were fully loaded, pistols, uh, two shoulder holsters, numerous knives, other weapons, a dozen ammunition clips, a laser-guided pistol in a backpack, or laser-sighted pistol, and he had fake um, ID from the U.S. Mar he had a U.S. Marshal badge, and he had uh, fake uh, federal ID on his belt, photo ID, and he asked to see me in my green room, and luckily one of the private security firm, uh, Gavin DeBecker Associates that I've hired at great cost, um, noticed that his uh, U.S. Marshal badge was shinier than it ought to be. And they questioned the guy and they found all these weapons on him and he had no good explanation about whether I wanted to see me. He had one, he had opened an Instagram account that morning or a, a TikTok account. And he made one post, and the post was a goodbye post to his friend saying, I'm going on a mission now. I may not make it back alive. Here's what you do. Report to your commander-in-chief, uh, Donald J. Trump, if I don't uh, make it back alive. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of indicia that he was uh, ill-intentioned toward me, all of these things. Secret Service, even before that happened, the Secret Service looked at my at the number of death threats that I get on a day to daily basis and said that I was at an elevated risk. And yet the White House has refused to give me protection. The White House blames Senator Schumer, who's on this, there's a committee of three in the Senate, and they say that Senator Schumer is the one who is um, and the other two people on this committee are the ones who are recommending that I don't get protection. But it's, uh, the, the whole process is obscure. There have been 33 presidential candidates who've, given, uh, who've been given Secret Service protection. Everyone who's ever asked for it, I'm the first person in history who has requested it and not gotten it. Um, and most of the people who've gotten it before me do not have my polling performance. You know, Pat Buchanan had 1% of the votes. Shirley Chisholm had one per less than 1%. Um, you know, uh, Barack Obama got it over a year early. My uncle, Ted Kennedy, got it before he even declared, 550 days out. Uh, every Jesse Jackson, look at all these candidates – um, and and many of them had polling numbers a tiny fraction of mine, and they were given it way before the 120-day uh, period. But we've made six requests to the White House with extensive um, documentation, including the, C the Secret Service's own assessment that says that I'm at elevated risk. 
and they've made a decision not to give it to me. And I think it's, you have to assume that's a political decision. Um, I don't think it's good for our country. I, I'm worried about my family. Um, but I just think it's bad for our country that we're now weaponizing the, the federal agencies and the enforcement agencies. And I think this is a worry from both sides. You know, when President Trump was running, he said he was going to lock up Hillary Clinton. And now the, the Biden White House is, is trying to lock him up. So and it's not good when anybody does it. it, it we, we need to stop weaponizing our federal enforcement agencies and understand that we need to be fostering public support and public trust in these institutions and not subverting and eroding it. Your safety is an American issue and your family's safety is an American issue and that should transcend politics. So you know, we need any political leader, President Trump, President Biden, you know, they should be advocating along with the senators and representatives to get your family the protection that you deserve. Um, another thing that should transcend politics that has a huge impact on firefighters, but beyond firefighters, teachers, nurses, doctors, is that the fact that the pandemic's over, but so are individuals' careers. And they're individuals that are from the middle class. And we found that individuals that have important voices like your own have been shut down. And we see, you know, individuals in New York City where you had Battalion Chief Tom LaPola, one of the only battalion chiefs that had the courage to speak out for the rank and file, forced off the job. You had firefighters like Andy Pittman with four kids with six years on the job in Seattle, Washington, forced out of the job. And this is not a, re you know, you talked about lowering the temperature and about getting away from divisive politics. This isn't a red or a blue issue. Connecticut, our governor, we're a very blue state. We didn't have forced vaccinations. You could have testing or the vaccination. So Governor Lamont got that right. Houston, Texas is a blue city in a red state. The mayor and the fire chief worked hard to give a testing option to firefighters so that they wouldn't put in these draconian measures. And I think one of the issues is, is when we silence dissenting views, we can't have that cogent policy debate and sometimes it slides in um i was talking to matt o'connor for matt connor from new york city this morning and he met you when you were out talking to teachers who lost their job and firefighters in new york city we know that this issue for you isn't about political expedience but you're actually giving a voice to people who need to have a voice and this needs to be an issue can you weigh in on why the political class in this country has gotten so caught up in the right and the left instead of just saying, wait, you can get hired in all these fire departments without a vaccination now. We know that the public policy was based off a faulty premise that if you got the shot, you couldn't spread it. So now that we know you can get the shot and I was vaccinated and I gave it to my lovely wife, Christine, even after getting the three shots. So we know now that, wait, this isn't narrowly tailored. It's not a compelling government interest. You, know, What's your message to the firefighters, the cops, and the teachers and the hospital workers who feel like the pandemic's over and they're forgotten? Yeah, and, and let me just, let me add something to, the, to your question, which is this. Right now, CDC is recommending a ninth booster. So that's where we are, ninth booster. There's fewer than 10% of Americans are going to do that, a lot fewer. So that means that over 90% of Americans have completely lost faith in CDC. The CDC was recommending the FERS vaccine, you know, way back when, in 2020, and we were all told, you know, you can't go to your work. You're going to get fired if you don't take it. You're, you can't get on an airplane. You can't. Your rights are no longer rights. They're now privileges contingent on you obeying, on you submitting to an unwanted medical intervention and, and participating in a mass experiment that they were lying about constantly. I knew back in 2020 the vaccines weren't going to prevent transmission. Why did I know that? Not because I'm a conspiracy theorist, which is what I was called, but because I was actually looking at the monkey studies. And in the monkey studies, they, you know, they gave half the monkeys vaccine and half were not, and then they exposed them to COVID. 
and at the same time, the monkeys had the same level of concentrations of, of COVID virus in their nasal pharynxes. So they knew that they didn't prevent illness and they didn't prevent transmission. And yet for a year they were telling us, yeah, if you get, if you get the vaccine, your grandma won't, will, will be protected. And they were lying. And they all admit it now. Now that is mainstream dogma. But, but you have to think this. What if CDC said today, you know, you, we want you to take your ninth. If you don't take it, you can't go to work. Well, that's, you know, that, that, that is what the, the way that we need to think about this. So we represented um, Bravest for Choice in New York. I represented um, Firefighters for Freedom in L.A., and we won that suit. Uh, we won the big suit for the teachers where the firefighters were also included in New York that, that illegalized the mandates and said you can't do that. Uh, and we re and we're we're um, still representing firefighters all over the country who were fired, and they and you know the the the, uh, the big cases are now in front of the Second Circuit in New York. Sujata Gibson is uh, our attorney in those cases, and um, we financed a lot of those cases for the individual firefighters. And it it the, the courts have said to date that they're entitled to be rehired and they're entitled to their past pay. But so far, we don't know of any of them who've actually collected. So that, that's where we are on that. Uh, one of the saddest cases is a firefighter named Velasquez who was he's representing, being represented by Christina Martinez and he refused to get the vaccine. And they said, well, we're gonna fire you unless you did it. He then went and got it, and he was uh, permanently and, and catastrophically disabled. And uh, and that, unfortunately, has been the story for many, many, many people. And, you know, the levels of, unfortunately, we're still seeing in the media a censorship of the injuries. You're not allowed to talk about vaccine injuries on the media. The media now d d no longer sees itself as a... Uh, as a uh, a vessel for speaking truth to power, you know, an a democratic, vital democratic institution that, that should maintain a posture of fierce skepticism toward official proclamations, government authority. That is the function of the press uh, in a democracy. But unfortunately, during COVID, they all saw their, um, their role as manipulating the public into compliance repeating again and again government propaganda, frightening the public on behalf of their- And thank God that you've been pushing for cogent debate. And, you know, I wrote a article for the Daily Caller for the Yankee Institute, and I found a quote from Benjamin Franklin that I think says it all. And he said, in apologies for a printer, he said, printers are educated in the belief that when men differ in opinion, both sides ought to have equal advantage of being heard by the public. And when truth and error have fair play, the former is always overmatched for the later. It's so important for our republic to be able to have cogent debate. We wouldn't have had the learning loss that we had with our kids losing education over the pandemic. The fact that they silenced or throttled down your social media accounts so that we couldn't talk about what Robert Kennedy was talking about. This is... Trump says a lot of things, but this was actually done by the Biden administration where they used proxies to silence dissenting views. And that's one of the things that your uncle, whether it was the lion in the Senate, whether it was your uncle that was president, has always fought for was to protect the First Amendment. We need to be able to have these conversations, these courageous conversations. So, and we need to be able to ask simple questions. And that's one of the reasons, like even you coming on this show today means so much to the fire service because we normally don't get access to a presidential candidate who takes his time to come in and finds value in talking to volunteer and career firefighters and middle-class America. Often it's all caught up in the talking points, but you try to break through that. And I think how you even been treated in the press you talk about, you know, the press talking truth to power. I've seen so many interviews where the 
the person, Bill Maher, okay, who, who I watch, and I'm a conservative, but I watch Bill Maher, instead of just asking you a question, he put out a faulty premise first, and so here you had to defend your, defend your position. I just think it's unfair what we're doing in our republic. We need more honest conversations in our politics. So if you'd like to weigh in on the First Amendment, um, I really appreciate it because I think you're a valuable voice in America. Yeah, I mean, Hamilton, Madison, Adams said that they put freedom of speech in the First Amendment because all of the other rights depend on it. If a government has the capacity to silence its critics, it has license for any atrocity. And, you know, listen, we all read, at least I did growing up, Aldous Huxley and George Orwell and Robert Heinlein and um, and Kessler and all of these other uh, uh, authors who talked about we were told, you know taught in civics class and literature class they all talked about a future kind of dystopian totalitarianism and um, that we thought yeah that might happen sometimes but so far in the future you know it's it's fun to, to think about it but it's never going to happen to us and then we saw it happening to us and you know, what they were saying is that the first step toward totalitarianism is always begins with the censorship of speech. American democracy is rooted in this assumption of, of, of the free flow of information and that, you know, democracies are less efficient than totalitarian systems where you could just have one guy making all the decisions with no Congress, no regulatory agency, just, you know, just top down, you know, and it's much more efficient Democracy is sloppy. It's difficult. It, it it goes in you know inches and fits and starts two steps forward, one step back, etc. But the big advantage it has is that the free flow of information, annealed in the furnace of debate, yields these policies that have triumphed in a marketplace of ideas, and that's what all of the founders talked about. You need free flow of information, and when you stop debating things. You're on a bad path. There's no time in American history when we look back and we say the people who were censoring speech were the good guys. They're always the bad guys. They're always the people who are trying to manipulate the public to try to increase their power, increase their wealth. And, you know, that's what we saw during COVID. We saw systematic censorship, and it was taking place in the Trump administration, and it was taking place in the Biden administration, and all of it ultimately was designed to shift wealth and power upward. The Trump lockdowns, which were continued during the Biden administration, lasted 500 days and created a billionaire a day for 500 days and shifted $4.3 trillion upward from the American middle class to just strip mine the American middle class and created this new oligarchy of billionaires. And the people who profited were Bill Gates and Jeffrey Bezos and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Sergey Brin and all of these tech overlords, the robber barons, who, you know, now are locked in our homes. They were giving surfers right up the road here $1,000 tickets because they were surfing out on the ocean. And, uh, and they closed the playground so kids couldn't get sunlight. They couldn't go outside. They poured sand on the on the skate parks, the half pipes down at Venice, which is a few blocks from here, and um, to make sure that nobody could go skateboarding. So they were lot. They they knew at that point that COVID was not spreading outside; it only spread indoors. And yet they were locking us all indoors. And they were getting us out of the vitamin D, promoting sunlight, the fresh air, all the stuff that would have kept us. They're sending us home. They eat potato chips and gain weight, and the people who were dying were the people who were eating potato chips and were overweight, right? And uh, so this, this was not a public health effort. It was a, it was an exercise in control. They were testing us to see if we'd put up with this, and unfortunately, we did. And, you know, I think a lot of a, a lot of Americans are now coming out of that and saying we're never going to do that again. It's not going to happen the next time. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that that was the result because once they take away a right, even when they give it back, it's never as strong as it was before they took it away in the first place. And that's what I worry about. I worry about we're living in this 
era now, these emerging control technologies, facial recognition systems, 415,000 uh, low altitude satellites that have now been given permits that are going to look at every square inch of the earth every hour of the day, know exactly where you are. We have technology that can look through walls so you can't hide in your house. We have, you know, Alexis is in your house, right? And, uh, um, and Siri, you think they're working for you. They're not. They're working for Bill Gates and they're working for the NSA and they're getting all of your information. Every time you sneeze, that's recorded somewhere and somebody then is monetizing that to sell you a, a drug. When you, when you say, I didn't sleep last night, you get mattress ads, all of that stuff. You know, they're harvesting the data. They are mining your data, stealing it from you, not paying you for it. They're monetizing it in these big uh, data centers that Gates and the other ones are building all over the desert Southwest. And then they sell it to the NSA. And uh, and so that gives them not only you know a new uh, flows of income, but it also gives them this capacity to um, to control us and to monitor us, and that's that's frightening. Um, you know, governments never the, the ambition of every totalitarian regime in the history of mankind has been absolute control over every aspect of human behavior, all of our interactions, our movements, what we read, what we talk about. They've never been able to do it in the past. People have been able to keep parts of their lives secret. Every purchase that you, they, that, that you make, they know about it. You go buy a porn magazine, you go or, you know, look on the internet, they know you did that. And they, you know, or if you, whatever you do, you know, they know it, and it gives them all these opportunities to control human behavior in nefarious ways. So, um, you know, it's something... Bobby, I want, I want to be respectful of your time because you've been so generous today. Um, I want to just give you an opportunity to just clear something up because you did make a comment about uh, immigration, and I don't want somebody to just pull the clip and kind of paint it in a different light. Um, I think we, we agree that we need controlled immigration because we need a quality safety net in america and if we just open the gates and we have so many people coming in i mean i, I work in a socioeconomically deprived city and there's so many wonderful people that have either fallen on high time hard times uh, substance abuse or mental illness that we need to have that quality um safety net do you want to just expand on your Answer yeah, for and thanks for letting me do that. I, you know, and, and America needs to continue to be a compassionate country, and that you know, and to welcome immigrants who come in legally. So you know, we we have a long line of people. Well, I I intend to have wide to widen the gates so that it, it, legal immigration is easier. So that all that there's 10 million businesses that are looking for workers from abroad for, with certain skills. We need to be able to give them that flow so that we can build our economy, so that we can grow our way out of the $34 trillion debt, so that we can pay for the Social Security and it's not going to go insolvent, and that we can continue to live up to our highest ideals. But, you know, I've been down to the border in Mexico, and I originally was a critic of Trump's walls, but I turned around when I saw what's happening there. I watched 300 people come across between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on my first trip there to Yuma. I've been back, you know, since then. I spent three days down there talking to the Border Patrol, talking to local law enforcement, to ranchers, the people running the rape centers, the hospitals, um, everybody in that, these incredibly kind-hearted communities. So they made me so proud to be American because they, they, you know, they, they, this problem has been dumped on them. And they're rising. They're, they're rising with compassion to where the immigrants are coming in. But the immigrants themselves, I interviewed. I watched 300 come across. They're, they they brought to the border in the, you know all night long in these big white buses that are owned by the Sinaloa drug cartel. They weren't coming from only two the whole night. I saw from Latin America, who both had asylum claims. One from Colombia. One from Peru. The rest were all from, at, the first 110 were from at, um, West Africa, all young men of military age. The second two buses were all coming from Asia, um, from China, 
Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, uh, Tajikistan, Nepal, Tibet, some from India and Bangladesh, but mainly China. And I asked them, you know, why are you here? And they said, we're here for a job. It's illegal. But they knew exactly what was going to happen to them because the Sinaloa cartel is advertising on TikTok and YouTube all over the world. And it says, you send us $10,000 and you get on a plane to Mexico City, then you, we will get you a visa when you get to Mexico City for internal flights, domestic flights. And you fly to Mexicali. We will pick you up in the airport at Mexicali. We'll bring you to the wall. We will walk you across the wall. When you get there, you will be um, you will be fingerprinted by the Border Patrol. And then if you don't have a criminal record, you'll be brought to the Yuma Airport and put on a plane at U.S. taxpayer expense at any destination that you want to go to. So 110,000 have ended up in New York City. They're living on the streets. They can't legally work, so they're victimized by predatory employers who are who are hiring them to do construction sites or, you know, hotel maids or $6 an hour. And those companies are bidding against union shops that would be paying 35 bucks an hour or 40 bucks an hour for, you know, more skilled wages. And everybody gets hurt. The tax aren't getting paid. The social safety system is being crushed. And, you know, what I say is we welcome immigrants in this country, but we, every country needs a secure border. Otherwise, it's going to cease to exist. And this is existential for us. And, and by the way, the, the immigrants themselves, the stories I heard from them were harrowing. Me, many of them are raped. Uh, m most of the ones that I talked to had been robbed by the cartels. They, there's a tree right across the border, which is famous. It's called the rape tree. And um, the... The Border Patrol um, says this is where the uh, the cartels extract final payment from women, from children, um, who they're bringing to the border. And it's just, it's horrific. I talked to a Peruvian family. Uh, they had paid their $10,000, and then, you know, just before they got to the border, they were searched by the cartel, and all of their lifetime savings was taken from them. And then they show up in America, they can't pay what they're supposed to pay to the cartel. So they have, they're have they sent to a job in specific places, and then they're, um, they have people from the cartel who come visit them to make sure to collect their paycheck every week. And they're essentially slaves in this country. This is not a good situation. Anybody who tries to defend this, uh, you know, I'm just telling you, whatever you think, you're wrong if you think this is defensible. No, I, I can't. I can't agree more. It's not compassion. We can't incentivize. We still have a terrorism risk. We have so many kids that have died for fentanyl overdoses. We need to control the border so we can have that safety net. I just want to really thank you for your time. If you want to give us the last thirty second or sixty second um, pitch on why you should be president of the United States, and then I'll have PJ take us off. And again. Thank you so much for talking to the American Fire Service. We need to be really rebuild the middle class in this country. We need, and you know, if you own a when when you know, I grew up during my president President Kennedy, my uncle President Kennedy's administration, when America was the richest country in the world, we owned half the wealth on the earth. We had the American middle class became the greatest economic engine in the history of mankind. And, and some of that was because we still had an industrial base after World War II when Europe had been, you know, flattened. Um, but the other part was we got everybody into a home. We got, you know, we got through the Veterans Bill, a lot of other bills, through the highway system, et cetera. We made sure every American could get into a home. The, the housing prices then were roughly one year salary. So you, by with one year salary, you could get into a house you could you could take a summer vacation. You could raise a family. You could put something aside for retirement on one job. And today that is gone. My I have seven kids. They all went to the best colleges, and none of them is going to be able to get out home. And you know it's it's uh, housing prices have doubled in the last year, and the interest rates have doubled in the last year. And they and they're competing against BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. These big investment houses that own 89% of the S&P 500, those three houses. 
and now they're trying to buy all of our land and all of our houses. And, you know, if, if when you own a house, you care about your community, you care about your firefighters, your police, you go to the PTA meetings, you care about the appearance of your home, you care about your neighbors. But most importantly, you have equity, so you can borrow money. If you want to start a bowling alley or a sporting goods shop or a, or a bar or a yoga studio, you can get the financing to do it. And so you can pursue your entrepreneurial impulses. And right now, we got a generation of kids who's never going to see the inside of their own home. They're, they're turning into renters, and we're turning this society from a democratic society into a feudal society, and our people are going to go from being citizens to being subjects, and I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen. You heard it here from RFK Jr. himself. Honored to have him on the show. Remember, speaking out matters. Right now, the unions have failed in protecting these firefighters and cops and teachers and hospital workers that lost their jobs. Remember, if you're a union leader out there, one of your responsibilities is to protect due process. Sometimes even if you disagreed with the action, invoke your inner John Adams and support these Seattle firefighters, New York City firefighters. We need to make this an issue because the pandemic's over, but these workers cannot be forgotten. Bobby Kennedy, honor to have you on the show. PJ, can you take us off? RFK Jr., thank you. Thank you for joining us and speaking to the fire service and highlighting your vision for America's firefighters. Wow, what a great show highlighting an individual who fights for our health and safety. As a reminder, FDIC 2025 deadlines for submissions is June 17th. Don't miss your opportunity to speak at the largest and most attended firefighter conference in the world. FDIC 2024 attracted more than 36,000 firefighters. Don't miss your opportunity to speak at the world's largest firefighter conference. Hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thank you for listening today. I hope you're in here. I hope you're settled in. I hope that you got everything that you need because we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. We got somebody important here in the building. What's wrong? Okay. Um, before we bring up, all right, presidential candidate, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Of course, we do got to show some love to our sponsors. All right. Now we have him in the building to address the media smear campaign that has happened today via the shade room and a few other publications. They're trying to label, uh, Mr. Kennedy Jr. as racist. And that is not such. Okay. And he is here to address all of it okay but before we bring him up we do got to show the sponsors for love which means boldly raise a glass too we'll be right back y'all make sure y'all like share and subscribe and hold that thought let's go never be boxed in with boo glam's half rim glasses and take your eyewear game to the next level dark hair may be shaped like a box but knows no end when it comes to amplifying your look manly is everything but that but the style and possibilities with these round frames are infinite Danielle exudes confidence and will instantly have you feeling like the boss that you are. And Hannah will make your heart stop and jaw drop in these super unique friends. It's time to take your style out of the box. Visit VooGlam.com and grab these stylish and comfortable frames plus more. Use the code Tasha K at checkout for a special discount. Make sure y'all get y'all spectacles because I got mine, okay? And take advantage of that code. Let, let me pour up a little wine here, okay? Because I'm 
excited about this interview. I'm a huge fan, especially a Kennedy fan and things like that. And so um, I just want us to celebrate Wano style uh, for our independent presidential candidate. All right. And so um, tell you a little bit about it more. Now, recently, it was actually earlier today, the Shade Room and amongst me other media publications and stuff, they posted a series of videos trying to paint Mr. Robert F. Kennedy as a racist, okay? Let's go ahead and show some of these videos here. Let's we're both go. six foot three, six foot four, respectively, 250 pounds and very strong. They were capable of this crime. And very rough kind of gangsters. I have spoken to both of them. Um, one of them is black. Um, when Martha Moxley's body was found, it was covered with hairs from a black person. American, one of the hairs was Negroid, and nobody's ever been able to explain that. All right, all right. So we have Mr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. here with us. Why knows y'all raise your wine glasses? Let's go. How you doing? Hey, Josh. Thanks for having me. Sorry, Hi. I'm just finishing my dinner. Anytime. What you eat for dinner? What your wife cook? I saw her like getting you set up and everything. She, I, I just landed in Miami. Oh, uh, half an hour ago. So I ordered something at the. Hotel, and then you and I had a little problem getting this this video going, so my my dinner came right. Oh, dang! I'm sorry started. about that, but you know our studio was in Miami. We could have had you in person. Oh, I didn't know you were in Miami. Yeah, but that's okay. Next time, I'm gonna get you. Don't worry about that. We're gonna make sure we know where your whereabouts are. We know you're busy. Um, you are the independent candidate running right now for president uh, against Trump and Biden. Okay, will we see you at the debate? in Atlanta. Uh, I'm hoping, you know, we're litigating right now against CNN. I, um, I meet all the criteria for being on the debate stage. CNN, the Biden campaign has said that President Biden will not go on the stage if I'm on it. And so CNN is trying to keep me off the stage, but, um, but, but CNN is in a jam because I meet all their criteria for being on this stage. In fact, I meet it better than Trump, President Trump or President Biden um, because I'm now on the ballot in, in, in enough states to get 278 electoral votes. And the, the, uh, the criteria for getting on the debate stage is you have to be on the ballot in enough states to get 270 electoral votes, which is the victory. Right. And neither of them are on either ballot. And so under the FEC law rules, if they hold a debate and those guys and they try to exclude me, it's a illegal campaigning contribution by CNN to their campaigns. They can't do that. So we're litigating against them. We're trying to get up on the debate stage. I don't think either candidate wants to debate me. I don't yeah. really think either candidate wants to talk about the giant uh, uh, budget deficits they would run up 34 trillion dollars i don't think either wants to talk about the chronic disease epidemic that now affects 60 percent of our kids i don't think they either of them want to talk about the COVID lockdowns where they shut down 3.3 million businesses with no due process no just compensation no scientific citation yeah, I saw you was the first to come. You came after Fauci first. You wrote a book on Fauci. Now they they starting to drag him. <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, I said, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. been on his ass. <laughs> yeah, 41 percent of black owned businesses, Tosh, that closed during the pandemic will never reopen. And a lot of those businesses had three generations of equity in them, of hard work you know, building those businesses for the families. And now those businesses are gone and they left open yeah. Walmart, Amazon, and, you know, that don't pay any taxes and don't contribute to our communities. It was really a catastrophe. They shifted Trump and Biden in 500 days. They created 500 new billionaires, a billionaire day. 
they shifted four trillion dollars from the working poor in this country and from the middle class to this new oligarchy of billionaires. And, you know, I'm going to ask them about that on the debating stage and nobody else is going to. Yeah, that's very surprising that Biden would try to keep you and we're going to say allegedly from entering the stage like that. But you've had to go as far as to file a lawsuit just to rightfully get on the stage because you are the highest, you know, you are the independent candidate. So you belong on that stage regardless. And so we don't even know if Trump is going to be able to be president. So technically it could be between you and Biden. So you have a right to be on that debate stage. Yeah, I should be on the debate stage. I have a right. I have enough support. I have 15% in, in, in the polling companies that they Need that they listed of those 12 polling companies. I'm at 15% in five of them, six of them now, including CNN's own poll. And that was one of the criteria. You had to be at 15%, but I'm there. So, yeah, uh, it's illegal for them to exclude me, but we'll see what they do. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, they're going to have to do something because Trump in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, we, what, if we go, what if he goes to jail? Like, he can't be president. I don't see Biden, like, pardon, giving him a pardon at you know, all. See, surprisingly, you can go to jail and still be president. There's only three requirements for being president in the Constitution. One is that you're over 35, two, that you were born in this country, and three, that you're a current citizen. And that's it. So you so could be in jail. You could be facing the death penalty and they, you know, you could, they couldn't stop you from being president. So if he were to become president, right, the, the president elect, could he, and let's he was in jail, can, and he was in jail, could he pardon himself? Could he really pardon himself? That is a constitutional question that has never been questioned before. Oh. So um, I'm sure that he will try to do that. And there's nothing that, I mean, you have to study, you know, the courts will study the language of the Constitution and see whether, you know, that was what they intended. I don't think they intended that. But that, I, sure I, Yeah, and we got plenty of felons fire. here. I mean, we would have a larger black vote if the felons, if we didn't have these minor offenses and stuff that, you know, Biden uh, signed into legislation. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of black yeah. people, a lot of black men in jail for petty crimes and stuff like that. And so, uh, but they felons and they can't vote. But that's crazy that the, the president could be a felon and still be president. That's crazy. Well, all, of those, all, of those, uh, all of those black felon men who uh, who can't vote, they, they, they can still run for president. And I said that just like how they can't get no jobs and qualify for jobs and stuff like that, they can own a business. So it's really putting them in a higher position in society. And, you know, most business owners, you know, but we have some that you've kind of gone after, like, you know, Monsanto and DuPont and stuff. You got a lot of money for the American people from them companies and they was poisoning people and, and things like that. You was working with the Cocker firm and everything to get justice and you brought justice home civilly. Yep. I worked with Johnny Cochran on a bunch of cases. I, you know, I, I was probably the premier lawyer in the country bringing environmental justice cases. My first case as an environmental lawyer was representing NAACP in Austin, New York, keeping a waste uh, transfer facility out of the oldest black community in the Hudson Valley. But I represented, I spent 20% of my time representing the Indian tribes and treaty negotiations and litigation against big polluters and resource extraction companies and representing poor people all over our country, Hispanic farm workers who are being poisoned by pesticides. The Monsanto case, my client was a, a black school superintendent in California who got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from spraying Roundup, which he was required to do by his school. His whole body was covered with postulating lesions. He's an incredible uh, guy. His name is Dwayne Lee Johnson. And we got him $289 million. Yeah, and I saw that number. I said, I said, I need to hit you because you you really stand on business out here. You know how to bring a lawsuit home. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he know how to get the money. I know who to call now. I'm in with the Kennedys. Now, what you talking about? We done hit the... 
<laughs> hit the wine glass, Mister uh, Mister Robert F. Kennedy. I'm sorry that you had to be here on such uh, like you know controversial circumstances. And you know your uh, uh, Angela Statton, very very good friend of mine. She's now helping you um, uh, with your campaign and stuff like that. And she called me and asked me personally um, if I would uh, take this interview and uh, discuss uh, some of the things that are being painted about you in the media, particularly about uh, involving your cousin. Okay. Now your cousin's name is Michael Skakel. Okay. And he was convicted. Michael Skakel. 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 Okay. All right. I do want to get the name right here. Okay. Now Michael Skakel. When Michael was, when Michael was 15 years old. Right. Next door neighbor, a girl called Martha Moxie was murdered. Michael was 11 miles away with five eyewitnesses when it happened. And he was never a suspect. And 27, 20 years later, 27 years later, Mark Furman, do you remember Mark Furman? He was involved in the OJ Simpson trial mm -hmm. and he, and he was a racist and he got, and he was the one who he, he tried to plant evidence on OJ and the jury, when they freed OJ, afterwards they were asked, why did you do it? And a lot of them said, because of Mark Furman. Yeah, it was police Mark corruption. Furman, yeah. Mark Furman was convicted of perjury and he, was, he could no longer work as a police officer. So he tried to make a living writing books in which he was going to uh, solve cold cases. One of the cases, the first case that he went to solve was the case of Martha Moxley, and he studied it for six weeks, and then he wrote a short book in which he blamed my cousin, Michael Skakel. And there was a tremendous amount of public furor. Oh, there's a cousin. He, Michael Skakel was not a Kennedy, but he was a distant cousin of the Kennedys and a, an in-law. Um, and so there was a furor about, oh, he got away with it because he had influence. And he was convicted wrongly. And, uh, you know, there were so many... As you know, there were so many bad things that happened in that trial that the prosecutors pulled. But he was sentenced to life in prison. I knew him very well. I had gone to AA with him for, at that point, about 15 years. I, we had a very intimate relationship. I knew he had not committed the murder. And I began investigating it. I wrote an article for the Atlantic Monthly, which I showed that he couldn't have. And after I wrote that article, a man called me contacted me by fax and said i know who killed her was and, it was it um, was it kobe bryant's cousin tony bryant that that called you well no it was another guy who was friends with kobe bryant's cousin kobe bryant cousin tony was a basketball prodigy he was from new york his mother was a very famous filmmaker she was the first black woman to win an academy award for producing and for writing children's television or children's film. And the family was a very, very prominent black family in New York. And Tony had been sent to a school in Greenwich where he he knew, where he was a classmate of my cousin, Michael Skakels. He then left that school after two years and went back to school in New York City. And, but he met two guys in New York City who were kind of, Tony was a very big guy and, and these two guys were kind of big, athletic, and they were kind of gangsters. One of them was white, one of them was black. And Tony started bringing these kids up to Greenwich on weekends. And he was the one who introduced um, these boys to Martha Moxley, to the girl. And then on Halloween Eve, he went up with them and they told him on the train on the way up here, we're going to get her and we're going to rape her. And we're going to we're going to take her caveman style. We're going to drag her in the woods and knock her on the head. And um, and that's what they did. He Tony didn't want anything to do with it. So he took a train right back to New York. But the next day, these two boys came to him and said, yeah, we killed her. So he kept that inside of him for 27 years. And he saw he assumed that when Michael Skaka went on trial, that Michael would never get convicted because there was no evidence. But Michael did get convicted. And afterwards, he called this other man who then called me, who was also a classmate. 
and and that guy later committed suicide. And Tony Bryan said, "I've got this on my conscience, and I um and I gotta unload it." And I called Tony Bryan, and he picked up the phone, and he said, "I've been waiting for this phone call for 27 years." We and have a I, clip. Let me let me interrupt you here for a second. We have a clip from a, a confessional that's been on YouTube for years. Okay. Yeah. And he's he's telling, I believe it's an attorney in this video, what he saw. Now he is the cousin of Kobe Bryant. And so he said he's been holding this. And it was actually his friends that you just described that uh killed this young white girl at the time. It wasn't your and, cousin. And, and, so we and then repeatedly and then repeatedly confessed to it. Right. So we're going to go ahead and, and play Tony's confessional receipt time. Let's go. Did Burr or Adolf say anything um, while they were holding the club at all? Anything that they were going to do or did they hold it longer than you or anybody? Oh, yeah. They, they were using them as, uh, as sort of like walking sticks. They were? Yes. Okay. I just, I just remember hearing those words and saying, you know what? I've had enough. So, so uh, them saying the words while holding a golf club. Yes. Going to give me a girl. Yeah, but it's, you know, I got my caveman club, right? And I'm going to go grab somebody and pull them by hair and do what cavemen do. Okay. And again, I hate to repeat it again, but I'm gathering caveman style is a club and dragging your woman away by the hair. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So... You said goodbye to them that night, right? <laughs> I don't know what. I just said, I'll see you later. I just, that's, they see ask you, later. you to stay? They say, you sure you don't want to stay? I'm like, no, nah, my mom wants me to go. Because, you know, mom was an excuse, but I knew better. I knew that I needed to go because this wasn't a, a situation I really wanted to be in. I didn't feel comfortable with um, being that out of control. No wonder, who are you going to go to? You're saying out of control. How bad do you think these guys were by the time you left them? Capable of what? Anything. Okay. Anything. Because of what? Their demeanor? Because of the drugs? Because of the alcohol? What? What? The combination, combination. Of, the, of everything. Okay. So that is uh, Kobe Bryant's cousin, Tony Bryant, who you said called you. He had been carrying this for many years, and he wanted to get it off his chest that it was his friends who happened to be black. Um, that did one this. Of, one of them was one black. Of them was black. Oh, okay. And then, of course, you had explained in some of the clips that are going viral now on social media because um, it seems like the media is trying to paint you as a racist, right? Because these interviews that you were doing, talking about the real killers of this, this young white girl, um, you know, they, they extracted very triggering things with you using words like Negro or black guy. It was huge black guys and stuff like that. And it, it looks bad when you're saying it, right? But it's essentially, you know, according to the eyewitness here, uh, not eyewitness, but someone who was with the boys that night, it was facts. And your cousin... Yeah, and, I, and by the way... I don't use the word Negro. Um, it was, I was reading from the autopsy report that okay. said that the hairs were Negroid. And that, and so, you know, it's not a word that is part of my lexicon or my daily okay. vernacular. Um, well, I'm glad you I, cleared that up because they did extract, and that's what happens when you don't tell the whole story. It was like clip yeah. after clip of you well, describing. And by, by the way, Tasha, uh -huh. this is, you know, this is not kind of a, a spontaneous story that's that's appearing on the media this is being pumped those videos are being created by joe biden and the dnc because they're trying to discredit me to you know hurt my support among black my support among black americans is growing exponentially i'm going on all the podcasts i'm talking about the program about you know how we're going to get capital back into the black communities how we're going to restore all these businesses that President Biden destroyed during the COVID lockdowns, how we're going to end the, the, the school to prison pipeline, how we're going to do prison reform. Oh, that's going to be, um, that's going to get rid of the, get the nonviolent offenders into drug addiction treatment and, 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 and end this, you know, process, which incidentally, Joe Biden was the one who initiated. He was the one who wrote the 1986 Drug Act 
Mm-hmm. And had the, the, the gave penalties uh, for crack cocaine a hundred times the penalty for powder cocaine. So a black kid in Queens who got picked up for crack would get a hundred times the penalty of a white kid right across the bridge in Westchester County who got busted for co- for powder cocaine. No, and cocaine. And yeah, I know. I know. know. I know, I know. Listen, I am not. And then, and then <laughs> Biden wrote the 1994 crime bill, mm-hmm. which had the super predator provisions. It had the three strikes you're out. It had, uh, you know, mandatory sentencing. And those two bills in eight years doubled the number of black men in American prisons. The average from the American Civil War till 1986, it now doubled. And that is a direct result of two bills that President Biden wrote. And then his vice president, Kamala Harris, was notorious when she was attorney general of California and been heavily, heavily criticized for violating repeated Supreme Court orders that she release prisoners, nonviolent prisoners from the overcrowded California jails, 5,000 prisoners who had been judged that they were nonviolent, mm-hmm. they were they were highly unlikely to have any recidivism. They were people who were, you know, who were good people and they were supposed to get out. She refused to let them out. She repeatedly defied those court orders. And, you know, she wanted to build a uh, a reputation for herself as the law enforcement well, attorney well, general. Well, I can tell you this. Listen, we don't consider that woman black anyway, and neither does she. So Biden put her up there to appeal to us and panel to us. And I just don't like her. And I know who Biden really is. I've been following them for years. Okay. And so um, here's the thing, you know, I know, I know who you are. I've done my research on you. I've, I've known who your family is. Your fa- you know, the president, John F. Kennedy. Okay. Um, walked beside Dr. Martin Luther King and helped to literally put the civil rights movement in place. I know where you come from. I know who your father is. I know what you guys stand for. And so the mere fact that they are trying to paint you as a racist when we all know who, in my opinion, is the real racist and it's Joe Biden. And the entire time he didn't even know that he was raising the alleged black son that he has in his own house. Okay. So while he was worried about locking niggas up, and his son was becoming one behind the scenes, doing dope, not paying child support and shit like that. That's who we should have been focused on instead of focusing on locking up our young boys just for stuff that they had no control over because we know who put crack and cocaine into the communities, okay? And so yeah. I just want to, I, I just have a few more questions. Are we going on 30 minutes? And it's I, the same agency that killed my uncle, by the way. Yes, I know. I know John F. Kennedy is not his father. His father's name is Robert F. Kennedy. He was a turned oh, my, his brother. My, he, my, your my, brother. He's your uncle. Right, right. My father was Robert Kennedy. He was right. killed. And the, the and the president. Uncle. That's your uncle. Yes. So I they acting like I don't know the family tree around here. I read, guys. Listen. <laughs> I know I act like I don't because I got the wine. But I want to say this uh, to you, Mr. Kennedy Jr. Um, I, I apply everything that you've done over the years. You've been a lawyer. You haven't been in politics. You haven't been lobbying. Um, there's a lot of administrations that have been the same companies that you have sued, okay, and, and got money for because they polluted our communities with chemicals and things like that, and they put them in the poorest of the poorest communities like Monsanto, like DuPont. You've worked alongside of the Cochrane firm. Like I said, your uh, uncle worked alongside of Dr. Martin Luther King. Y'all have been standing on business for many years. I do want to ask you this because it's just a question from my viewers and then I got something that I want to ask you personally myself. Um, how do you feel about reparations for African-Americans? Well, you know, let me say this. I, I for 20 years, I was, um, I was fighting for uh, reparations for American Indians. And, you know, that 20% of my, or for 40 years, 20% of my work was doing treaty work for them and doing litigation against people who were mainly resource extraction companies that were stealing from the tribe. So um, I think there's a strong moral case for reparations for for Black Americans. Uh, I don't I don't tell people that I'm going to do that because I don't, for two reasons. One is 
the, the reparations for systemic racism since the Civil War are now clearly illegal under the Harvard decision that was written by John Roberts and by judges that Trump appointed. So it's now off the table. You could do legally, it would be, it would probably pass constitutional muster to do reparations if you could directly trace your ancestry to slavery. Um, and though that would pass constitutional muster, but then you would have to get Congress to appropriate the money and that will never happen. So I don't tell people I'm gonna do things that I know I can't do or I believe I can't do. I tell people I'm gonna do things that I know I can do. And if you look at my program, or restoring black communities, the education system, but also getting capital into black neighborhoods to making sure that there's only 25 black banks left in this country. What? Yep, 25 black banks. There was hundreds of them. And they're all underfunded because the Fed does not give them money. So they're, you know, so if you live in a black neighborhood, you're not going to get a home improvement loan. You're not going to get a business loan. And, and if you starve at uh, neighborhoods of capital, you're going to create crime waves. And that's what's happening in the black community is there's no equity left. They've systematically been stripped of equity. So people don't own houses, which means they can't borrow money, which means they can't start a business, which means even if they have an entrepreneurial impulse, they can't pursue it. They're not part of the American system because they do not have ownership. And that is systematic. And I could talk to you about that all night. But I, I'm just saying that is my program, is to get equity back into those communities, to get capital back into those communities, to get um, financial intelligence and information, in other words, accrued financial knowledge to the people so that they can start businesses. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've been on the board. My father started Edward Stuyvesant Restoration to restore economically the, poor, the poorest neighborhoods in New York, Bedford Stuyvesant. When he died, I took his place on the board and it is a model community development corporation. We have brought all of the stores that were boarded up in that community. You had to go 75 blocks to go to shopping at a, a grocery store. And now we brought grocery stores to that community. The, the commerce in that community is exploding off the streets. We know how to do it. I know how to do it. And that is what I'm going to do as president. It's going to be one of my big focuses. And also fixing the education system to get, so black families have choice. We need to have charter schools where if the school's not, public school's not working for me, you go to another public school, which is a charter school. And, uh, and we, you don't tell black family, yeah, your school doesn't work. It's broken. Just wait there 10 years to we'll fix it. It's not good enough. We need to give them choice. And if you get kids who are well-educated, um, who have hope for their future, that is the way to deal with crime and addiction and all these other issues that we're facing. I, I, I agree. I agree. And I'm glad you uh, you touched on that. That was one of the questions um, that the audience, uh, my why notes was asking, was about reparations. And I like that you're not making any false uh, I, I, promises I, I, or pandering um, to our community because that happens you. a lot, you know. To you. Us. Let me tell you something. I had on my podcast the other day, the head of the Black Farmers Association, and he won a lawsuit. He, you know, he's been a black farmer all his life. He's my age, around 70 years old. And he was going to USDA. USDA has a program that gives grants and loans to small farmers. And what they found was when the black farmer would go into that program, the guy who was running that program for decades was an overt racist. So the black farmers who would go in there would never get a loan. They would never get a grant. And any white farmer could walk in there and get, you know, and, and there'd be the waiting room would be filled with black farmers who were waiting for days, day after day, and they'd never get anything. And they'd watch white farmers just come in, pick up their check and leave. And so he sued and he won the suit. And a jury found that the, the, USDA, this individual <clears throat> over time had stolen 
$500 billion from small farmers. It was something they were owed, they were entitled to. And so he sued, he won the lawsuit, they gave him a $500 billion settlement. And what happened to it? When you sue the federal government, Congress has to appropriate the money to pay the lawsuit and Congress refused to appropriate it. So even something where it's not a reparation, it's just an, they're owed the money. And it's not, you know, there's no question. And they, not, they ain't got it. And they and Congress won't even give them that. So if you imagine that Congress is going to ever, you know, pass reparations for, you know, back to slavery, it's just not happening. And that's why I say we got to figure out something that we can do tomorrow because we can't wait 10 years. There's a crisis right now in the black community. We have to do prison reform. We have to get rid of the prison to, I mean, the school to prison pipeline. We have to fix the schools we, and we need to get capital into those communities. Let me let me ask you a question and I'm going I'm to I'm respond, you know, after you answer. Um, and it's it's a, you know. I feel like, you know, we, we hear from a lot of the candidates as to what they feel black people need or want. And a lot of the things that you said are really valid, right? I'm a firm believer that, you know, everything does start with the family, with the mother and the father in the home. But unfortunately, we have a lot of fathers that are out of the home. Inflation is crazy and things like that. Have you truly ever asked um, black people, like what it is that we really need? Well, I would say I have that conversation all the time. For one thing, I'm friends with your friend, Angela Satin King. Mm -hmm. oh, she puts me in, in front of groups all the time in which we have that discussion. Now, I'm not a politician. You know, I've been, I never intended to run for president. I was, you know, I'm an attorney. I represent poor people. I represent people of color. I represent people who have been injured by it, by, you know, environmental toxins. So that's kind of my expertise. But, you know, I've been around the civil rights movement for when I was a kid, you know, I was with my dad when he was shot and, and who else was there? Coretta Scott King. My, my father was the first one flew out immediately when, when my father did the civil rights march in 63, where King did the I Have a Dream speech. My father did the Poor People's Campaign. The, the two of them were killed a month apart. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my father did the uh, sent the U.S. Marshals down to integrate the University of Alabama. They say he sent 16,000 U.S. Marshals down to integrate, to get James Meredith, who's my friend, into Ole Miss. Um, he did the free, he sent the, the, the uh, the U.S. Marshals and Justice Department officials down to protect the Freedom Riders. He was the one who litigated the Selma March. All of these issues were, you know, issues that, that my family was deeply involved in that was happening in my house growing up. So I grew up with these leaders. I grew up, you know, John Lewis was part of my household, Ralph Albert Abernathy. Um, I knew all the civil rights leaders growing up my whole life. So it's part of my DNA. It's part of the way I think about the world. I know our country is not going to live up to its promise as an exemplary nation until we become a nation of equality. Yeah, I mean, Congress, and this is why, you know, everybody is focused. Uh, yeah, we need to we need to vote when it comes to the presidential race and stuff. Um and I think everybody's just so much focused, but it's like it's the Congress that we really have to pay attention to and who we we put in those seats and things like that. And so I'm glad that you spoke on this. And I, I just want to say this. Um, like I said, I've I've done, you know, my research on you um, and I know who you are. I know what you represent. You're not a politician. OK, you're not, you know, being uh, uh, lobbied to to pass laws in favor of companies that are poison in our communities. You're actually going after those companies like Monsanto and DuPont and hundreds of other uh, companies that you went uh, after alongside of other black firms and things like that. And of course, it's in your bloodline. And um, and you guys really have stood on that. You have sacrificed your life. You don't even have your father here because of his his sacrifice and dedication to just being a good human being. And, and I feel and please don't take this the wrong way. 
and and I, I already know that it's gonna be some shit when I say this, and I don't, and, and it's kind of like may a hit dog holler, but I'm not talking to you in general. I'm talking to uh, anybody that's running for office or any type of seat, whether it's a Senate seat or anything. I just feel that if they really asked us as black people what we want, I would tell them on behalf of black people, we just want a decent human being. A decent, truth-telling human being, not a cracker. <laughs> because here's the thing for years i'm just gonna put it out there we have had and if we're gonna look at the technical definition of a cracker it's somebody who used to crack the whip on on, on niggas in the plantation and i feel that you know given these elections when you know the candidates are talking about what black people need or what brown people need or what indians need or americans is as a whole need, they're forgetting to ask us what it is that we need. And we just want a decent human being. It doesn't matter his race, color, or background or anything like that. We just want somebody to not pander to us. And I feel like when it comes to Trump, when it comes to Biden, they pander. And when you see that pandering, in my opinion, those crackers are pandering to niggas. And then they use rappers and things like that to come pander to black people, but it doesn't work with black people because black people, we are watching what's going on. We're coming out to the polls. We're not being led by, you know, a female rapper that promotes God knows what, you know, to the world, but then wants to tell us, you know, where our, how our tax dollars need to be spent or who we need to vote for. I'm just, I'm just tired of the bullshit all around period. And I feel that like for someone like you who comes from what you come from, you're not a politician. I think personally, and the winos are here too, that you will get the black vote if you keep being that great human being that you've always been your entire career. Tasha, thanks so much. And thanks for having me on the show. I, I, uh, Anytime. I'm going to hit you next time I'm in Miami. Anytime. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you luck. And I hope that you get on that debate stage. Wino, make sure y'all follow Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And we're going to go ahead and drop you down. All you got to do is say, now we got to go. Bye. Bye, bye Josh. <laughs> All right. Shout out to Angela Staten. Okay. And, and you know, that's another reason why I fuck with him. He got a black woman running his shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, he. I tell them all the time, you want to get some shit done? Anybody, hire you a black woman. You ain't got to pander to us. We'll get you in front of the people. We'll tell you the truth. Because black women, we see right through the bullshit. That's why black men don't want shit to do with us. Because we see right through their asses. Anyway, I hope that y'all enjoyed uh, uh, Miss Kennedy. And please get out and, and vote. And I, he will be getting mine. Okay. All right. Uh, listen, we're going to go ahead and uh, sign on off. I appreciate everything. Uh, we are going to run the Blue Glam ad. Make sure y'all use my coupon code. Please don't forget, guys, Sunday, we are in Tampa at the Funny Bone for our Wine Gossip and Comedy Show. We still got some tickets left. You can go to my website, TashaKOnStage.com, to purchase those tickets. You can also uh, purchase tickets to our Philadelphia show as well as our Riley show and Orlando show. You never know. I may have Mr. Kennedy Jr. in the building, okay? They got money, too, and I need a little bit, child. Yes, they do. I may have to ask him for a little something. Mm, mm, mm. Okay? I hope to see y'all this Sunday. I love y'all, and now I gotta go. Bye! Bye. Be boxed in with Blue Glam's half rim glasses and take your eyewear game to the next level. Dark hair may be shaped like a box, but knows no end when it comes to amplifying your look. Manly is everything but that, but the style and possibilities with these round frames are infinite. Danielle exudes confidence and will instantly have you feeling like the boss that you are. And Hannah will make your heart stop and jaw drop in these super unique frames. It's time to take your style out of the box. Visit VooGlam.com and grab these stylish and comfortable frames, plus more. Use the code Tasha K at checkout for a special discount.
Never be boxed in with Boo Glam's half rim glasses and take your eyewear game to the next level. Dark hair may be shaped like a box but knows no end when it comes to amplifying your look. Manly is everything but that, but the style and possibilities with these round frames are infinite. Danielle exudes confidence and will instantly have you feeling like the boss that you are. And Hannah will make your heart stop and jaw drop in these super unique frames. It's time to take your style out of the box. Visit VooGlam.com and grab these stylish and comfortable frames plus more. Use the code Tasha K at checkout for a special discount. candidate uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. RFK Jr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. His documented history pushing dangerous conspiracy theories. Referred to RFK Jr. as the conspiracy candidate. That worm. Parasitic worm in his brain. RFK Jr.'s brain worm. Very bizarre anti-vaccine rally and falsely linking vaccines. His candidacy is an embarrassment. So Trump comes out with a statement here. Oh, after Biden, basically say he's scared to debate RFK. In this episode, we spend 48 hours on the campaign trail with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., a character the mainstream media paints as controversial because of his stance on vaccine mandates and the assertion that the CIA had a part to play in his uncle JFK's death. We take a deep dive with a man that's looking to upset America's two-party system, and if elected, he plans to totally wage war on the establishment as we know it. We talk to him, his supporters, and even a CIA whistleblower to get a better idea of Bobby's platform and what he intends to do if he's elected the 47th president of the United States. But first, let's learn his origin story. Story. Born in the famous Kennedy clan, Bobby experienced adversity early in life when he saw both his uncle and his dad get assassinated by the time he was 14. Shortly after his father's death, Bobby had some turbulent teenage years in which he got expelled from two different schools, got arrested for marijuana possession, and began a 14-year-long addiction with heroin. For most of his career, he's been an environmental lawyer that has successfully sued companies that harm people and pollute the environment. He's won multi-billion dollar settlements against Monsanto, and through his organization Riverkeeper, he's contributed towards cleaner drinking water for New Yorkers. After watching this episode in which we get inside access to Kennedy more than any media team yet, you can determine for yourself if Bobby Kennedy is the dangerous madman that mainstream media makes him out to be, or if you think potentially he's the candidate for Americans to rally around. Let's get this thing started. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here in Denver, Colorado, and today we're interviewing presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And guys, the America that we're in right now is an America in crisis. It's arguably more divisive than it's ever been, maybe other than the Civil War. We have a debt that is spiraling out of control, $35 trillion, more than six figures per American of national debt. We have inflation, people barely able to pay rent, buy groceries, pay the electric bill. Homelessness is out of control. And we have these government agencies that aren't working in our best interest. The people that are in charge of the food are the ones that are ensuring that there's poison in our food. The people that are supposed to be regulating Big Pharma are profiting from Big Pharma. We're going to get on to that later today. It's with great pleasure in this channel that we're going to be interviewing Robert F. Kennedy. We would like to interview all of the candidates. So the Trump team, we'd love to talk to you. I know you're going to be in Milwaukee for the RNC. The Biden team, we'd love to talk to you too. We want to spend a day with you, get to know you, and see what you're about. Where 
we're with the Bobby Kennedy right now. Where are we right now? We're in Conifer, Colorado. And we're about to zip line. That's why we got this get up on. It's a cool way to raise fun. It's one of our outings we do. We've done a bunch of sailing outings. We've done Vulcan Ray. We've done this one. And if this is your first time hearing RFK Jr., you might be wondering why his voice is like that. You're not the only one. Let's explain. Your voice is raspy. Why don't you explain to our audience why? When I was 42 years old, I got struck with a disease, a neurological disease, an injury called spasmodic dystonia, and it makes my voice tremble. We're not allowed to make money from large donors. The largest donation we can accept is 6,600. My administration, the Trump administration, can get a million per donor. How is that allowed? It's a loophole. The parties are allowed to raise unlimited amounts of money. The individual candidates like myself are only allowed to raise maximum of 6,600 per donor. Let's bring you up to speed on the history of third-party candidates in the United States. The last candidate to win the election from a non-mainstream party was Abraham Lincoln in 1864 when he won the ticket on the newly formed Republican Party. However, that's not to say that independents haven't made a strong show in recent years, like Ross Perot did in 1992 when he captured nearly 19% of the vote. One reason why guys like Bobby Kennedy have surged in popularity is due to what Americans perceive as the uniparty. That's the term for the idea that although Democrats and Republicans show disagreement over social issues, they vote almost unanimously when it comes to things like war, raising their own salaries, and increased surveillance of the American people. While many state that a vote for a third party contender is a wasted vote, others say history proves that victory is possible. With that being said, convincing Americans that he can win will be one of Kennedy's great challenges. That's why they have billions. President Biden will have $3 billion. Trump will have close to that. We have to raise virtually all of our money from small, small donors. Wow. This is one of the ways that we've developed to make sure that we got good grassroots support. The system is rigged. The rules are written by the incumbents to favor the incumbents and to make sure that independent candidates can't participate in the election. It's not a democratic way to run an election. We just figured out a lot of work around. The cool thing about it is it's a movement for the people by the people, right? No one can say that there's big corporations running this campaign or being your funder. Uh, yeah. But what is it like on the <clears> campaign <throat> trail? To me, it would seem like one of the most difficult jobs you could possibly sign up for. Exhausting, long days. For me, it's fun. I'm on the road almost every day, but I pace myself. I make sure that I get exercise every day. I make sure that I spend time meditating every day and getting kind of spiritually centered. I don't get spiritually diminished or exhausted. I'm able to have fun and with events like this one. A question my wife had was, you've done so much in your career and this is a big toll to pay. Why is it worth it to you? I wasn't sitting around trying to figure out a way to run for president. That idea was not in my head, but I saw what's happening to my country, particularly during the lockdown. I, you know, I saw them close 3.3 million businesses, never been done before with no scientific citation, no public hearings, no notice and comment rulemaking, all the things that I've been suing governments and corporations for 40 years, all the democratic processes that they're required to use. None of that happened. It was just one bureaucrat who was able just to order us to put on masks when there was no scientific citation, all in violation of the of the Constitution of the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment prohibitions that require due process and just compensation before you close some of these businesses. None of that happened. They shut down jury trials. The Seventh Amendment says very simply, no American shall be denied the right of a trial before a jury of his peers. In cases or controversies exceeding $25, there's no pandemic ex exception. The framers of the Constitution knew all about pandemics. There were two epidemics during the Revolutionary War, a malaria epidemic that decimated the armies of Virginia, and then a smallpox epidemic that shut down the armies of New England at a critical time just when we had conquered Montreal. Benedict Arnold, who was our greatest general, conquered Montreal. He was in the inner city, and he had to withdraw because so many of his troops were down with smallpox, and otherwise Canada today would be part of the United States. Almost every one of the framers who wrote the draft of the Bill of Rights had lost family members or close friends in these epidemics, and yet they did not put an epidemic exception in the Constitution. They didn't write the First Amendment to protect convenience speech. They wrote it to protect the speech that nobody wants to hear. And yet they shut down freedom of speech during the pandemic. During that part, I was I was heavily, heavily censored. Running for president, I'll be able to talk about these issues and they won't be able to censor me as much. And that, in fact, has happened. What are the things that when you make it to office, that these are the number one, two, and three things, the top things I mean, that we're the, gonna focus on? One of the biggest issues is the national debt. It's 
34 trillion dollars today just the service on that debt costs us more than the military budget within five years 50 cents out of every dollar that is collected in taxes is going to go to servicing the debt in 10 years 100 percent that's existential the forever wars are existential they're isolating our country and the world they're causing you know BRICS, which is going to end the american dollar as global reserve currency which will be devastating it'll make the great depression look like a cakewalk it's crushing the soul of this country so we got to end it neither of these presidents are able to do that they presided over it in four short years that each of them were in office they ran up half of that 34 trillion dollar debt which to put in perspective for the people back home it's over six figures of debt per american citizen which is an absurd amount yeah, and in the last hundred days, we added another trillion dollars. President Trump, during his four years, spent more money than all the presidents before him combined. When we get to that 10-year mark, if nothing changes now, what's going to happen when more than 100% of our tax income is going just to servicing the debt? What happens to America at that point? Well, you know, our country in that at that point would go bankrupt. One of the other existential threats to our country is the polarization. The division in this country, the vitriol, the anger, the poison is worse than any time since the American Civil War. And it's all being amplified by the algorithms on social media. I'm going to run for president without feeding this vitriol. Neither President Trump or President Biden, both of them recognize the problem. But they can't step out of it because they're part of it. Their success as politicians is based upon their capacity to feed that vitriol, to make their followers hate the other guy. I'm going to be respectful to both of these candidates are going to criticize them for their policies. I'm not going to criticize them personally. If I'm successful, Americans are going to forget that they're Democrats or Republicans, and they're all going to remember that they're Americans. Are you have enough time to listen to music these days, and, and what's on your playlist, if so? My favorite music would be classic rock and roll, blues, but I like I like bluegrass, I like country. Who are some of your classic rock bands you like? The Rolling Stones, The Beatles, Cream. Do the Eagles or CCR do it for you? CCR is one of my top bands. And what do you do for fun, or is fun not existing anymore? Oh, I have fun every day. How do you relax? You know, I play a lot of volleyball with my kids. I play a lot of water sports. Trump said in the swamp, you can agree there's a lot of swamp activities going on up there. What makes you the man for the job that can go in there, clear it out? The swamp really is the regulatory agencies, and you know, particularly since the Citizens United case. Let's talk about money in American politics. In 2010, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Citizens United, and this has opened the floodgates for money to flow into politics. According to OpenSecrets.org, in the 10 years since Citizens United has passed, over $4.5 billion has gone through our political system. This ruling has allowed elites to bend the rules to their favor. For example, it allows hedge funds to own thousands of single-family homes while the average American can barely afford one. It allows Big Pharma to fund puppets that reduce regulations for them, often to the detriment of the American people. In effect, it allows our system to be sold to the highest bidder. And in today's economy, where 56% of Americans can't even afford a $1,000 emergency, much less the money to fund campaigns, it leaves the common man at a severe disadvantage. Folks, last time I checked, the people who serve in government are supposed to be public servants that do things for the people, by the people. But for some reason, these greedy little f have forgotten that. In order to drain the swamp, we have to end that corrupt merger of state and corporate power and return the agencies to their initial job, which is to serve the public interest. They don't do anymore. They're serving the mercantile interests of the companies and the industries they regulate. Most politicians, including Trump, I think President Trump, intend to drain the swamp. But you get into political office and you see an agency like the CIA, which has 20,000 personnel, and, or NIH, which has even more. At every level of that agency, there are individuals who could commit a civil disobedience to embarrass a president if the president adopts a policy that threatens their power centers. The presidents realize that as soon as they get into office, and they become scared of the agencies, and they become scared of tampering with them, and so they never actually drain the swamp. Instead, they bring in safe people to run them. And if you look at the Trump administration, it was mainly corporations who were then put in charge of the agencies that are supposed to regulate them. And I feel like I'm in a unique position to actually change the corporate culture of these agencies because I've sued almost every one of them. When you litigate against
as one of these agencies, you get a PhD in corporate capture. You understand who the individuals are who are corrupt and who have to be moved. I know their names in many cases. So for example, FDA gets 50% of its budget from the pharmaceutical company. Of course, they know that they're working for pharma. They're not working for us. NIH has a policy now that was adopted in 1980. Individual scientists who work for NIH can collect royalties on products they regulate. Well, that is crazy. Those are the people that you want finding problems with those products so that we don't get exposed to dangers. But they now are paying for their mortgages, their boats, their alimonies, their children's education. If that product gets to market and generates loyal royalties, they get to keep them. So they have an incentive to close their eyes. I'm not scared to know how they work and I know who has to be moved and I'll actually do it. So when I was 18, in Africa, I got that bird and trained it. And what's the term for this? Either falconry or hawking. There, you can see that bird coming to like this. Those are falcons, and that's one of my dogs. And you hunt with the dog and the falcon there. How do the dog and the falcon interact? Well, the dog points on the game. And then you put the falcon up, the falcon will go 600, 800, 1,000 feet up, and then you get the dog to flush. When the game gets in the, you know, it's a duck or a, a pheasant gets in the air, the falcon will drop down at 140 miles an hour and will knock the bird. There's one of the birds you see with the hood on. You picked up a snake? <laughs> Were you a little scared when you did that? No. I've been picking them up my whole life. Is that you as a boy? I, yeah, that's what I mean, was a little kid. You had nice fashion sense as a kid. Do you plan bringing hawks or falcons to the White House? I would uh, probably keep some at Camp David. Besides your uncle, who would you say is the best U.S. president of all time? I would say Lincoln was the best, Washington, Franklin Roosevelt. What do you think of I Teddy think Roosevelt? Ulysses Grant. I love Teddy Roosevelt, but he did a lot of sketchy stuff too. I didn't like Reagan's policies, but I, you know, I like the fact that Reagan was able to inspire Americans and give them a sense of purpose and a sense of greatness. I think anyone out there watching this in America, they should be excited. They should be ready to contribute. They should be ready to work hard. They should be ready to make this country what it is, because we have had an exceptional country but a lot of people feel like we're at the edge of a cliff and some people feel like we actually jumped it off yeah, already. We're, we're off the cliff. Can we climb back up? Yeah. I don't care who you think you're going to vote for but as an American you should be excited to contribute because together we can build something remarkable. Amer America has been a remarkable place for a long long time but there is this common sentiment that we're dipping but we get to put in the sweat equity and make it a great place and love our families, love our neighbors, love our countrymen and unite and I think that's what we're really looking for. Whoever is going to win in 2024 we need someone that can unite the people and someone that can get that pet back at our step. Like we're Americans, goddammit. <laughs>
are making those choices and that people need choice. Some candidates have the best spiel, the best pitch. They say all the things you want to hear. For me, I'm always looking for the person, even if I don't agree with everything they say, that what they say is what they mean. And he speaks from his own core convictions, which is why he can go on like these podcasts and like anybody on the street can ask him anything because he doesn't have to think and manufacture anything. He's speaking purely from his conviction. Do you think he's the guy that can unite America? I think it's difficult for America to be united in any context right now. I don't think anybody can be like a, the, the, this notion of the great unifier. And I don't think we should look to politicians to unite us. I think that's like a personal thing. Like let them go out there and do dry political shit. It's not their job to unite us. Like that's our job to unite ourselves. The humility of this man is extraordinary. I believe he is carrying or is being ca carried by a change that's happening, a peaceful change that's happening in the world. Was a great distribution of power to those who had value. There's been so much political division, right, left, Democrat, Republican, good, bad. Like it, it gets exhausting. And then when you see a candidate like like Bobby Kennedy, who really just represents the ideals of what, what America stands for. What's been happening over the last 12, 15, 20 years is, you know, we get a president in, they fill the cabinet and, and all the positions with the people they like. Then they get out and another president comes in, they fill the position the cabinet with the people they like. It becomes this back and forth slinky. Like the needle never moves. And I believe Bobby is the one to really bring people together in a way that we recognize our humanity again. concerns about the influence of big tech companies on society, including issues related to antitrust, content moderation, and misinformation. I'm going to stop the censorship, and I'm going to stop the, the propaganda. A lot of the propaganda is being driven by the intelligence agencies now in this country. The CIA was chartered in 1937. Its charter contains a prohibition against the CIA propagandizing Americans. The CIA was doing that anyway. And in 1973, the American public learned it for the first time. The CIA had an operation called Operation Mockingbird. Operation Mockingbird refers to a program the CIA began in the 1950s with the mission of manipulating the media to publish false stories and push an anti-communist message. At its peak, the program had over 400 journalists and 25 large media organizations around the world on its payroll to carry out assignments and shape public perception. RFK maintains to this day the CIA is still instrumental in manipulating the American people, as does Republican frontrunner President Trump, who would argue that the intelligence community's alleged suppression of the Hunter Biden's laptop story may May have even cost him the 2020 election. Given that Bobby Kennedy believes that the CIA took out his uncle in the 60s and that he has an openly stated mission to give that agency a thorough detox if he's elected, it will be interesting to see how the CIA responds to Kennedy as his polling numbers climb. We're outside the fundraiser. We're here with Pedro, who is a ex-CIA guy and also has a book whistleblowing on the CIA. And that's one of Kennedy's big subjects is cleaning up the CIA so it works for the people. What can you tell us about the inner workings of the CIA that the American people should know about? The CIA, the creation of the 19... 47 National Security Act and its original foundation was to become a center of analysis to keep the president fully informed of world affairs to avoid another Pearl Harbor type incident but yet here we are 2024 and we've had intelligence failure after intelligence failure and the CIA has failed in its mandate the reality is it has become just another government bureaucracy that spends a lot of money despite the fact that they do do some good work we've had significant problems 1950s 1960s going into the 70s disclosed through the church committee about significant abuses of power cia basically staging coups manipulating all americans over central america especially but all over the world how long did you work with the cia i spent 18 years at the cia and in my 18 years i did basically just about everything you can do i started an analysis certified as an analyst president's daily briefs senior executive briefs briefings to seniors, brief DCIAs. What's something in the modern era relevant to people, something they should know about the CIA or something that you're blowing the whistle on? The rule of law. If a government agency or a presidential administration does not obey the laws of the land, we're basically becoming a tyrannical form of government. He's pulling votes away from both Trump and Biden. There is no reasoning whatsoever not to give him Secret Service protection. I've never spoken with the ex-CIA agent before. Happy that I did. And I'm proud that you're with me today. Thank you. Thank God you. God bless you. God bless you too.
the, it's, it's 7 30 a.m. We're walking to the Denver Fox News building and we're gonna catch Mr. Kennedy in action in the morning. His security detail is securing the premises and I think he's gonna be pulling up shortly. But just people understand each of our candidates, the pressure, the schedule that they are putting themselves through. These guys are 70 and up. I don't know how they do it. I don't know if it's a Ozempic for most of them or what. Keep in mind, anytime we talk shit about a president, how much they go through on a day-to-day -day basis, how much they sacrifice their health. We look at pictures of people before and after their presidency. This job ages you. Hey, how are you? Mr. Kennedy, thanks very much for joining me this morning. Thanks for having me, Maria. So your reaction to you not being offered this position, have you heard from the campaigns or from CNN or ABC? to ask your plausibility of being on that debate stage. We are in discussions with CNN. CNN published a list of criteria, four criteria for, for candidates getting in the debate, and we have shown CNN that we meet all of those criteria. They have now made, they made a public offer, and uh, we're in discussion with CNN now. That's a wrap. You rocked it. Pleasure. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, you are polling wonderfully with the younger generations, under 45. To win the election, you probably got to win over the baby boomers. How are you going to do that? Well, you know, I think the baby boomers actually ought to be supporting me because that's the generation that lived through Camelot. They, you know, they um, have nostalgia about the Kennedy era, and they really liked me a lot when I was only known as an environmental champion. But that generation also gets its news from MSNBC, from CNN. And if you're living in that information bubble, you're going to have a very low opinion of me. Well, I think my challenge, and I'm winning with young people, I'm winning with independents, I'm doing very well with Hispanics and other demographics. My big challenge is the baby boomers, and in order to reach them, I need to start getting on it, on those networks. And they have not let me on for 15 years. Oh, we're starting to break that fortress. We got one with Aaron Burnett on CNN two weeks ago, and last week they let us on MSNBC for a live interview with Harry Melbourne. Well, I'm hoping that that's the beginning of a trend. Do you feel like you're finally kicking through that door and they're gonna have you on, and that's gonna be the, some of the swing factor? I, I mean, I think that's what we need to do. I think because of my polling numbers, because of my presence in the race, that it's harder and harder for them to deny me a presence on their networks. We'll see. Kennedy is currently trying to get on the CNN debate stage to face off against Trump and Biden June 27th. As the de facto nominees for the two major parties, Biden and Trump have already been greenlit by CNN to be on the stage. Bobby, however, as an independent candidate, faces two major hurdles to join them on that stage. The first is he has to get 15% or more in four national polls. He secured that for three polls currently, Marquette Law, Quinny Piac, and CNN's own internal polls, and he needs one more to check that box. The second criteria is that he needs to get on the ballot in enough states to constitute over 270 electoral votes, the amount needed to win the election in November. To get on the ballot, an army of volunteers and local experts is needed to get signatures from individual residents of the states before submitting to the state election commissions. For example, in the state of Texas, Team Kennedy turned in over 245,000 signatures to get on the ballot, an expensive and time-intensive task. Due to the strictness of these rules, the Kennedy team has filed a complaint with the Federal Election Commission alleging that CNN was colluding with the Biden and Trump teams to keep Bobby off the debate stage. We'll see what CNN, known ops of me and the channel, decide to do as missing the debates make it nearly impossible for Kennedy to win the election. For Kennedy to get on the stage, he's going to have to get four major polls that CNN will accept at 15% or higher. One of the major polls in the country is actually in Milwaukee at Marquette University. So we're going to head there, talk to a guy that runs the polls there, and dig into this issue just a little bit more. Here's what we learned. From your estimation, RFK Jr., is he in the running to be on the debate stage? Oh, I think he's very much in the running to get on. If we think that he's really running at about 12% support, but you look at 20 different polls, there's a good chance that with the margin of error, some of those 20 will bump over 15%, even if he really is just at 12 So There is a great amount in this country that considers CNN to be a propaganda machine, not a trusted 
trusted source of media. Should Americans trust who they pick from the polls to certify RFK? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the range of pollsters and the way the pollsters try to recruit a random sample of the public is pretty good. I don't think there's much there. When it comes to on air and shows and how questions are framed, not in the poll, but in, in the debate, well, I think that's where you might see the partisan leanings of uh, the hosts of the debate show through. If RFK does make the debate stage, do you anticipate a great jump in the polls? Yes. It will expose him to a lot of people that haven't yet gotten to know him. As well known as he is, in our polling, it's still around 30% that say they don't know enough about him to have an opinion of him. I hear you can do some pull-ups and push-ups. I'm excited to meet you at the gym in just a little bit. <laughs> cool. we'll see you over there. We're waiting at a gym, he's gonna pull up, we're gonna get a lift in together, but like you get to see behind the scenes of the security apparatus, like everywhere they go, they have to be on their pivot. There's multiple SUVs pulling up, guys in suit, earpieces, and sure enough, he showed up in his jeans. I got, a, I got a very critical question I gotta confront you on. Some people say the rumor is that you skipped leg days. I did leg day yesterday. You did leg day yesterday? Yeah, I lift a lot of weight on leg day. Okay, and what do you got, what do you got today? I am gonna do pulls. The America we knew in the 1960s is very different than America today as far as fitness, chronic illness, and that's one of your primary things that you want to change about America. Tell me about it. The chronic disease epidemic is you know, probably the biggest of all the kind of existential crises that we're facing. When my uncle is president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease. Today it's 60%. Those are neurological disorders, autoimmune diseases, allergic diseases, and obesity. The causes of this are toxic exposures. So toxic exposures are food, medicines, and our water. And the problem is we have government agencies that are supposed to be protecting our health, but instead they have become captured by the industries they're supposed to regulate. The big food industries by processed food by the pharmaceutical companies. They'll spend a lot of money studying how to treat diabetes, but they're not going to study what the causes are. When I was a kid, a typical pediatrician would see one case of diabetes in his lifetime. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door has diabetes. And nobody's asking why this is happening, because the reason it's happening are because we're doing mass poisoning. And people are making money both on poisoning us and, and on treating chronic diseases that, that result from that poisoning. Removing all the poison in our food, do you think that weight is going to be shed and that Americans will be a lot more healthy than they are? I mean, you need lifestyle changes, but the big issue is adding the poison to our food and getting good nutrition to people. People get sick. We're getting exposed to a billion microbes every day. Our body has a capacity from 4 billion years of evolution to fight things off. So it's only sick people who get sick from infectious disease. Would this be fair to summarize your campaign as this, that it's almost, you're going to be the guy that tries to take the poison out of the government and the poison out of our food and make, make our government healthy again, make our people healthy again. Uh, and the corruption and this corrupt merger of state and corporate power and get good food to the American people that, you know, our children are growing up healthy rather than sick. So, what you see on his back is Waterkeeper Alliance. <laughs> what he's spent a lot of his career as an environmental lawyer doing is prosecuting the companies that would dump into our water supply, our food supply, and he's a bigger reason why the water quality in New York is better. We go to a lot of the dangerous places in America, a lot of the places that are really struggling, like Pine Ridge Reservation, Kensington, Philadelphia. We've been to Skid Row. We've been to a lot of the places that are really, really struggling right now. How do we bring prosperity back to a lot of the hoods, the reservations, and then some of the rural areas that are just the places that are struggling? How do we impact those problems? Well, there's different issues. I mean, the biggest issue for homelessness is the housing crisis. There's a direct correlation. California has 50% of the unsheltered homeless in America. Why is that? It's because California has the highest housing prices. People say homeless people are drug addicts and mentally ill. A lot of people who are homeless become that way. So with the hoods, a lot of the problem in the reservations, the rural area, there's no jobs. There, all the industry is left overseas to Mexico, China, 
overseas, they used to have booming middle class. How do we get jobs back to those areas? We have to definancialize our economy and reindustrialize. We've been exporting our industries for the last 30 years. And, you know, part of that is these big trade agreements that we had that exported American jobs to China and to other parts of the world. And we need to reindustrialize the American economy. And that's what my whole program is about. We did bring a, a present for you, I'll show you. I don't know if you can openly wear this in public or if it's even your style, but <laughs> RIP mainstream media. Maybe in the privacy of your home. <laughs> yeah. We'll give it to your team. Uh, thank you. Do you feel like mainstream media has lied to us and has been so manipulated that it is dying? It's in a little bit of a death spiral? I think the reasons for the death of mainstream media, they're not doing journalism anymore. Journalism means maintaining a posture of fear and skepticism towards authority, towards government, and particularly during COVID. But even before that, they exposed themselves as being as propaganda vessels. There was no questioning allowed. There was a lot of censorship of dissenting views. Journalists are supposed to speak truth to power. This man is a pull-up machine, folks. You do 50 pull up 100 push ups. 100 push ups in five minutes. You got a five minutes on the dot, didn't you? No, I didn't. I got the close. I got was five minutes and 20 seconds. Well, I, haven't, I haven't qualified, but I think you could. It's refreshing to have a candidate that's in shape and active and has a grasp on the outdoors and it's physically competent. We don't, we don't get a lot of that. Folks back home, if you want to do the Kennedy challenge, 100 push ups, 50 pull ups, see if you can do it in five minutes or less. We're going to make America fit again. Is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly. And I approve this message. <laughs> this, yeah. this man is burning my forums out. I'm a young buck. I'm up and at it every day of the week. He's doing burnout sets, which my forums are already feeling it, but I'm not about to be no communist I'm going to keep pushing. I got another whopper. One of the major conflicts in the world right now, Israel-Palestine. How do you end that conflict and bring peace back to the world and the region? I'm against war, and I think over the past 100 years, there's been only one moral war that we fought, which is World War II. All the other ones were wars of choice. In World War II, we were attacked by an implacable enemy that was sworn to the destruction of all of our values, of our sovereignty, of our country. Israel today is in the same position. It was attacked not just on October 7th, for 16 years preceding that, since Hamas took over Gaza. I'm very pro-Palestinian. I've spent a lot of time in Israel with Palestinian friends. I've been in the West Bank. I met with the Palestinian Authority. I have friends in Gaza. And uh, the Palestinians are the chief victims of Hamas. Gaza has Palestinians have gotten more money from the international community, 10 times the amount of money per capita that we use to rebuild Europe during the Marshall Plan. Money has disappeared because the leadership of Hamas steals it. Ismail Haniyeh, who is the supreme leader of Hamas, has a net worth of $5 billion. They use the other part of the money that they don't steal to buy weapons and to build 300 miles of tunnels. They have hijacked Gaza for the single purpose of destroying Israel. And, that, and they say in their charter that it's a crime against Islam to even negotiate with Israel. So I don't see how, what Israel people are, are saying we should be demanding a ceasefire, but then what? We were in, Israel was in the middle of the ceasefire when they were attacked. It was their fifth ceasefire with Hamas, and every one of those Hamas is used to attack Israel, to do another strike, to regroup, to rearm, to hoist the banners, and have another attack. I think Israel really only has one choice, which is to destroy Hamas. I think almost any reasonable person could say Hamas is a bad actor needs to go. There's also people that are saying, look, we understand why Israel began the attack, but when we see children at being bombed at the race they are, when we see hospitals being bombed, and almost, I think it's a half the population is homeless now, that Israel has gone too far in their approach. Well, but why would you blame Israel for that? You guys, they're fighting an enemy that deliberately used civilian shields. Nobody wants to to attack a hospital. It's a war crime to attack a hospital unless the enemy is using that hospital as a base, which they were. Why are people blaming Israel for attacking a hospital when Hamas put its command centers and its weapons armories in that hospital? Mm. Now we need to start pointing the fingers at the people who are responsible for this especially If there's a bank robber who grabs his hostage and is firing over the hostage's head at the police and other civilians, the police shoot him by mistake, kill the hostage. Who do you blame for that? 
you blame the police? No, you blame the bank robbers. Mm -hmm. So why are we blaming Hamas for what's going on there? You know, we shouldn't reward terrorism. So the owners of that Hamas, they made the attack, they're using their people as shields. If they truly cared about their own Palestinian people, they would end it now. They would end it or, or, or fight a military battle. They have 40,000 troops. Don't hide behind women and children. It's very cowardly to do. Yeah, and that's what we should be talking about. So we just got a channel first, a workout with a presidential candidate. Again, Team Trump, Team Biden, hit us up. We wanna do something with you guys too and let the American people get to know you on more of a human level as well. All right guys, we'll see you at the rally. So folks, we're here at a Kennedy rally. People here are excited. I've never been to a presidential rally. I would love to go to a Trump rally one day. We're backstage at the Kennedy rally. We got crowd filling up. We had lines out the door. We're gonna see if we can talk to Kennedy in the green room, ask him a couple more questions I think are important to the audience back home. So we'll keep you posted. Good to see you again. Uh, one of the questions I really wanted to ask you, for my demographic, a big thing that they're thinking about is I don't think I'm gonna be able to afford a home anymore. What plan do you have so that people my age can get a home in America. The spear tip of my campaign is to get young Americans into homes. That is an absolute critical first step in rebuilding the American middle class in this country. If you own a home, you care about your community. You care about your police, your firefighters, your schools, you go to the PTA meetings, you care about your neighbors, but more importantly, you have equity. And if you have equity, it means you can borrow money and you can pursue your economic impulse. You have the money to, you can get a second mortgage on your home, you can use that money to finance it. a bowling alley or a yoga studio or a sporty goods store or a bar or restaurant. And this is the way that we created the American middle class in our country. And today we're moving away from that. And part of the reason for that, giant corporations like BlackRock, Blackstone, the State Street and Vanguard are now buying up our houses. Almost 30% of the houses purchased last year were purchased by investors. So they're turning us, and, and kids your age cannot compete with them for the cost of money. Oh, you hear so many stories from kids your age who, are, who put money down in a home or went into escrow or were about to go into escrow or were about to sign a contract and somebody comes in at the last minute with a cash offer 20 percent greater than the asking price and when you figure out who that person is who's that person bought your home it's usually an llc with an ambiguous name and if you follow the strings back it leads back to black rock state street bank or to one of these big fidelity one of these big investment houses and it's impossible for kids your age to get into homes. We need to change that. And I have a whole retinue of programs to make sure that every kid your age who wants to, who's willing to work hard, who's willing to play by the rules, is going to be able to finance a home uh, and, and do the other things the American dream always promised us. How are you going to do that? One of the things, the reforms that are going to make immediately is to make, change the tax code and change the law to make it very, very difficult or investment houses to buy single family homes in the country. And that's what we need to do. There's a bill right now in front of Congress that's going nowhere because we don't have a president that's got behind it that says exactly that. It, it punishes those companies for purchasing homes and turning them into rental properties. They're turning us from an ownership society to a society of renters. When they do that, they're going to transform America, from Americans from citizens into subjects. Now, I'm going to give everybody in your age a rich uncle, which is Uncle Sam. And then Uncle Sam, the same way we did with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, with them. my uncle did in 1960 with a 3% loan program. We don't have to further burden the debt we can issue predatory bills at 3% interest rates that are zero tax. We've both been to the border. We've seen the impact of fentanyl on, on American communities. Is securing the border important to you and how would you do it? Yeah, I'm gonna secure the border. There's three things that we need to do to secure the border. One is change of policy. We need to reinstate the Migrant Protection Act, which requires people who have claims that their lives are in danger, that they adjudicate those claims in Mexico before they come out in the United States. The other is to change the catch and release program back to catch and return program. We also need infrastructure changes. We need to plug the 27 gaps in the wall we don't need a wall 
all, all the way from Brownsville, Texas, 2,200 miles to San Diego, that you need a physical structure in the urban areas where migrants could quickly disappear. So there's 27 gaps in the wall that were left in the Trump wall, and I will fill those gaps. And then third is personnel. We need to put about 300 asylum court judges on the border so they can quickly adjudicate asylum claims. We need to fill up completions in the Border Patrol. And I will do all those things as soon as I get into office. I want to say it's been an absolute honor to meet you, cover your campaign. It's exciting to see that change is possible in this country. I'm rooting for you. It's just a blessing to be here, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for doing this. I'm still awestricken by your 30 pull-ups this morning. I now have a role model and a goal in life. So come back in here and I should be a 32. That sounds good. I said this last year, if you give me a sword and some ground to stand on, I will win your country back for you. God bless you, God bless America, thank you all very, very much. So folks, that was a look into the campaign of Bobby Kennedy. We got to know the man, we got to work out with him, see a rally, it was very interesting. And folks, as an American, you get to pick the person that you think is the best leader for this country. So whether you think that Trump, Biden, or Bobby, I encourage you to exercise your right as a citizen to vote. I think we all can agree we want a great place for everybody and pick the guy that you think is gonna do that. If you think Bobby is that guy, you can donate to his campaign. The link is in my description. And the Biden team, Trump team, Hope to hear from you. Thank you guys for joining me on this episode. We'll see you next week. Peace. Folks, hope you enjoyed this episode. You want to watch another? Here. You want to subscribe? Over here. See you next week. This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E.com. What you guys are about to hear and watch, in some cases, is an interview with a politician, all right, or at least an aspiring politician. It's Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's making a bid for the White House. Uh, we do not have a hell of a lot of politicians on the show, but it does happen now and then. By the best of our recollection, and Corinne and I texted about this, uh, we've done over 500 episodes and had on seven elected officials. That list includes five Republicans, and two Democrats, as well as a politician's kid. And, uh, and, and don't go looking back. It wasn't Chelsea Clinton. Now, Kennedy here is an independent. So that's a third party category. So our first third party category, independent category. And I'll point out, I think it is a welcome category because I get a little fed up with the two-party system that has enjoyed a monopoly on the office of the president of the United States of America since, get this, 1856. Now, I under understand um, we've got a hotly contested presidential race coming up here, and we have candidates who have entirely different worldviews, entirely different priorities, entirely different personalities. Um, and I don't want anyone to get their panties in a bunch 
about us having on one candidate and not the others. All right. So I'm telling you this. If you don't hear from Trump or Biden on the Meat Eater podcast, it ain't our fault. I would love to have them on. If they come on, if you come on, I promise a friendly conversation. All you got to do is reach out to our producer, Corinne, which is what RFK Jr.'s people did, and we will have you on. We'll have a friendly conversation that sticks to personal background, the outdoors, and natural resources issues. If you jam some other stuff in there, you'll probably be okay, but we're going to try to focus on those three things. Um, now, let's get out the show and learn some stuff, right, about pollution, assassination, and the ways in which our future, the, let me put it this way, the ways in which decisions we make now are going to impact the future of natural resources and the management of the lands and waters where you hunt and fish. That's what we're going to talk about now. And we will be looking for our emails from the Trump and Biden campaign. And when they reach out, they will come on the show. Um, it'll, be, it'll be all kinds of fun. Thank you. Hey everybody, today we're joined by independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who has been, uh, um, every morning I read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and, um, and I've been admiring how much heat you get from the left and the right. That's got to feel good. <laughs> so it comes, it comes like an equal, it comes in with equal intensity from from each side. Yeah, now it is. I, I was getting it much worse from the left until about, I'd say, three weeks ago. And um, and at that point, I think the Trump organization was looking at some of the polls, which showed that I was taking more uh, votes away from conservatives than it was from liberals. Mm -hmm. And I think then, you know, they turned on me. Oh, so, but, you know... And I think you're right. It's, you know, when I, I staked out a position in the middle, I said that when I announced a year ago, I said, I'm not, I said, you know, we have this toxic polarization in the country that is more dangerous than at any time since the American Civil War. It's, um, it's amplified by the social media algorithms, which have learned that the way to keep eyeballs on the site is to fortify people's worldviews. And and that feeds into this polarization because if you're a Republican and, and you live, live next door to a Democrat and you ask the same question of Google, you're likely to get a different answer mm. um, because they know that if they reinforce what you already believe, you're going to stay on that site longer. So they're feeding you they're manipulating us all with these algorithms, and those algorithms, which are now you know no longer even under the control of Google or any of these other sites, are feeding this polarization. And, and to me, it's very, very dangerous because you can't see any good end to it. And so what I said is when I announced is that I was not going to feed into the polarization, I was not going to vilify and marginalize my opponents. I was going to, instead of focusing on these sort of culture war issues that, that are or used to keep us all apart, and I was going to try to identify the shared values that unite Americans and make people forget that they're either Democrat or Republican and make us all remember that we're, we're all Americans. And I, I think I've been pretty successful at doing that. Um, my favorability ratings are better than President Trump's or President Biden's. I have the best, highest favorability of any political leader in the country and than anybody else they measured. And, you know, Zogby just did this huge poll that's 26,000 people. That's 10 times the size of any other poll done. It has a margin of error of practically zero. And it shows that in a head-to-head -head race, I beat President Trump narrowly by about three electoral votes. In a head-to-head -head race, I beat President Biden by a landslide. I win 39 states. He wins 11. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Uh, and so I think there's a lot of Americans who would like to vote for me, but there are uh, the, the strategy of the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign is to make you hate the other guy, make you fear that if Biden gets elected, it's going to be the end of the republic. If Trump gets elected, it's going to be the end of the republic. So you can't uh, you can't vote for anybody else except for the Democratic or Republican nominee. And that's, you know, that's something I have to over the next Five and a half months, I have to persuade Americans that they can vote for hope instead of voting out of fear. One of the things I had read, and and just as I was kind of following your campaign in preparation and having a chance to talk to you, and, and, and trust me, I want to, I, I'd love to get into, and we will get into a lot of the areas that are of particular interest to our listeners, which is uh, habitat issues, environmental issues, outdoor adventure. Um, I'd love to talk about all that, but one of the things I noticed that the times had these sort of back-to-back pieces and one was about signature gathering, which seemed like very far removed from, uh, that seemed like personal decisions made by people out in the field rather than like very far removed from any direction from the campaign around a signature gathering issue. And the other was this, uh, this health issue about a parasite. And I thought that was very funny because I'm riddled with parasites. And um, one of my colleagues who I was with today, we both had trichinosis. And um, when I heard that, I felt like it, it made me like you more uh, because it, <laughs> it just makes me feel like someone makes me feel like someone from the, from the trenches, man. Like, like, you know, it's like outside of a coddled existence. Like when you travel and stuff, you just expose the things. So when I saw that, I didn't have any. I didn't have any sense of. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have any sense of alarm. And I saw yeah. the nighttime comedy, whatever you call them, the nighttime TV hosts having a field day with it, and I just felt like uh, I don't know, man. I, I, it reminded me of my own things that I, my own stuff I've encountered from traveling in the developing world, man. Yeah, uh, anybody who travels in Latin America or Africa particularly or South Asia is, is going to end up with parasites. And I, like like you, I'm riddled with parasites. But I, I had this, you know, this is 13 years ago. The Times found out about my so-called brain worm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I, it, it, it came up somehow in a deposition that I was doing during a, my divorce mm-hmm. 13 years ago. And... Um, I mean, briefly, it's not a, it's not an interesting story, but I had I was getting the severe brain fog, and uh, I was having trouble with word retrieval and and short term memory, and even long term memory. And a, a friend of mine, I was in prison for the summer of two thousand one in maximum security prison in Puerto Rico, and my oh, that was around uh, Vieques, right? The uh, Vieques, Vieques. My, yeah, yeah. My cellmate was the head of the biggest labor union in, uh, in, in North America, which was SEIU, which, and he was a hospital worker, it's a hospital workers union. And I happened to be with him when I was, you know, worried about this issue. And I started talking to him about it and he, he was deeply concerned and he immediately got me down to Columbia Presbyterian and, uh, and they did an MRI on me and they found this this black spot in my brain and my uncle had just died from glioblastoma and he had had surgery on the glia, which is a brain tumor. And so, and because my uncle Teddy was the chairman of the health committee in the United States Senate for 50 years, we knew, my my family knew every doctor, you know, every great doctor, at least in North America and really all around the world. And Teddy had had, when he got his glioblastoma, it was a very complex tumor. It looks like a spider web in your brain. And um, he he got a list of these, the, you know, the best neurosurgeons in the world, and they were all on speed dial. And then he passed away, and this was a few months after his death. And I found out about this thing. And so we had all of these great neurosurgeons on speed dial. And we sent the films to all of them, and they all said, "Yeah, it's a tumor. You got surgery. You have to have surgery." So I was going to use Teddy's surgeon, who was down at Duke in North Carolina, and I was not, believe me, looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. And you know, when Teddy got his surgery, they, he was awake during the whole thing, and they just they took off the top of his his skull, and they would the doctor would press the 
the flat part of the scalpel against certain parts of his brain where the tumor was, and then he'd ask him a series of mathematical and language questions, and if he could answer those questions, he'd cut out that little piece of brain. What? Yeah, and if he couldn't, it was like Silence of the Lambs. Did you ever see that? <laughs> see, it was, it yeah, was yeah. very much like reminiscent of that, and that's, that's how they do it. So I was going to go to that same guy, and I, I went down. I was supposed to get my surgery on a Tuesday morning, and I went down to uh, Columbia Presbyterian to pick up my films. It was a young Irish doctor. Remember, every great doctor in the world said, that's definitely a tumor. You need to get surgery. Mm. And it was a young Irish doctor in the office, and he— and I, I struck up a conversation with him because, you know, he was from Ireland and we were talking about all that. And then he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I've got to go get brain surgery. I've got to get a tumor. I'm here picking up my films. And he said, do you mind if I take a look at him? I said, not at all. And there was a light box in the room and he put one of the, the pictures up on the light box. And he looked at it a long time. And then he turned to me and he said, I don't think you've earned surgery. And I, I said, tell me more. And he said, I don't think this is a tumor. And he said, I, what you ought to do is we ought to take very precise measurements of it and then come back in six weeks and see if it's grown at all. And I did that in six weeks. It was exactly the same size. And he said, come back in another six weeks. We did it again. It was exactly the same size. And that's when he said, this is a, this is a parasite that's eaten part of your brain and then died. Mm. So, um, and I remember seeing that Twilight Zone when I was a kid about the, about the you know, the earwig that crawls in the guy's oh, ear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, like, and they finally get it out, but then they discovered it was a female and it laid eggs in there. So that was one of those, you know, those uh, classic Twilight Zones. But yeah. anyway, um, it, it's gone. And then what I found out after that is that my mercury levels were off the chart. They're 10 times what EPA considered safe because I eat a lot of freshwater fish and yeah. a lot of saltwater fish. I had mercury off the charts. And I fish, you know, in the summer almost every day. Oh, and I eat the fish and, you know, I just have, and it's, they're predatory fish. The freshwater fish in this country are having huge, huge mercury levels. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so I get the mercury chelated out. My brain fog went away. Hmm. So I don't think it had anything to do with the brain worm. But anyway, it was good copy for a couple of days. In the One papers. of our colleagues upstairs, he had that a couple <laughs> of years ago because he ran into that. He had We had been spear fishing in Hawaii, but he also had a bunch of halibut and stuff from Alaska. And he eats a ton of walleye, freshwater yeah. fish. And him and, and he got, and he said, I think what he's, I think he said something like um, he thought he had eaten about 20 meals in a row of like pecivorous fish yeah, and, and developed that. And it started with some dexterity, yeah, some like dexterity neuro stuff. And that, and yeah. And he had some, he had some, he'd call people and forget why he called them, but it, it went away pretty quick. But that's one of the, that, that's one of the earliest, like that's one of those areas where, you know, you've spent a whole career on water quality issues and, and spent a career defending fishermen and natural resources. That was one of the first, one of my first introductions to how uh, water quality issues impact people is growing up in the Great Lakes yeah. and um, becoming aware of the, the consumption advisories. And we ate tons of fish yeah. out of the Great Lakes. And uh, becoming aware of that, and then one of my childhood mentors and one of my dad's best friends going into uh, University of Michigan for these batteries of tests because he had been consuming freshwater fish his whole life, and he was part of some broad study of memory loss in people who'd consumed whatever threshold of Great Lakes fish. Yeah, and it which and, and that is funny because in that area, it's just not a thing people discuss. The, I lived in Seattle for a while, and we would fish Lake Washington, and there were people that people were there just kind of more aware, different time, whatever. And there would be people who um, wouldn't eat, you know, they wouldn't eat the fish that we were fixing for them because of concerns about um, 
you know, concerns about mercury in the water. And then it's been explained to me too that even though we've reduced how much mercury we're putting in the water, the shit never gets out of the system. Or it's very slow to get out of the system. It's slow to get out. I mean, it, it doesn't... There's no half-life on mercury. There's a half-life in your body, in your blood. There's a half-life of 64 days in your blood from, you know, the from methyl mercury, which is the kind of mercury in fish. But there was a... Uh, the National Academy of Sciences and the F FDA did a study in 2003, um, and they looked at every freshwater fish in North America. Every fish that they sampled had dangerous levels of mercury in its flesh, really? every single fish. Oh, uh, And, you know, of course, the predatory fish like walleye um, and, uh, and, you know, trout, like trout, those kind of fish that are eating that are high-end predators are... Uh, have um have just you know and have what they call bolus doses they're really you know just very very high doses and it occurred to me when that study came out that we're now living in the science fiction nightmare where my children and the children of every other american can now no longer engage in the seminal primal activity of american youth which is to go fishing with their father and mother in the local fishing hole and then come home and safely eat the fish and, uh, you know, that is, it's just, it's when you think of when I thought about it, that age, I was breathtaking. I see the same thing today with Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is, you know, I spend, I go, you know, I'm in the woods every day, right? And I'm, my whole life I've done that. I, you know, training hawks and stuff, you have to fly them every day. So I go, you know, I lived in Mount Kisco, New York, when the deer ticks began appearing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, you know, we now, the, the strongest evidence is that those, um, that that disease came from uh, Plum Island, from the military, you know, the USDA slash DOD, Department of Defense Bioweapons Labs on, on uh, Plum Island. And the story of how it actually got to the mainland is, you know, is another one of these incredible stories. But you had them developing a military weapon there and um, and then just poisoning everybody in America and ruining it. I, there, there's not a single falconer that I know that does not have Lyme disease, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't think of any. I remember coming coming home one day, standing in the bathtub and taking 29 deer ticks off of myself. And, you know, I'd, in the springtime, I'd get them every single day. And it's just, you know, the woods used to be, for me, were a safe place to go. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, you have to think twice before you go in the woods. My boy got, he contracted Lyme when he was three in Hudson Valley, New York. We were fishing yeah. bluegills. Um, so there you get, like, you know, like you said, you get the double, I guess you get the double hit of heavy metals and Lyme, fishing bluegills in Hudson. But... <laughs> He developed a facial paralysis. You know, I went through Lyme disease. Well, my years. son got that too. Did he? Yeah, yeah Bell's palsy. Yeah, yeah. For yeah, he six would... months, and we didn't know if he. And you look at your kid when he's got that, and you know he goes from a very handsome kid to not a very yeah. handsome kid, and he, you know, they have this, and you know, we didn't know every day whether he was ever going to recover from it. Yeah, he would sip milk. It was just kind of the thing that scarred us. Is a little bit, he would sip milk and it would run out in the corner yeah. of his mouth. And it was, it was so, that air, that was so scary. And I got, I got infected as well and had to do the intravenous treatment. But it was so, that period was so scary that my wife and I would put him to bed and we would routinely at night just cry. I mean, like, embarrassing to say it, but like, we would cry at night. How, how old was he? He was point? three. <laughs> Jeez. But he got he responded very quickly to treatment. Um, but man, it was it was it was a horrifying deal, you know. Yeah. Um, speaking of kids, there's a thing I wanted to ask you as well, and I didn't really re I didn't know this about you till yesterday. Uh, what was it? I didn't know that you went and met with and talked to the, um, met with and talked to the man that was involved in your father's death. In a pri in a in a yeah, prison. Yeah, sir. Had. What what like what was that meeting? I mean, what was well, that? You like know, for I you? 
I always listen. I always, from when I was a little kid, my uncle. The, uh, the story about his assassination was always strange to me. In fact, I was in the White House when my uncle, when I was in the White House with my uncle's casket in the East Room, and my whole family was in there, and I was, you know, a, a nine-year-old kid. And I, I remember President uh, Johnson coming in, and I was standing next to my Aunt Jackie and my mother and my dad, and President Johnson told them that um, that a man had just shot Lee Harvey Oswald. And I said to my mom, when you know, when the conversation uh, ended, I said to my mom, "Why did he shoot? You know, the man who killed Uncle Jack? Did he did he love our family? Because even then, my mind was like, you know, this is a bizarre story, mm-hmm. and uh, and <laughs> that story." You know, of course, um, it was never adequately explained. And um, Jack Ruby, the man who shot Lee Harvey Oswald, was a, an associate of the of the uh, of the Chicago outfit, which is Sam Giancana's mob. But he was directly associated with Carlos Marcello, who was involved in the Kennedy assassination, and who was, you know, he was one of the three. Big mob bosses. There were three mob bosses who were recruited recruited by the CIA to kill Castro, Santos Traficante at, in Tampa, Carlos Marcella in Dallas and New Orleans, and then Sam Giancana in Chicago. And the reason they targeted these three is they all had um, casinos in Havana. Mm-hmm. And so then the CIA basically became one organization with these, you know, with these mob families. And that there's so much evidence now on the you know the agency involvement in my uncle's death. There's hundreds of books written about it, and the you know there's millions of pages of evidence, and there's and probably over thirty confessions by people who are involved. So I always assume that my uncle was um, you know that his death and and Congress when they actually looked at it, you know that of course the Warren Commission was run by Alan Dulles, who's the head of the CIA. Who my uncle had fired, so they, you know, they said, "Yeah, it's just one shooter, Lee Harvey Oswald." But then, five years later, Congress reinvestigated, and the Congressional Committee, the House Select Committee on Assassination, said, "No, his death was from a conspiracy." So, and and that, you know, most Americans believe that, and the evidence is now overwhelming. But I always believe, I always believe that my father had been killed by Sirhan, and then. A man who, one of my dad's best friends, a guy called Paul Schrade, he was uh, a United Auto Workers uh, deputy director, and he had recruited Cesar Chavez to the labor movement. And he had introduced my father to Cesar Chavez, and that had become one of the most important political relationships and personal friendships that my father had. Paul Schrade was walking next to my father when my father was shot. And Paul and and they were walking into the kitchen at the Ambassador Hotel. Paul Schrade was walking beside him, about a foot behind him, and Sirhan and they were being led to the ambush site, to, to where Sirhan was standing in front of a, a steam table. Sirhan fired two shots at my father. And one of those shots hit Paul Schrade in the head. He said that he felt like he was being electrocuted. He didn't know what it was. He just felt like he had stepped on an electric wire and he was and he went down. And but he lived to be almost ninety years old. He died about two years ago. Um, and then the other shot that Sturhan fired at my father went past my father and hit a door jam, a wooden door jam behind him, and it was later removed. The bullet was later removed by the LAPD. Then Sir Ann was grabbed by five men, by, you know, Rosie Greer. Uh, uh, George Plimpton, the writer George Plimpton, too, was George Plimpton yeah. was on that dog pile. Um, Rafer Johnson, who was in 1960, the Catalan champion was very close to my father. It was kind of acting as my father's bodyguard. But back then, uh, the candidates did not get Secret Service protection until you got a nomination. So my father wasn't entitled to it. 
And J. Edgar Hoover had offered to protect him, but he knew J. Edgar Hoover would be spying on him, so he said no mm. thanks. And then the LAPD had a very bad reputation at that time for racism. And so they were, um, they were not... Uh, they were not part of it, so he was being protected essentially by football players, by the by the uh, um, by the fearsome force um, uh, guys from the Dallas Cowboys and from the Oakland Raiders, and they chased down, or they they immediately grabbed Sir Hand after the second shot, and they took his hand and they 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 bent him over the steam table on his back. And they took his gun hand and they pointed it in the opposite direction, away from my father. So, and Rafer Johnson later told me that he, you know, Rafer was a big guy. He's like six foot four and he had been the best athlete in the world. And he said he, he was, and Sirhan is this tiny, tiny little guy. But he said he had superhuman strength and that he could not get that gun out of his hand. Sirhan was able to, it was a revolver, 22 revolver. And there were eight shots in it. And Sirhan was able to squeeze off six more shots and empty the, you know, the, the barrel. Um, and, uh, and those shots all hit people. So one person, I think an ABC reporter got hit twice, once through his pants leg and another time in his stomach. But all those shots hit people. So we know what happened to every single shot in Sir Hans' gun, and he never had a chance to reload. My father was killed by four shots from behind. And the reason I know this is because Paul Schrade, 10 years ago, told me, you got to come to my house in Pasadena and read the autopsy report, which was Thomas Noguchi, the most important uh, coroner in American history, and he did the and so and I did. It's not something I wanted to do to read the autopsy report for my dad. But Paul Schrade, I couldn't really say no to him. He'd been shot with my dad. He was his loyal friend. So I sat down and read it. And if you read it, you're like, it's the inescapable conclusion is that Sir Han could not have killed my father, which is what Noguchi concluded. Noguchi, when he did the autopsy, he knew what had happened in Dallas where the autopsy was all, you know, the critique of that autopsy is, is notorious. So he wanted to make sure that he did a, an autopsy that nobody would ever criticize. So he called the chief coroners of all the five branches of the armed services and had them sitting in the theater observing him. And he, in the medical literature, his autopsy of my dad is called the perfect autopsy. And what he found is my father was shot four times from behind. And all of them, the, one of the shots passed harmlessly through the, the shoulder pad of his, of his suit jacket. The two of them hit him in the back. And then one of them was fired from directly behind his ear into his head. And... All of them were contact shots. Were all those twenty two? Those are all twenty two caliber. They're twenty two, but yeah. they but they but the bullets don't match. Hmm. And the and the police efforts to fix the ballistics are very well documented. The deception that they tried, you know, one uh, of the. Uh, the ballistics expert in the police department was was involved in a deception. So. Um, the, 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 and, and if you listen, the, there's two audio tapes of what happened that night and they, sh they show that there were 13 shots fired. There were 13 distinct booms on that. And all of the shots were contact shots, meaning that the, the barrel of the gun was either touching my father's skin or less than a half inch or quarter inch from the skin because they all left carbon tattoos on his body. Mm. And uh, and they, they were all fired at an upward angle. In other words, somebody was standing right behind him concealing a gun and holding it you know, against him, but slightly upward. And all of them were fired at that. And then the guy who almost certainly fired those shots was a a guy um, called Eugene Thane Cesar, 
who was a, he worked for a security agency called A Security, and he had gotten the job only two or three days before, after my father's schedule was already known. And he was the one who grabbed my father by the elbow and then walked him toward the ambush where Sirhan was waiting. And the supposition is that when Sirhan was firing those shots and all eyes were upon him, there were 77 people in the room, that he drew his gun and was actually firing the kill shots. And when my father fell, he fell backwards onto Cesar. But he must have known that he was being shot by, from behind because he twisted around and he grabbed Cesar's tie and it was a pull a clip on tie. And if you see the pictures of my father, the initial pictures of him lying on the ground, he has that clip on tie in his hand. Cesar got up, pushed my father off him, got up from under him with his gun vi visible. There's a dozen eyewitnesses that showed his gun was drawn, say his gun was drawn, which Cesar never denied. And the police asked him weeks later, why was your gun drawn? He changed his, his story many times. You know, he said he was firing at my father, I mean, firing at Sirhan, which of course he wasn't. And um, as it turns out, he, uh, there's a woman, an historian called Lisa Pease, who's done a deep dive on Cesar, and and his his employer was um, was uh, Hughes Aircraft, which is a defense contractor, you know, which was owned by Howard Hughes, who was deeply involved with the with the Las Vegas mob, and um, and then Boeing or Lockheed. He worked at the Lockheed plant in L.A. And he had top secret clearance, and he identifies himself as a CIA employee. So, and he openly hated my father. He thought that my father was going to turn the country over to black people, which he complained about a lot. Mm. So, um, he died. I actually tried to interview him. I, I, I tried to go meet with him. He left the country after that. And he went to live in the Philippines, and I contacted him and said, you know, would you be willing to sit down and talk to me? And he initially said, I'll do it for $10,000, and then he raised it to, when I said, okay, he said 15000 And then when I was, you know, planning my trip, he said 25000 I I realized that he was, um, that th this was an endless game that he was going to play. Mm-hmm. And um, and then he died during the pandemic. Did he? Yeah. I mean, I don't know why he died. I, you know, I, I don't mean to imply that he died of no, COVID, but he died during the uh, lockdowns. When you, we can move on after the after this. Just one clarification: when you went, went, when I you met to, Sirhan, how to, how long did you talk to him for? I was there probably about four hours. Was he? What was what was his attitude toward you? He was deeply, deeply grateful. He cried. He apologized to me for. He, he does. He now no longer believes that he killed my father. Uh, he has no memory of that night. Um, his history is very interesting because he was working at a racetrack uh, that was owned by one of the top mobsters in L.A., Mickey Cohen. And Johnny Roselli, and you know the, the the story is, his lawyer was Johnny Roselli's attorney, who suddenly appeared the night he killed my father and said, "I'm representing him." And he was the one who persuaded, who would not look at the ballistics evidence, and then persuaded Sirhan to plead guilty. Sirhan um, is when they were, when he was working at that, they they got him to go on a horse one time, which is crazy. He'd never been on a horse, and they asked him to. They put him he's, on a, he's like five feet tall, right? Yeah. He's tiny. Yeah, 130 pounds or something. Yeah, yeah. he's tiny guy, and he's. He, I mean, if you if you see him, he's just a very sweet old man, and he just kept he kept crying, hmm. telling me every time I saw a picture of your mother and with all of you kids, and you know, I realized my part in in um in in the death of her husband. Uh, it, you know, broke my heart. So he just, you know, he was, uh, I feel like he was being honest with me. I feel like he doesn't really have any guile. 
you know, he's, uh, he kind of, he, by then I think he was almost 80 years old, 77 or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, he, uh, and he's been in, in prison for 60 years. Oh, in the story of, you know, of, um, his story is interesting, but I, you know, I know we got other things to talk about, uh, but <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it, how, how he, uh, you know, his road is a really interesting road. Uh -oh. Yeah, it is. But I just couldn't, when, when I was reading about that, I just couldn't picture from your perspective what it'd be like to sit across the room with someone who had, whatever happened that night was there with the intention yeah, he of was killing your father and you were, the, the, the desire to reach across and strangle that guy you know, would be strong for me. <laughs> you know, you, uh, you've done all kinds of first descents. Like you're, you, you became a, you're like, you're a whitewater enthusiast. Yeah. Did you, and then you've worked, like I said, you worked on behalf of fishermen against polluters who are polluting waterways, destroying fisheries. Were you, did you come into that love of water through environmental work or did you come into that love of water through outdoor experience no, outdoors okay. I, I was when i was a kid i think i was probably adhd uh -huh. so i would go into a classroom and I, I it was like they were talking a different language i went to school for the fir first grade at five years old i'd never been in nursery school and uh, i just i didn't know what they were you know i had no clue i was like non compus mentis and all I was doing was thinking of the woods, how I was going to get, you know, what what I was going to do after school. I was going to go in the woods. I, I was going to check my traps. I was going to, you know, turn over rocks, climb trees, take out baby crow, all this kind of stuff that I was doing, catching snakes. I had, my room was filled with aquariums with animals that I caught. Um, and uh, from when I was little, that's what I wanted to do. So, and then my father, you know, was uh, brought us, taught us how to kayak, how to ask him a roll when we were very, very young kids. We went on all the big western whitewater rivers at a time. When, you know, that's pretty common now. But I think we were told that we were among the first two or, the, two or three hundred people to go down the Colorado River. We went with Hatch Brothers Expeditions, which was the first whitewater company. And we did the Colorado, we did the little Colorado, we did the middle fork of the salmon. My dad took us on the Yampa, the like green. Like big multi-day trips. Yeah, yeah, week-long trips. Camping on gravel bars. And, yeah. Huh. Um, we did the salmon, the snake. Did you really? Oh. The Upper Hudson, uh, which we, we did. I did the Upper Hudson with my dad in March during a blizzard. And that was the coldest up to that time that I'd ever been in my life. And we swam, you know, there was ice in the river. Uh, and my brother and I tipped our, we had a, a Topo Duo kayak and we tipped it over and, you know, uh, and it's when it was really cold. And um, so, you know, I he got us into that whitewater from when we were really young. And then we did a lot of backcountry skiing. We were, my dad really loved the wilderness. And I, and then I started training hawks. I was raising homing pigeons from when I was seven years old. And I was like a serious uh, hobby or sport where I, you know, where I lived. And then when I was nine, I got my first hawk. I got a red tail hawk. And then I, I had read a book. Um, you know, my uncle was president and there was books around about Camelot. Mm. And, and there was a book uh, by T. H. White called "The Once and Future King," and I read it. T. H. White was a you know brilliant author, but he was also a falconer, and he was a British falconer. And he has a chapter, and the, the Once and Future King is about the young King Arthur. It was a chapter in it about Arthur um, apprenticing as a falconer when he was a little boy, and I read that, and I said, oh, "This is what I got to do." And I told my dad, my dad knew of a falconer who lived about a mile from my house. He was a guy called Alvin I, who was one of the pioneers of American falconry. And he had been an all-American football player at Penn State. He had then gone to work designing jets for the Pentagon. 
But the State Department knew about him because whenever there was visiting Arab dignitaries, they'd always send him over oh. to go to fly birds with them because yeah. the Arabs are crazy sure, for falconry. Yeah, yeah. And so my dad knew about him, and my dad took me over there, and then I apprenticed under him, and I, you know, I became a master falconer at a young age. I actually wrote the exam that people take. Seriously? Uh, uh, yeah. To become, become what, what was falconers. your first bird that you had? My first was a red tail hawk, but I'll tell you what I got. I got, I think, probably one of the first Harris hawks that anybody ever trained. Now, Harris hawk is now the preferred hawk globally for ground quarry. Uh -huh. If you, the, you, if you train hawks, which is what I actually prefer, you're taking ground quarry or, or you, you know, they can catch a pheasant on the rise or, you know, occasionally, um, uh, occasionally if they're really lucky, a duck on the rise, but they could never catch it in a tail chain. Duck flies 90 miles an hour, right? They, they, they can't, nothing can take take it in a tail chase. Like once that thing's off the water, he's no, gone. Once they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're like a bullet. Yeah. Once they... Once they get off the water, and they usually won't get off the water if there's a hawk in the air. So you have to have a dog, and it has to be a very small pond, like a golf course mm -hmm. or something. And um, but I, 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 but Harris hawks are now the preferred. The people who train hawks are called law stringers, and the preferred bird for them nowadays in every country in the world are Harris hawks because they're the only hawk that fly that hunts communally and in fact when Audubon first saw them in the desert southwest and he named them after his friend who is uh, you know an ornithologist named Harris he assumed they were carrion eaters because there, there's no other predatory bird that eats in packs I didn't, right? I didn't know this yeah. about Harris hawks and, and, and so he'd see six of them down on a quarry like a jackrabbit or something, yeah. and he assumed they were, you know, carrying. So they just look like a bunch of vultures on there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that, but now, you know, we know they actually hunt in packs like wolves, and because they're communal, they are, they're very, very good companions for human beings. They understand the relationship between the human and the dog, and the, you know, the whole interaction is comes very naturally to them because they understand the dynamics of hunting in a pack mm -hmm. and hunting and hunting cooperatively and with kind of communicated strategies to each other. So if you see that if you're hunting squirrels, you'll see them ladder up. One will ladder up from the bottom up, you know, up the uh, up the branches and the other one will ladder down and squeeze the squirrel. They can't catch the squirrel on it when it's on the tree because they don't have a tight enough turning radius. And the, the squirrel will hug the bark, look behind him, and keep an eye on where the hawk is. And right before the hawk hits him, he'll go to the other side of the bark, of uh, the other side of the tree. And the hawk can't, there's no hawk that has that kind of turning radius. So they can dodge hawks all day just by staying on that trunk. So for, for a hawk to catch the squirrel, it has to get it off the trunk and onto a branch. And so that's what they'll do. You'll see them do it. And also the Harris hawks are so smart. Like I've hunted red tail hawks my whole life. And if a red tail hawk sees a squirrel go into a squirrel dray, right? The nest. Mm -hmm. What do you um, call them? Trays? A dray. It's oh, a dray. A dray. Yeah, okay. Sorry, a yeah, squirrel dray. Yeah, yeah. So if he sees them go into the dray for the red tail hawk, which has been here for, you know, at least since the place has seen ice ages, probably, probably a million years before that. But that squirrel in the, in the mind of the red tail hawk, that squirrel just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of it. But a Harris hawk, if he ever sees a squirrel go into a squirrel dray, he knows that that animal is still in there. And highly vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll go jump on the top of it like a like a trampoline to try to get it to come out. And then from then on, anytime he sees a squirrel dray, He'll go jump on it to see if there's a squirrel kidding, in yeah, it. Yeah. So they're very, they're very enjoyable. But I, I got one in a pet store when I was a kid, at a pet store in Southeast Washington, and and I, I brought him home, and he got it, he got it untethered, and I had a pheasant run, and I had some exotic pheasants in there, like golden pheasants, so silver pheasants, those kind of things, and the pheasants would eat all the grass inside the run. And they'd stick their head out of it. I had turkey wire, which is about the diameter of a pheasant's head. Mm -hmm. So they could squeeze their head through that turkey wire to get the tall grass 
that you couldn't get with the mower that was, you know, tied up against the side of the pheasant run. They'd eat that, that deep green grass and they'd stick their head through there to get it. But because it was a tight fit, they couldn't pull their head right out immediately. They had to kind of, you know, work it Finagle out. Finagle it backward, yeah. And that Harris hawk went to the, and, and sat in a tree above that pheasant run. And one at a time, he took the head off of every one of my pheasants. And I came home from school, and all my pheasants were dead in the pheasant run. And I realized what had happened, and I was like, I got to catch that hawk and train it because this is like a really smart bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you catch something like that? I mean, it used to, it probably wasn't that regulated then. It was, it, no, in fact, when I, until 1972, um, hawks, raptors were vermin species in 21 states. Mm. So the, um, and they paid bounties on them. Yeah. And they, you know, if there were annual hawk shoots that were, uh, that were sponsored by the Audubon Society, uh, up on the, people would go up on the By radio. the Audubon Society. Yeah, because oh, they thought they were yeah. killing songbirds. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And people didn't understand ecology at that point. They just thought, okay, hawks are the enemies mm. of farm, you know, of chickens. Uh, so exterminating them is a good thing. And they didn't realize the hawks were also controlling the rodents and controlling, you know, uh, they just didn't understand the kind of the the, the, the complexity sure. yeah. of ecosystems. And they still don't, by the way, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be using so many pesticides. But um, yeah, the, the Audubon Society and the game, uh, clubs and uh, hunting clubs, the, uh, the 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 conservation apartments would sponsor these hawk shoots every year, so we could go out and just trap hawks and and fly them. And then the eastern peregrine went extinct in 1963, and people started worrying about them then. And by, in 1972, they passed. Um, the Migratory Birds Treaty Act. Well, the, the helmet, I didn't realize this. The, the peregrines that are in the East now, there was an Eastern... There was an Eastern... Like it was called the Eastern, Anato an Eastern Anatomist Peregrine. It was oh. the most... That one extinct, extinct. That one extinct. Oh, and so, so uh, peregrines that have repopulated have come from different regions. You know what? If they're mainly... There were some peregrines in captivity. Mm. And we learned around 1969, we learned to, to breed them. And before that, they had never been bred in captivity. And so, and then, you know, falconers were the only ones breeding them. And there was a guy called Heinz Meng, who was one of my mentors, who was the first scientist to breed a, a raptor in captivity. And then we figured out how to double clutch them, which is you get the bird to lay a clutch of eggs, three eggs, Take that away from them. She'll she'll recycle lay three more. Take those away, and she'll recycle a third time. And then so you have nine eggs from the same bird every year, and you can then incubate those, and you can get the mother to raise them because you're you're you know yeah. handling handing her unlimited food so she can take care of nine offspring. And um and we started mass producing them, and then releasing them to the wild. So the Peregrines that you see now on the East Coast are they're a little bit hybridized from some of the other subspecies, but yep. you know there are still there's a lot of them are you know purebred Eastern Adams um, that were bred in captivity and then released. If uh, walk through how you got how you transitioned into um, environmental law and focused on the Hudson and then focused on a widening bunch of rivers and then became aligned with fishermen and fisheries restoration. Yeah. So I, I got, I was a heroin addict for 14 years. I got sober in 1983 and then I rethought my life and I, I had gone into the DA's office and I kind of had this, uh, you know, life that was almost try, kind of trying to follow my father's footsteps. I had gone to the same law school, the same college. I had gone into prosecution the way that he did, and I, I realized that that was not authentic for me. That I really belonged doing something in the woods and in the waterways, and you know that that's where I was happy and that's what I wanted to do with my life. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a scientist or a vet, or to do you know something like a field biologist, mm -hmm. somebody, somebody who was outside all the time. 
And um, so I just I I decided to take you know my legal education and meld it with you know in some way with doing environmental environmental protection environmental advocacy and I ended up working for <clears throat> a a blue collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen on the Hudson River and who were trying to reclaim the Hudson from its polluters. We have on the Hudson the oldest commercial fishery in North America. It's 350 years old. Many of the people that I represent come from families that have been fishing the river continuously since Dutch colonial times. It's a traditional gear fishery. So they use the same fishing methods that were taught by the Algonquin Indians to the original Dutch settlers of New Amsterdam and then passed down through the generations. And one of the enclaves of the commercial fishery is a little village called Crotonville, New York. Oh, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, yeah it is 30 miles north of New York City on the east bank of the river. And the people who lived there in 1966 were not your kind of prototypical affluent environmentalists. They were factory workers, carpenters, lathers, electricians. Half the people in Grotenville made their living, or at least some part of their living, fishing or crabbing the river. You have a big, beautiful picture of a, of a basket of blue crabs here. Chesapeake Bay right yeah, there. Yeah, Chesapeake Bay. But we have the same fishery in the Hudson, you know, the... the uh, the blue crabs come up the Hudson as well. We have a lot. The anadromous fish come up the Hudson, include shad. The stur historic sturgeon run. Sturgeon, yeah. We, we, have, sturgeon, we, have, yeah. Uh, we have sturgeon in the river that are uh, 12 feet long, 200 pounds of caviar in them. It's a very, very big fishery, a very lucrative fishery for a lot of people, striped bass. Yeah. And then the smaller fisheries, herring, alewives, uh, blue crab, um, there's a little bit of shrimp in the river, there, and 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 then there's some odd odd fisheries like shrimp and goldfish, you know, and and there's carp. There used to be a big carp fishery for gefilte fish, mm. the Jewish population during no. certain Jewish holidays. It's a it's a popular fish. So um, we have a mixture of freshwater fish, saltwater fish, and anadromous fish. Anadromous fish, of course, is the fish that that evolved in fresh water, but they figured out how to go to the salt water to feed themselves and fatten, and they, they, but their eggs will not survive in salt water. They have to come back up into the fresh water, their natal stream to spawn because the, the eggs would die if they were in salt water. And so, and those are called anadromous fish, and there are also catadromous fish in the Hudson. Those are the fish. The American fish. eel. American eel, of course, that, and they have the oddest life cycle because they go out to the middle of the North Atlantic to the Sargasso Sea, and they meet their European cousins there, and then they they breed and they all go back to their natal streams. And um, you know, of course, an eel can breathe air as well as water. So they that's why you find them in ponds when there's rainy weather. They go across the landscapes, you know, at night during the rain and get in isolated ponds and places. Um, the incidentally, carp can also breed air, and catfish can. You know, the bullheads can. If you if you ever if you leave a bullhead or a catfish in two inches of water and or four inches of water in the bottom of your of your you know bait bucket, it will it will drown. It will die, asphyxiate, because it'll use up the oxygen. But if you leave it and if you just take all the water out and throw it in there, it will live because it can breathe air. Gulp, yeah. Yeah, it's like, like a lot of carp can do that too. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's a real serious digression. I went um, in 1966, Penn Central Railroad began vomiting oil from a four and a half foot pipe in the Croton Harmon Rail Yard. And the oil went up the river on the tides and it blackened the beaches and it made the shad taste of diesel. So the fishermen couldn't sell them in New York City at the Fulton Fish Market. And all of the people in Grotenville came together in the only public building in the town, which was the American Legion Hall. The, the, hmm. the, uh, this was a very patriotic community. Uh, most of yeah, the, it's, it speaks to the the blue collar nature of what yeah. you're talking about. That 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 form of like blue collar environmentalism. Right? Exactly, yeah, yeah, and working the, class. Almost all the original f members and founders and board members of Riverkeeper were former Marines. They were combat veterans from World War II, mainly from Korea, also some from Vietnam. And they came back to the river, you know, to fish again, and they found it was so polluted. 
They came together that night in March of 1966, and there were 300 people in the Parker Bale American Legion all leaning against the rifle racks, hanging from the rafters, men and women, furious about what was being stolen from them because to them, the, you know, the Hudson was everything. It was their, it was their, not just their recreation, it was their livelihoods, it was their property values, it was was their backyard, and it was being stolen from them by these large corporate entities over whom they had no control. And they had been to the government agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from pollution, to the Corps of Engineers, the State Conservation Department, and the Coast Guard, and they were given the bums rush. The, the Richie Garrett, who was the first president of the of what was then called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association, later became Riverkeeper, he was a grave digger from Austin, New York, and he was a combat veteran from Korea. Really? Yeah, and he um, he used to say about he used to say to his new followers, "I'll be the last to let you down," you know, because he was a grave digger. But he was also <laughs> he was <laughs> he 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 went with another <laughs> another marine named Art Glauco, who was a, at that point an Eastern Airlines pilot. He went to. Um, to the Corps of Engineers a dozen times, begging the Corps Colonel to do his job and shut down the Penn Central Pipe. And the Corps Colonel finally told them in exasperation, these are important people. We can't treat them that way. Speaking of the Penn Central Board of Directors, oh, by this evening in March of 1966, virtually everybody in Cronenville had come to the conclusion that government was in cahoots with the polluters. And the only way they were going to reclaim the river for themselves as if they confronted the polluters directly. Somebody suggested that they put a match to the oil slick coming out of the Penn Central pipe and burn up the pipe. Somebody else said they should roll a mattress up and jam it up the pipe and flood the rail yard with its own waste. And then uh, somebody else said they should float a raft of dynamite into the intake of the Indian Point power plant, which at that time was <laughs> killing a million fish a day on its intake screens and taking food off their family tables. And a guy stood up whose name was Bob Boyle, and he was a famous fly fisherman and spin fisherman. He'd written dozens of book books on fly. He had a bunch of flies named after him. He, um, he was the outdoor editor of Sports Illustrated for 60, 65 years. He, he was a combat veteran from Vietnam. He actually was at, uh, at, uh, in, when, at the training camp he was the roommate of Robert Bork the, the mm -hmm. you know the the uh, the federal judge um and but he had been he was a first lieutenant at 80 percent mortality in Korea and he had come back from Korea and he wrote about sports mainly outdoor sports for for sports illustrated for 65 years two years earlier he had written an article about angling in the Hudson there's some real oddballs who fish in the Hudson. There's these sewer fishing clubs in Manhattan, you know, that fish through the grates. And he was writing about all this, these weird sort of cultures of people who found, you know, wilderness experience in the Hudson, you know, walked off a of pavement in New York and mm -hmm. were renewing themselves spiritually and in all these other ways through this contact with the water. And it was a beautiful article. And in researching that article, he came across an ancient navigational statute called the 1888 Rivers and Harbors Act. That statute said it was illegal to pollute any waterway in the United States. You had to pay a big penalty if you got caught. But also there was a bounty provision that said that anybody who turned in the polluter got to keep half the fine. And Boyle was stunned when he read this, and he sent a copy of it out to the libel lawyers at Time Magazine, Time Inc., which owns Sports Illustrated. Yeah. And he knew those guys. They were the only lawyers he knew. And he said, is this still good law? And they sent him a memo back saying, it's still good law, but in 80 years, it's never been enforced. And that evening, when all these men and women were talking about violence, he stood up in front of them with a copy of that memo, and he said, we shouldn't be talking about breaking the law. We should be talking about enforcing it. And they resolved that night they were going to start a group that was then called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association, later became Riverkeeper. And they were going to go out and track down and prosecute every polluter on the Hudson. Eighteen months later, they shut down the Penn Central Pipe. They collected the first bounty in United States history against a corporate polluter. They got to keep $2,000, which was 
a huge amount of money in Crotonville, New York in 1968. There were two weeks of wild celebration in the town, and they used the money that was left over to go after Seba Geige, Tuck Tape, Standard Brand, American Cyanamid, the biggest corporations in the country, and winning, collecting tens of thousands of dollars in bounties. And then in 1973, they collected the highest penalty in the United States history against a corporate polluter. They got $200,000 from Anaconda Wire and Cable for dumping toxics at Hastings, New York. Hmm. They used that money to build a boat, which they called the Riverkeeper. And they began patrolling the Hudson, tracking down polluters and, and litigating against them. And then they hired, using bounty money in 1983, they hired their first full-time Riverkeeper, a commercial fisherman named John Cronin. And he hired me a year, year later using bounty money as the first uh, attorney and a full-time attorney for them. And I, you know, I started a clinic at a local law school called Pace where my students were allowed to practice law under my supervision. I got a special court order and, you know, we just started litigating against hundreds of polluters. We brought over 500 lawsuits against Hudson River polluters. We forced polluters to spend five and a half billion dollars remediating the Hudson. Today, the Hudson River is an international model for ecosystem protection. This is a river when, you know, when I started working on it, it was dead water for 20 mile stretches, zero dissolved oxygen from New York City north and 20 miles from New York City south. I mean, from Albany south, um, it was dead water. No oxygen, you know, essentially no oxygen breathing life. And um, it caught fire. It turned color every week, depending on what colors they were painting the trucks at the GM plant in Terrytown. And today, the Hudson is the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway um, in the, the Atlantic Ocean north of the equator on both sides of the Atlantic. Hmm. It's the last major river system left on both sides of the Atlantic, and I'll throw in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, the Marmarin Sea. All these other waterways, there's only one river left that still has strong spawning stocks of all of its historical species of migratory fish, and that's the Hudson. It's Noah's Ark. It's a species warehouse. It's the last refuge for many of these animals that are going extinct elsewhere. The miraculous resurrection of the Hudson inspired the creation of river keepers elsewhere. So we had a bunch of commercial fishermen come down uh, and ask me to sue the, you know, all of the sewer plants in Connecticut that, that were destroying the oyster fisheries. And I sued every city. I sued Greenwich, Norwalk, uh, Branford, Stanford, um, and uh, all the way up down north, uh, all the way up and down, the, uh, you know, the rail line. I sued every city on the coast of Connecticut, and we started collecting hundreds of thousands of dollars from them. We started Long Island Soundkeeper, the commercial fishermen there. We had the surfers coming from the West Coast, you know, with the same thing. And and uh, within a few years, we had a couple of hundred river keepers. We started a, a new group called Waterkeeper Alliance to manage the licensing of these new groups to make sure we could protect the brand. And today we have 500 water. We're the biggest water protection group in the world. We have 500 water keepers from 46 countries, and uh, and you know there there it's a law enforcement group. Most countries have laws that forbid water pollution. The water belongs to people. It doesn't belong to the government. It doesn't not belong to you know corporations or big ag or you know the mining companies. It belongs to the people. Everybody has a right to use it. Nobody can use it in a way that diminishes or injures its use and enjoyment by others. This is an ancient law. It goes back to Roman times. It's in the Code of Justinian. It's in the Magna Carta, and it's in the laws of most countries. The problem is those laws are almost never enforced. And what we do, the function we serve and waterkeeper is, you know, is to enforce those laws on behalf of, of people who are injured by pollution. When, when you look at if if you were in the White House and you looked at, let's start with, um, we can start with priorities for EPA. Um, if you have opinions on what you do around Interior Department, priorities for the Interior Department, 
who you'd like to see as Secretary of Interior. How, how'd you like that job? <laughs> Would you seriously? Would you take? Would you look at taking a job? Like no, that? I would. I would. I would love to take it. I have some people I would consult with. And I was telling the other day, if I ever got into politics, I would do. And I, I heard you do it earlier. Um, I would first make a list of every bad thing I ever did, <laughs> and make it a Google Drive doc and hit share with the country. <laughs> And then I would yeah, that's it. what I did. I, know, I, heard I, you I couldn't earlier. remember. I, I was addicted to heroin for 14 years. Like, oh, no one's going to dig that up. <laughs> I said when I announced, I said, you know, I said I didn't expect to run for president, and I, um, and if I did, I would have lived a very, very different life. <laughs> I, I led a you know very reckless life, and you know, high risk. I'm a high risk individual, and. Um, I said I have. I told Cheryl. I said I've got, I've got, I've got so many skeletons in my closet that if they could vote, I could get elected king of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what would you? Uh, which one of those you want? Which one of those you want to start with? If you're gonna look at like what, what would you? What would be a set of priorities for you with? the EPA or what would be a set of priorities well, here's with what, Interior you know, or, or it, any it, of these look, areas? I, I, have, I have been working on environmental issues for 40 years. Yeah, right? yeah. And I found out from the, from the beginning that uh, you need to be able to talk to people. I, you know, my whole thing was bringing hundred, hundreds of fish hook and bullet people into the environmental movement who were left out. Because in the 80s when I was doing this, the hook and bullet people felt that you know, they felt alienated from, you know, from the mainstream environmentalists. They felt they didn't, you know, there was a lot of antagonism. There was a lot of antagonism over public lands issues in the mm -hmm. West and, you know, whether, you, you know, public land should be managed exclusively for game or should they be managed for hunting and fishing and, you know, and these were all or farming or, or ranching. These were all areas of conflicts. And then there was, you know, you know a lot of, environmentalists were kind of liberal and, you know, and and maybe leaned a little bit towards anti-gun. And so you had that conflict. You had those, those areas of antagonism. I think that that's why you wound up, these words have their own etymology um, and their own use case, but I think that's why you wound up eventually with people who would identify as environmentalists and you have people that would identify as a conservationist. Yeah. Right. So the, the, there's like, yeah, you, you're within each of these, whether you describe yourself as one or the other, I often describe myself as a conservationist. Um, there is a, I don't know, a 80 percent overlap. Right. Between those views. You know, but yeah, they just, maybe 80 percent. Yeah, they they just they just but yeah. became comfortable with different terms, even though they're largely talking about the yeah. same things. You know? Yeah. But it's, I think it's it's that to avoid. But I mean, that. you know, like Ducks Unlimited did not consider itself part of the environmental movement at all, mm -hmm. right? And they should have. And oh. that, you well, know, if you, they are a leader of the environmental. Of movement, course, you know? <laughs> of course. But they weren't talking to you know, um, you know, to NRDC and to EDF yeah. and to Sierra Club. They were not. It, it was. It's very. It was very. And what I wanted. They, were, they to weren't do, litigating as much, right? Either. So. They, they were less litigious, but they were just. Uh, I don't know why, but it. You know, there was. It, they didn't. They they felt alienated, and a lot of my kind of mission was to bring that those groups in. And I um. I I started. You know. I, I always tried to talk in a way that w was inclusive of those groups. And today, you know, if you want to, I think one of the big mistakes the environmental movement has made, the biggest mistake is to become the kind of carbon fundamentalists and mm -hmm. to forget about the issues that made us all environmentalists, which is, you know, saving the oceans and and saving the soils and saving habitat and keeping our kids safe from toxins and if you talk about climate today, you're gonna you're gonna cause a fist fight mm -hmm. and because you know the and with good reason one is because it, it's a um, it's an issue you know and I found this with the fishermen very early on they didn't really want to talk about it because. If you're being asked to give up something 
because of a line that somebody shows you on a graph that says you're going to be dead a year and they're asking you to give up income, you know, that's going to help your family, you're going to push back against that. But if you ask somebody to make a sacrifice to keep toxins out of their food, to keep their water clean so there's no mercury in the fish, they will pay anything to do that. Mm. And, you know, when we when we were fighting the, the lead contamination in the water in Flint, Michigan, we had Hells Angels standing shoulder to shoulder with urban blacks. When we went to, you know, at Standing Rock, we had business people, Republicans, union people, Democrats, every kind of person was at Standing Rock for the, the Keystone Pipeline because we didn't market it as a climate issue. We marked it as protecting sacred places and, you know, Purple Mountain's majesties. And, and Americans will do anything to protect their sacred places. You know, I've been fighting the coal industry for 40 years, but I don't f focus on climate. I focus on things that are tangible to, to people. I focus on, the, you know, the destruction of the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachians are the richest ecosystem, terrestrial ecosystem in North America. And, and the reason for that is during the Pleistocene Ice Age, when there were two and a half miles of ice over where my house was in Mount Kisco, New York, um, the forest disappeared. America, North American continent turned into a tundra. And the forest disappeared almost altogether, except in a, a couple of tiny refugiums. And the biggest one of those was Appalachia. So, and then when the ice melted and withdrew, all of North America was reseeded from the Appalachian Mountains. So that's why, you know, if you go up to a forest in, you know, in upstate New York or the Hudson Valley or New England, there's typically three dominant species. But in Appalachia, there's 86 dominant species. Mm, yeah. So, you know, the diversity is extraordinary. We're exploding, I think, 2,800 tons of ammonia nitrate explosives a, a week. It's the equivalent of a Hiroshima bomb once a week by big, these big companies, Peabody, Consul, Massey Coal. They're blowing the tops off the mountains to get at the coal seams beneath. There's, um, they've leveled 1.4 million acres. It's bigger than the state of Delaware. If you drive in West Virginia today, you drive on a, a road, and you'll see these beautiful mountainsides on each, either side. But if you fly over it in a helicopter, they, they're just Hollywood sets. Behind them, there's just 100 square miles of devastation. It looks like an open quarry. And they can never refill them. They can never rebuild them. And if Americans knew what was happening, there would be a revolution about it. Because people don't want to see that these are the landscapes where... You know, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett came out of bluegrass music, came out of a nest, our racing, so much of our culture is tied up in the in this Purple Mountains majesty. They're, we've they filled twenty two hundred miles of rivers and streams with mining tailings and you know, destroyed the water, destroyed the fisheries, destroyed the you know, the health of the population. It's the sickest uh, sickest people in our country. And and you don't need to ever talk about climate. Talk, you know, you talk about acid rain. Acid rain has destroyed the forest cover on the Appalachians from Georgia to northern Quebec. Uh, you know, I grew up in the Adirondacks, which is the oldest protected wilderness on earth. It's, 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 it was protected since 1880s. Lincoln protected it. Or, you know, since the 1880s, it's been protected. And um, I, I, I'm thinking of Yosemite with Lincoln, but the Adirondack since 1880s, when, you know, when Roosevelt was governor, it got protected. And we had an expectation, a right to believe that the Appalachian Mountains would be unspoiled forever. It's, it's called Forever Wild. That's the act. And I, you know, I grew up believing my children that their children, their children would be able to enjoy it. But today, 20% of the lakes in the Adirondacks is sterilized from acid rain. Mm. And nobody wants that, right? And, and you know, we're losing the oyster fisheries in Washington, where you've lived, and Oregon, um, because the, the oceans are now becoming so acidic that the bivalves, like oysters, can't mobilize calcium out of the water column to build their shells. And this is, this is terrifying. And, uh, and then... We have mercury and all the fish in our country, and nobody wants that. And that 
So if you all you're going to talk about is carbon and then, you know, we just went through COVID, a lot of Americans, and they saw how totalitarian elements within our society, kind of elites, use these crises to clamp down totalitarian, top down totalitarian controls and to uh, and to shift wealth upward. And, you know, the same thing is happening with climate, you know, and I see it with, you know, even with with what Biden's done in the Inflation Reduction Act, which is his big climate act, that the money is going to carbon capture projects, hundreds of billions of dollars, which are just a scam. It's a boondoggle for the oil industry, for the methane industry. And then to offshore wind farms, which are producing energy at five times the cost of onshore wind farms. And they were exterminating the whales and the marine mammals that, you know, we all, we were drawn to the environmental movement out of love, not out of fear, out of love for these creatures. And, you know, and we're now sacrificing those on the altar of carbon fundamentalism. And the real way to deal with the carbon is to, is to, is to deal with soils, is to restore our soils. Because we got an, if we do regenerative agriculture across this country, we, we absorb 100% of our carbon budget. That's what we ought to be focusing on. And so I'm not, you know, I think climate change is existential. I think it's linked to carbon. Um, but I, you know, I don't insist you believe that. And I think the approach should be more towards re habitat protection, reducing toxics, restoring our soils, and then using markets to, to regulate our, um, you know, uh, using markets to regulate energy use. So instead of top-down controls, we get rid of the subsidies. We're giving $5.2 trillion in subsidies to carbon every year. We should get rid of, we should get rid of all subsidies to, you know, to mature industries and and then let pe let you know let the um let different energy sources generation sources compete in the marketplace and we'll get the cheapest energy and we'll get the most environmentally uh um sound energy policy if people think free market capitalism capitalism is the enemy of the environment it's not and it, we don't have free market capitalism. We have corporate crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. We have capitalism for the rich and this very kind of, or socialism for the rich and this very brutal kind of barbaric capitalism for the poor. In a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. A true free market would promote efficiency and efficiency means the elimination of waste and pollution is waste. In a true free market, we would be required to properly value our natural resources, and it's the undervaluation of those resources that causes us to use them wastefully. And like I said, in a true free market, if you want to make yourself rich, you're going to make your neighbors rich too and your community rich. What polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for everybody else, and they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay its production costs. That's what all pollution is. It's always somebody who's getting a subsidy. You know, when General Electric dumped its PCBs into the Hudson, it was escaping the discipline of the market. The market, a, a true free market, every actor in the marketplace should pay 100% of the cost of bringing his product to market. And that includes the cost of cleaning up your mess, mm -hmm. which was a lesson we were all supposed to have learned in kindergarten. What polluters do is they figure out a way to externalize those costs and get the public to sh shoulder their costs. So General Electric dumped its PCBs in the river. It, it, you know, when the state of New York said, we, we don't want you to do that anymore, the GE said to the governor, Governor Kerry and Governor Rockefeller, if you don't let us do, do that, we're going to move our plant to New Jersey. They'll get the taxes, they'll get the employment, and you're still going to get the pollution because we're going to do it from that side of the river. And so they caved into them. And then, you know, 20 years later, General Electric left the Hudson Valley, left New York. They don't have a single employee left in New York. They're not paying any tax revenues. They left behind a $4.5 billion cleanup 
problem that nobody in the Hudson, nobody can afford to pay, clean up. And, you know, everybody in the Hudson Valley has General Electric's PCBs in our flesh and our organs. They put out of business all of my clients. You know, when, when I started, we had a 2,500 fishing families in the river. Today, there's one left, you know, and the, the Hudson, the abundance of the Hudson has never been more better. But you can't eat the fish because they got PCBs in them. And, you know, so they stole those fish from us. We paid to clean up the river. And General Electric privatized the Hudson. It now, you know, the, the Constitution of New York says the people that stayed on the Hudson, they own all the fish in the Hudson, but we don't own them anymore. The General Electric Company owns them because mm -hmm. they privatized them. And that's what all pollution is. It's somebody making a grab to privatize part of the commons, you know, part of the commonwealth, part of the public trust, and privatize it. And, and that's a subsidy. I want to get rid of the subsidies. And that, if you talk about pollution that way, everybody nods their head. You know, if you... Oh, yeah, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, 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 it frames it in a way, like you said earlier, it frames it in a way, it, it frames environmentalism in a way where people understand um, the implication for the battle for rural people, the implication in the battle for, you know, people that live closer to the land. Rather than viewing it as some mechanism that is desirous to end their way of life, right? Or the elites than, grabbing control yeah. of your your freedoms and your property, and, yeah, and not, and not seeing it as, in some ways, a way to defend your way of life, yeah. defending your access to a, a clean water, defending your access to a stable fishery, clean fish that you can eat, you know, clean water you can enjoy. We talked. I'd mentioned the Interior Department. Um, recently, sitting in the same seat you're in, we had an individual on who um, was with the Nature Conservancy, and we were talking about offshore wind. On the episode when we talked about offshore wind, I had shared a fear of mine, and, and it's a fear of a lot of my friends and associates who are who are involved in the conservation movement, who are public lands advocates, um, and it, it, it's a growing fear that in the pursuit of alternatives, alternative energy, there, we could have some hasty maneuvers that takes some of our last vestiges of, of, of grassland, you know, grassland ecosystems, sagebrush ecosystems, move it to alternative, move it to solar arrays, wind farms, and then a fear that we're going to do this, we're going to make these compromises, everybody's going to do it because I think it's the right thing. We're going to exploit a bunch of Bureau of Land Management properties, and then 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, we will see that we have not moved the needle on carbon, and we will have developed and industrialized portions of our landscape. Uh, that, that's a roundabout way of asking that. How, if we pursue moving away from coal, if we pursue moving away from oil, how do you picture doing it where we don't need to have a net new or a radically net new usage of landscape to generate well, let power? Me ask, let me ask you this. I, I presume the Nature Conservancy guy that you were talking to was um, shared your point of view and values, or was he saying, no, we need to do, you know, untethered wind, uh, offshore wind? I don't want to miss, Corinne, help me out. I don't want to misstate <laughs> his perspective, but his perspective was this is the best, the offshore being the best option we have. Okay, well, that's just not true. I mean, the offshore is a cataclysm, and I, I've been fighting offshore wind for probably 30 years, you know, the big the first big one was in Nantucket Sound, and I was representing the commercial fishermen there. And, you know, the problems, it destroys the commercial fishery. And we have a sustainable commercial fishery in Nantucket Sound. You know, we have we have small business people who are the heart and soul of America who have been the oldest industry in our country, 350-year-old industry. And, you know, you put up these turbines and... First of all, it kills the whales. It kills the seals. There's no doubt that that's what's happening. And, you know, we're seeing these it, grounding. It sure, seem, it sure seems yeah. like it. I think that there's a, 
there's ways you can ob- obfuscate that or ways you can act like there's a yeah. little bit of a question. Yeah, but, but, the, if but the there's time a question, lines... there's a precautionary principle. There's only a couple hundred right whales left in the world, yeah. you know. So, uh, and and you know, you, there there there's such a, a, a precise time correlation between them doing the you know the hammering for the uh, to, to put these turbines into the or into the you know with these giant pneumatic hammers which make these reverberations and then the whales all beach with their ears bleeding you know and uh and it's it's happening so reliably and so consistently around all the places where there's this construction it's just a cataclysm and then the other thing is it's not market based it's all subsidy based nobody no. would be buying it nobody would be building these if they actually had a market if we had a free market they're buying them because, you know, President Biden is giving them hundreds of billions of dollars of free money to build these very lucrative towers. And then they're charging a minimum three times the price of onshore wind and usually six times the price. So it's going to turn the whole public against green power because they're going to be paying more for electricity than they are today. None of it makes any sense. You know, and I, by the way, I know a lot about this. I know because I build power plants. I was on the board of, the, or I was a partner in the biggest green tech venture capital firm in the country for a decade. And we built the Ivan Paw plant, which is the biggest solar thermal plant in North America. Another of my companies built the, um, the PVC plant at, at um, I mean, not the PVC, but the, um, the, the uh, um, the solar plant at uh, at Sault Ste. Marie, which is the the biggest um, you know solar panel plant in the in the North America, and I I've I've participated in in wind power and all kind. My brother you know sells wind power for a living. I know what the costs are and the price of wind power onshore wind power right now is about. 11 cents a kilowatt hour and they, these offshore plants are you know are getting 40 or more 40 cents a kilowatt hour or more and and nobody wants to pay that for energy it's destructive and so you know what i think is everything should be market based i think coal should have to internalize its costs and if it did it'd be the most meaning internalize its cleanup and mitigation yeah that yeah. you know you can't have these big piles of you know of uh, you, it, at every stage, coal is getting subsidized. You know, the roads that in West Virginia are 22 inches of asphalt that we pay for because the coal trucks weigh 90,000 pounds, but they're not paying for that. If they were, if that was affected, you know, they can sell coal or, you know, 10 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour in North Carolina, coal, coal um, energy, and everybody thinks this is really cheap. But if it actually had to internalize the cost, it wouldn't be cheap. It would be the most catastrophically expensive way to boil a pot of water that's ever been devised. Because you know, because if they actually had to pay the real cost yeah, of the yeah. acid rain, of the mercury in our fish, of a half a, a trillion dollars a year in in respiratory injuries from ozone and particulates. Destruction of the Appalachians, the, you know, the destruction of habitat. If those were quantified and then billed to their account, you know, the coal burning energy costs forty or fifty cents a kilowatt hour. Nobody would be using it. There, there's no single solution to this. The, the mining that's associated with these new technologies is extremely destructive, and um, you know, with the rare earth minerals, et cetera is extremely d- disruptive to some of the most beautiful habitat places like the Congo, places like Alaska, you know, which are going to get devastated by rare earth mining. And those costs have to be assessed and, and they have to be internalized. And then if you do that, you know, and that's the way to do it. And what, you, what we'll get is we'll get a lot of localized power production. We'll get... Um, uh, you know, not one big bullet solution, but we'll get a lot of smaller solutions. And then there's new, you know, listen, I'm I'm not, you know, I've always said about nuclear power that. This is good because this is my next, this is my next question. Yeah. I, I'm not a subject matter expert. Yeah. 
but I, I just, I'm so far from a subject matter expert. I just can't help though. Um, with thinking that we need to be reinvesting there in terms yeah, of footprint, well, right. In, in terms of footprint. Well, you know, I, I, let me, let me tell you, first of all, what I think, you know, my thinking about nuclear power and it, I no longer consider myself a subject matter expert because I'm told that there are technological improvements that have happened since I was litigating, you know, against nuclear power plants, which I've done a lot of, mm. But what I've always said is I'm f I am for nuclear power if they ever make it safe and if they ever make it economical. Is that and, heavily subsidized? Yeah, it is the most heavily subsidized. Oh. So that but, but that, like no one can do no one can put the seed money up to get that going. No, there's not a single utility in the world that will build a nuclear power plant unless it's fully subsidized. But they also they have a bill called the Price Anderson Act because you know. They say they're safe, but they can't get an insurance policy. So the insurance industry won't write them a policy. Mm. And so it's not a bunch of hippies in tie-dye T-shirts who are saying, you're unsafe. <laughs> it's guys in suits on Wall Street who say, we're not going to insure you. Yeah. And, you know, until they can buy an insurance. So they had to go to Congress and get this act passed called the Price Anderson Act and a sleazy legislative maneuver in the middle of the night to give them immunity from liability. So if their their plan really? blows up, yeah, you and you you go look at your homeowner's policy, it'll have a line in it. And this policy does not protect you from from uh from nuclear radiation from a power plant. And I lived eighteen miles from Indian Point, so I I saw that and it was a possibility this is gonna happen and I lose everything and I'm self insured for that. The insurance company's not gonna pay me. Yeah. So that's what you know what I would say to them get Show us that you can get an insurance policy like other industries, and then we'll believe you're safe. But you know, because nobody wants to argue it with you, just get the insurance policy like everybody else does. And then you know, I mean, the other problem is they don't really know what to do with the ways. It's they they keep when they when they first said it, they said we'll figure that out by the time we need to, but they never have. Yeah. And and there's. You know, they, you have to you have to store this stuff now for thirty thousand years, which is five times the length of recorded human history. So, how could that be economical, right? You're just shifting the cost to a future generation. And, but I I understand there's new technologies that are promising, and if that happens, what I would say to you, what I will do as president, is um, the big problem in our country is we don't have a market markets for energy, real markets. So um, in in North Dakota, you North Dakota is one of the windiest places on earth at sea level. There's enough the scientific American did a study that showed there's enough harnessable wind in North Dakota, Montana, and Texas to provide hundred percent of the North American energy grid. You know, there is enough solar energy in the desert, in an area 75 miles by 75 miles in the desert southwest, to provide 100% of the energy. You wouldn't do that because if a cloud passed over Arizona, you'd black out the country, right? But it, it shows you that the it's out there and available. And um, if you had the technology to you, store it and deliver it, and really, you don't even need so much storage technology if you have transportation technology. So if you have a grid. That is a national grid with DC grid um, that can do long haul transportation of electrons. It reduces your need to store because you can manage the whole system like an orchestra conductor manages an orchestra because the wind in our country tends to blow at night and the sun, of course, shines during the day. Mm. So, and, and the sun shines the period you want it to sun, but you know, the 12 o'clock is peak energy use and that's the time you're getting peak sunshine so it actually and then if you throw in a lot of rooftop solar and everybody is feeding into a marketplace you have abundance of energy to manage the system and let me let me just you know finish this kind of thought in in north dakota i think uh the revenue typical revenue from a, a, a acre of corn is about maybe $200 a year that you're going to get revenue. 
if you have a if you have a wind turbine on that acre of corn, I, I got to interrupt you here to point out for people too that uh, when we're talking about corn, there we're also talking about corn that goes. A lot of that corn goes to energy. Yeah, of course. A lot of so it's, it's, yeah. So I just want people to be clear. It's not yeah. like it's not necessarily moving food no. to energy because you're doing ethanol production. It's not food in any case. It's yeah. a commodity. It's, yeah. it's not even you know. Yeah. It's now all it's, GMO it's Monsanto. Food, Roundup energy, ready. and very, yeah. Yeah. So, but if you have a wind turbine on that property, that farmer is making eight thousand dollars a year, right? So every farmer in North Dakota wants to put a wind wind farm on his property. He can't do it because there's not an energy grid that can get those electrons to markets in, you know, Cleveland, Cincinnati, New Orleans, New York, et cetera, because the current system is antiquated. It's it's um, it's underbuilt, it's underextended, and it's it's incapable. It's an AC grid that's incapable of doing long haul transportation of electrons. If you had the grid there. There are huge amounts of capital from, you know, General Electric, Siemens, Vestas, all the, these giant companies that want to pour money capital into building, into renting turbine, building turbines on those farmers' lands. So the capital is there to do it, and it would provide a huge source of revenue for American farm families, which we we want to keep on the farm. We want to keep them on the land and and make sure that they're prosperous and you know that Main Street is prosperous, et cetera. Um, so we have three different energy grids in our country. They're not unified, and they none of them are capable of doing these things that we need them to do. We need to build that that energy grid, and that you know the same way that we built a canal system in this country, we built a canal system in eighteen twenty five. And, you know, within a few years, New York went from a backwater to being the biggest port in the world because you could, the Erie Canal allowed Midwestern farmers to put their produce on a barge and it would never get off a boat until it went to Europe. So uh, all of a sudden you didn't have to haul stuff over the Appalachians. But the government built that canal system. The government built the highway system. Yeah, that's the thing I was going to mention. Before yeah. you mentioned it, I was going to bring up. People, people, I think, kind of feel like the interstate system sort of fell from the sky. No. It was, it was like in, in the post, you know, like not just the advent of the car, but realizations we had during World War II. It was a like a very deliberately constructed system. Yeah, very, and it was for national security reasons and for commercial reasons and to bring us together as a country, et cetera. And it was, you know, Bill, I watched it, Bill, when I was a kid. It was horrifying to me because they, you know, plowed over the farm, the, the pond where, you know, I went fishing every day and, you know, but, but and it was, but they did it and it's brought tremendous prosperity to our country. Um, and so we need to invest in building this grid, grid system. And then we need to, you know, right now we have a energy market that is um, governed by 50 uh, public utility commissions, 120 control districts with these Byzantine rules, this very balkanized system that, that operates under um, under rules that were written by the incumbents by coal and oil to reward the dirtiest, filthiest, most poisonous, most toxic, warmongering fuels from hell rather than the cheap, clean, green, wholesome, and patriotic fuel, fuels from heaven. Well, we need to create a market. That, now, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a house in Mount Kisco, New York, and I had a state-of-the-art solar system on the roof, and I had a geothermal system in the basement. Every day of the year, that home was producing more energy than I was using. Why can't I send, sell that excess back onto the grid and get the same price the utilities are getting, right? Why can't every American do that? Yeah, I, was gonna, I wanted to ask you about that when this subject first came up. Is that, when you see those little bits of legislation come up, basically saying if you do a solar array on your house, it's a, you can't sell back? Is that is is there any argument for that other than them protecting no, a monopoly? No, there's no, there's no, no they're protecting like, them not monopolies. That's what they're doing. There's there's no other reason no, why. Okay. No, and yeah. we want to do that, and it would it would democratize our country because 
you turn every American into a into an energy entrepreneur, you turn every home into a power plant, you give people a chance to get revenue from their homes to help pay their mortgage, et cetera. And why know, do they, they why do they ever get why do they ever get legislative assistance on those bills that prevent people well, from those, those are those bills are all state law lawmakers who are passing them and they're all you know owned by the utilities. The yeah. utilities are given all the money, and you can buy a state legislature very, very cheap in this country, and you can get that stuff passed. And, to, and most citizens, it's just not on their radar. They just no, don't care. No, it's not on their radar. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it, it's so important for democracy because the, the political systems of countries tend to reflect their economic organization. And if you have the ec economy controlled by a few large energy producers, oil, coal, utilities— the political system will tend also towards sort of a more totalitarian model, whereas if the energy system is controlled by 200 million American homeowners, if they're your generators, you are, you're going to democratize the country as well. And, you know, there, we have such abundant energy resources. We have some of the best solar in the world in this country. We have the best wind of any big nation in the world. And... We ought to be exploiting that, but we we can't do it until we be, be build an energy grid. Now, let me give you an example of what's going to happen. We built an ARPANET grid for the internet, and the, the Defense Department, DARPA, built the ARPANET grid, which is the was the beginning of the internet in this country in 1979. A year after we built it, uh, in 1980, the CEO of IBM said that IBM was getting out of the personal computers because he said it was a dead-end technology. Mm. Okay, and Dell did that. There's a lot of other companies that got out of the business then because they didn't see what was about to happen. Within a few years, virtually every American has a personal computer. And what happened, because we built a grid, we built a marketplace, and what happens happened to the cost of information? It went to zero. Oh, imagine you asked me, it was important for some reason for me to find out the answer to some obscure question like, uh, you know, what was Mao Zedong's typical lunchtime, favorite lunchtime meal? Let's say I had to get <laughs> Free, that. Free internet? Yeah. Yeah, good yeah. luck. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to go to Washington, spend a week going through the Library of Congress to the stacks to dig that out, and yeah. you may or may not find it. Today, you can probably type it into Google and it'll come right up, right? I used to joke uh, <laughs> as a writer, and I got going before, definitely not pre-internet, but before widespread you know, internet use, and I used to joke that I was very anti-internet because I had a competitive advantage, that I was good at finding shit out with the card catalog at the library, you know? And then all of a sudden I was like, no, any idiot yeah, can find out whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're, and I used to, I, I liked it better when you had to work for that. You're right? irrelevant now. <laughs> so your skills are irrelevant. Yeah. You're your big gift. Um, so so the, the cost of information went to zero. And, and that's what's going to happen to electrons if we build an energy grid. The same thing happened with telecommunications. In 1996, President Clinton passed the Telecommunications Act, and he, he forced all the baby bells to consolidate their grid system and create a marketplace where the lowest-cost provider would prevail in the marketplace. You couldn't exclude people anymore. And that created a, a telecom revolution, and all these little devices that we now have, like cell phones, are the are the offspring of that revolution. But what happened to the cause of, of, of phone calls? It went to zero. Yeah. I worked in a university, you know, at law school. and I've, tried, my, I've tried to explain to my kids yeah. <laughs> the thing that would happen of that your parents would present you with a phone bill. Yeah. And you would need to go it through circling. You. <laughs> you would need to go through circling, you know. And you're like, really? That was a... Seven dollars when I called yeah. that guy. You know, oh, well, I remember making a five-minute right? call to England. It was seventy-four dollars, <laughs> and at my university, which is a law school, there was only one professor in the law school that was allowed to have a phone that made international calls. His name was William Vies, and he was the international law professor. Any of the other professors who wanted to call internationally had to go knock on his door and say, "Can I use your phone?" It was great. That's what it was like. Right, and now that call is free. 
And yeah. it's because we built the marketplace, and that's what's going to happen to electrons as soon as we do this. Um, my solution is a bigger solution rather than handpicking, you know, wind, solar, hydro, nuke. What we do is we create a market and let the market pick it. And we, before we get rid of the subsidies, we enforce, we make sure you can't pollute the environment because that's a subsidy. And then we take the lowest cost form of energy in each, you know, in each district that, that uh, and and that is going to, you know, create an economic boom the way that the internet did. But we got to invest in that, in that marketplace. Man, my, it, it's funny, you're, you're articulating a concept to me that I, uh, I'm almost embarrassed that it hadn't occurred to me before. The way you're putting it would be these, uh, this idea of looking at polluters as, um, the subsidy being like, oh no, uh, we gave you that river and yeah. all of the fish in it. You used that you up. You just privatized it. <laughs> right. You used that up. Yeah, exactly. And putting a value and being like, and since you used that up. <laughs> yeah, here's the bill. Uh, I had, yeah, it hadn't occurred to me. Uh, you, yeah, I know you, uh, you've mentioned hydro. I know you've worked on projects around um, protecting rivers from hydro development and damming you spent a bunch of time you know as you laid out with your work on the hudson river uh let's jump over for a minute to the pacific northwest based on your expertise there is well let me let me put it a different way if i came to you and said you have all the power in the world within all the power in the country within practical consideration is there any hope for Pacific salmon in, you know, south of Alaska? Yeah, like you mean the Snake River runs? Sure. Yeah. All the, like, yeah well, that, let's just let's just I, talk about the Columbia. So let's talk about the yeah. Columbia Snake Salmon, right? Like that, the Columbia Waterway. Yeah, I mean, there's How, with, still with some, all the damming, like. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is. You know, but, there is, but, uh, but it, it's I it's a conservation. It. I, it's I, become I, a conservation dependent resource. Yeah. Like we have salmon now because we we spend a lot of money to have salmon. Right, because we we put them in elevators and yeah. you know, lift them up to the top of the dam. So my, you know, I'm any big dam. You know, I there there. I've seen a lot of headwaters dams actually work with minimal environmental damage and you know provide really good local sources of energy. The people, if you put them, you know, these smaller dams that you put up in the headwater before there's any you know complex ecosystems in that waterway, and it really. It, it uh, and they're very very functional and you know I think really efficient. Um, the big dams, I you know I my inclination was, is to take dams down, but I'm also mindful of you know, competing interests. So I would I I, I I don't know enough about all of the Columbia River dams to see which ones should be removed, which ones you know can, and then what happens when you remove them because now they've got. All of this sediment that's you know forty or fifty feet yeah. uh, high behind them, and what does that do to the river when you just when you blow the dam and release all that? Yeah, there's a bit of a ripping off the bandaid effect yeah. on some of that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I'd have to look and see. My inclination would be to try to figure out ways to take all those dams apart, you know, without causing economic cataclysms to you know to other stakeholders. Yeah. It's a. Who, who, can you remember who, who do we have on the representative from Idaho talking about his his? Uh, if you're ever in the White House, you're gonna want to look this guy up. Who's that guy, Mike? Uh, name it. An Idaho representative. He had that very complicated. Not complicated. I don't want to discredit it. He had a, a proposal on on the Columbia about dam removal. Oh, did and, he want the dams removed? Yeah. Good. But like you said, I mean, you have everything from. You know, you have you kind of like a, the Western breadbasket, right? So, yeah. so Mike's, yeah, Mike's, we had Mike Simpson on Tom, but, but I mean, you mentioned, you know, things is shipping. Yeah. Um, you have all that wheat production, which is going out, you know, so by, you know, you'd have to move stuff, barge traffic down to con convert to rail. It, it's a, yeah, uh, you know, it'd take us three days to talk through yeah. that one. Um, well, you know what they one. say about Western water that, you know, um, 
whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and yeah, anytime you start talking about Western water, you're, you know, people want to kill you. Sure. Yeah. Because there's so much economic um, equity, by, you know, built into perverse economic systems, systems that are encouraging people to do bad things with resources. Just because of the way the West was settled, you know, we it was first in use, first, first in time, first in right, um, and all the, these other rules that, and then it, it, use it or lose it. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, if you're an agricultural interest and you don't use your entire water allocation, you use it. So it encourages you to use the most wasteful, water wasteful, uh, you know, grow cotton and alfalfa in the desert. Because, so, you you know, I mean, if you, if you had to design it from the start, you would not design those rules. And now, you know, now you've got uh, 150 years of development that's based upon these perverse incentives and you have entire municip municipalities and, you know, like Scottsdale and Phoenix and that are all essentially unsustainable. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and... The thing I've tried to follow, and I, and I, and the amount of time I have to devote to reading to it, I can't come to an understanding of it. Is uh, where are you on getting on all the state ballots, and what are the hurdles you have to get on state ballots? I, I keep, you know, I read like small lists of states, but then signature gathering efforts. Is there a pathway to? Is there a yeah, pathway yeah. Oh, to all fifty? Yeah, or is that, well, is no, that we, not possible? We, well, it's you know they designed it to be insurmountable for for, for a third party. For ticket. a third party, yeah. uh, the other guys don't have to do it, right? They don't have to do it. They're already on. The Democrat and Republican already have automatic ballot lines. So if you get on their ballots, you're you're in. But I have to do it, and then I also have to pay for my own security because they won't let me have a Secret Service. And that's a big cost, and um, and so I, I don't want this. This is probably maybe of only marginal interest to our listeners. So maybe there's a quick way of doing it. What, what's with the security thing? Like, well, I'm the first. Candidate. So a third party is ineligible for security. No, no, no. Oh. I would be eligible. I, I'm the first candidate, and you know, before my dad was killed, there was no Secret Service until you got a party nomination. Okay. Uh, then, at that that year. They started giving it to everybody. So they gave it. George Wallace was running that year as an independent. Um, you know, George McGovern. I mean, um, uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey, um, Gene McCarthy all got it immediately as soon as my father was shot. And Congress passed a law saying everybody is entitled to it who gets certain poll numbers 120 days outside of the election from the election, in other words, 120 days. We're now, we're now five months and 18 days. So 120 days is what, that's four months, right? No, yeah, yeah, four months. Oh, I'm five months and 18 days out. So in a month and 18 days, I should be entitled, but it's discretionary. So the president can give it to anybody and they've never refused it to anybody. And they've given it to 33 candidates prior to the 120 days. Hmm. And I've had a lot of, you know, sort of dangerous things happen during my campaign. I've had, you know, I've had four house break-ins on one occasion, you know, the intruder got to my second floor with my family all home. And, and on another occasion, a guy showed up at my at one of my rallies in Los Angeles, and he had he was you know he was covered with concealed weapons. He had two shoulder holsters with loaded magazines. He had a backpack filled with guns, including a laser um, a sighted pistol that was fully loaded. He had, he had a couple dozen extra ammunition clips and a lot of other weapons, knives, and all this other stuff. He, had a he, was like, he was like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the end of that movie yeah. Commando when he's got the <laughs> duffel bags. Exactly. Full that's, of guns. <laughs> and that's how he's outfitted. And he had a uh, he had a federal ID, so he had a federal U.S. Marshal badge. Hmm. He had federal ID on his. What belt, was his gripe? Photo ID. Like, what was his? What was his? I, uh, before before he left home that day, 
he made a TikTok tape saying, I'm going out on a mission now. If I don't come back from this, report to your commander-in-chief, Donald J. Trump. Oh, you know, and he was kind of like a, he, uh, he looked like a motorcycle bandit kind of. And that was, that's the only TikTok he's ever made. Hmm. And then, um, you know, luckily one of my security took, look, took a close look at his his U.S. Marshal badge and just said, something looks wrong with it. It looks too too shiny. He was demanding to see me in the the, the green room. And so my guys thought, his U.S. Marshal badge looked too shiny. And they detained him and then they found all these other weapons on him and they called the police. The police came in and, and arrested him and, and, and released him, you know, the next day. So despite the fact he had all this fake ID on him. And so there, there's been a number of things like that that have happened. And, you know, President Biden has made a decision not to uh, give me Secret Service protection. And I'm pretty sure the reason, although I don't like to look into other people's minds, is that they know this is, you know, my security team is costing our campaign a million dollars a month. Mm. And they'd rather me be spending that on security than on, you know, advertising and on ballot yeah. um, access. But the answer to your original question, they, they've tried to make it insurmountable. But we have an amazing team and we have now 100,000 volunteers. We have more volunteers out there than any other campaign. And people are very, very, very happy about signing my signatures. In fact, the professional ballot uh, the professional signature gatherers, and there's a whole industry that that's all they do. They charge typically about 10 bucks to 15 bucks a signature. And it's a big industry. And they're all saying that this is the easiest um, campaign that they've ever done for any purpose, commercial campaigns, referendums, um, that people are, you know, that there's an enthusiasm for signing to get me on the ballot. Whether people want to vote for me or not, I don't know, but they they, people wanted to see me on the ballot. So we've done the two hardest states. We've done California, the three hardest. We've done Texas, which is the hardest of all. We only have 46 states to get 100 and I think 113,000 signatures in 46 days. And we got uh, a quarter million. Um, and then. And it's helpful to overshoot it so that they you go have through. have to because yeah. the DNC. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party are going to come in and go through every yep. signature and try to find a problem with it. Yep. And um, so we we need to get, you know, at least a 60% cushion. We try to get two and a half times. But we're going to get on every ballot. All right. Oh. <laughs> uh, if uh, Trump or Biden came on the show, what, what would be the number one question you think I should ask them? Uh, I mean, I, I'm curious about the lockdowns, about how they feel about that right now. You know, shutting down every business in this country for a year with no due process, no scientific citation, no, you know, no public hearings, no environmental impact statement. And, you know, how they're going to make sure that never happens again. They, you know, they destroyed the middle class in our country. They shifted $4 trillion upward to this new oligarchy of billionaires. They created a billionaire a day in 500 days, you know, and they just devastated a lot of these uh, small businesses that they, that were the heart and soul of our country, you know, are gone and they're never coming back. Um, 41% of black owned businesses, you know, will never reopen. Many of them had three generations of equity in them. And, you know, we're, we're turning now from a ownership society into a, into a, into a rental society. And, you know, when we do that, we're going from being citizens to being subjects. People don't have homes. If they don't have equity, access to equity where they can, pursue their entrepreneurial impulses. You know, our country is then on a feudal model. It's not a colonial model, not, you know, not American mm -hmm. democracy anymore. And I, you know, I would really, I would love to, if I was on a debating stage with them, you know, I would drill down on, on that issue on, you know, why in the world would they close the business? President Trump knew that it was wrong. He said it, he said, I'll never do that. 
And then, you know, he went ahead and did it for a year. And they did it for 500 days, the two of them. And uh, uh, it was just agony for small business people. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, I I guess, I mean, uh, there's a million other things that, you know, I think the issue with President Trump, President Biden, is that they're very different people. They have different dispositions. They have different personalities. They have different ideologies, their rhetoric, the whole way they interact with the public, with the world is, you know, it couldn't be more different. But the actual issues that, they, that they're that they disputing each other on is a really narrow Overton window. It's like guns, abortion, border security, yeah. and a trans rights, et cetera. It's all, you know, they're all important issues, but they're kind of marginal. You know, with exception of the border, which I think is really a, a big, big issue. But the existential issues, the issues that are critical to our survival as a nation, they never talk about. They, you know, we have a $34 trillion debt now. And um, we're spending more on our national, we spend more servicing that debt every year than our defense budget. Within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar that's collected in taxes will go to the servicing the debt. Within 10 years, 100%. This is existential. And nobody, you'll never hear President Biden or President Trump talk about what they're going to do. Why is that? Because they ran up the debt. Mm -hmm. In each of them, four years in office, half of that debt belongs to them. But I mean, that problem too has become... Talking about solving that problem is almost like talking about trying to stop the sun from rising. Yeah, I, I don't think that's true. <laughs> really? Yeah. I don't think that's true. I think there, you know, look, we've got to wind down the military. We got to cut the military budget in half. We can't be the policemen of the world anymore. We're not, you know, doing global hegemony. We need to arm ourselves with the teeth at home. We need to protect the sea lanes and, you know, the neutral areas and have it. And we need to be able to fight the wars of the future. We're we're right now spending nine and a half nine you know half uh, trillion no, what nine and a half billion nine hundred and fifty billion dollars a year preparing for wars that will never be fought again. And you know the whole uh, and, and 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 it's wrong. And we need it's existential if we don't solve the debt. We're, we have the biggest area that we can have savings of the chronic disease epidemic. That's costing us $4.3 trillion. We can end that very, very quickly. $4.3 trillion, five times our military budget. When my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease. Today, 60% do. Why is that? Why did autism go from one in 10,000 in my generation today one in every 10,000 70-year-old men has autism. In my kids' generation, one in every 22 boys. Why did that happen? It, and why did obesity go from 13% when my uncle was president to 50% of our kids today? Why is diabetes? When I was a kid, a typical pediatrician saw one case of diabetes in a 50-year career. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door is pre-diabetic or diabetic. Why is that happening? Nobody's answering those questions. Why did food allergies suddenly appear in 1989? I have 11 brothers and sisters. I had 70 first cousins. Nobody, nobody I knew had a peanut allergy. Why do five of my seven kids have food allergies? Something happened, and we know the year it happened because EPA answered that question, 1989. Something happened that year that ruined our health, and we have the highest chronic disease burden in the world today. Nobody else has this happening like us. We had 16% of the COVID deaths in our country, the highest body count on Earth. We only have 4.2% of the world's population. What were we doing wrong? Whatever we did was wrong. And CDC says, well, it's just because Americans are so sick. Well, that's, you know, why aren't they telling us why? The CDC said the average American who died from COVID had 3.8 chronic diseases. They had obesity, they had diabetes, they had asthma, and one other thing. Why do we have that and nobody else in the world has that? And, you know, we know it was something that happened in 1989. 
or thereabouts. And there's a very famous toxicologist in New York who I've used as an expert in many of my cases. His name's Phil Landrigan. He's looked at this issue and he said, it's, there's only about 13 things that could be. It has to be an environmental toxin because genes don't cause epidemics. They can provide a vulnerability, but you need an environmental exposure. And he said, here's what it could be. It could be glyphosate from Roundup, which follows that timeline. Neonicotinoid pesticides follow that timeline. Atrazine, which is another pesticide on all of our water, 70% of our water now, it follows that timeline. PFOAs and PFASs, these are a class of what they call forever chemicals. I've litigated on them. They made a movie out of my case uh, called Dark Waters starring mm -hmm. Mark Ruffalo. It, it, those are those chemicals are in all of our furniture. They're in our child pajamas, you know. And around, again, around that timeline, um, high fructose corn syrup, okay, follows that that yeah. time. And, yeah. they, and nobody else allowed, allowed when that. It became, it became the leading ingredient for everything. Yeah, for right. everything, yeah. right? Um, cell phone radiation. So, and then the vaccine schedule, of course, which went. Um, in 1989, it was a big change year, but we went from the three vaccines I got as a kid to the 72 vaccines my kids got. And if you look at the manufacturer's inserts, inserts for those products, all of those diseases are listed. The, the neurological diseases, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette's syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism, the autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, juvenile diabetes, lupus, Crohn's disease, all these exotic uh, autoimmune diseases suddenly appeared. Um, and then the allergic diseases, peanut allergies, food allergies, eczema. I never knew anybody with eczema. Every classroom has kids with eczema in it now. Asthma and uh, anaphylaxis and then obesity. All of those are listed as, as side effects. So you have to look at those part of it. Probably what's happening is all of those exposures. Our kids are swimming around in a toxic soup today, and and we're, their their immune systems are constantly being challenged and rechallenged because a lot of these toxics operate along those same biological pathways. Oh, and it and it's the kids probably who have poor mitochondrial function to start off with. The mitochondrial is the energy system for a cell, and if you if you if you target them enough, it paralyzes them and you go into a cascading effect where you end up with brain damage or with autoimmune disease or whatever. So we're probably challenging and re-challenging them and the kids who just have a weaker system who are born with you know mitochondrial dysfunctions, which would never show in typical human, but if you challenge them enough, they assault their immune system enough, that's going to happen. Um, and so, you know, I know how to fix it, and um, and I'm going to fix it very, very quickly. And, you know, you fix it by doing real science at NIH, by doing good science. NIH, when I was a kid, was the premier scientific agency in the world. It was gold standard. There's no other country in the world that has anything like it, and they were doing, you know, groundbreaking on every issue. And in 1980, we passed a law that said, called the Bayh-Dole Act, that allowed NIH scientists to collect royalties on any product that they regulated, if you can imagine that. So, for example, and NIH itself, the Moderna vaccine was created by NIH, and they own half of it. So they're making billions of dollars on sales of a product that they're promoting, mm. that they're mandating. They're telling you. You can't go to work unless you take this product. And they're not telling you they're making billions of dollars on it. The six top scientists at NIH are making $150,000 a year personally on that product. So they're paying for their mortgages, their boats, their schools, their kids' education, their alimonies. And, you know, these are the guys who are supposed to be finding problems in those products and protecting us from them. But instead, they're, you know, they're... They're getting rich on them. And when now you have those kind of conflicts of interest, there was perverse incentives. They, they, uh, it, it makes people turn a blind eye to some of the problems. 
So I'm going to go to, into NIH my first week in office. I'm going to get all of it. And that, what happened when they, after they passed that act, NIH went from doing this cutting edge science of uh, tell us why, you know, how to keep ourselves well. And they became an incubator for new pharmaceutical products. I think it was in, in 20, 2016, there was 220 new drugs or something like that approved by FDA. And 100% of them came were incubated through NIH. So NIH is now just a drug development company. Mm -hmm. And what I'm gonna do is go over there and say, we're gonna give drug development a break. They have a budget of $42 billion. They distribute that to 56,000 scientists at universities who also collect royalties on new drugs. And I'm gonna say, from now on, we're not gonna do anything until we figure out why we have the sickest kids on earth and what are the products that are causing that? And then, you know, I'm going to generate enough science on those to make sure that we can put an end to those exposures. Now, you're going to say to yourself, Steve, that even if you figured out that high fructose corn syrup was the culprit, that you still could never get rid of it because the, 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 the forces behind it are so powerful. It's Monsanto, it's Cargill million farmers who are tied up in its production and you know entire industries and all that's true but the way that you do it is you produce enough science enough uh, and different kinds of science epidemiological studies clinical studies observational animal studies um and 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 you know um and petri dish studies all of those once you get enough science then the lawyers come in and they do the work for you because then they come in. If you prove high fructose corn syrup is behind the childhood diabetes epidemic, mm -hmm. and that the lawyers round up 10,000 kids with childhood diabetes and sue yeah. the company, and that's the end of the show. That's what I did with Monsanto. Everybody said, you'll never, you'll never get rid of glyphosate. But we had 40,000 clients all of them home gardeners, almost all home gardeners who had gotten non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from using Roundup. And um, I remember not to, I remember in my adult life, individuals uh, from ARS, Agricultural Research Services, yeah, the division of the USDA, yeah. individuals from there telling me that Roundup had the toxicity of coffee. Yeah, well, that's what- In, I, in my I, adult life. Well, that's what Monsanto was telling the public. And we got 40,000 people who said, I got cancer, you know, Don Johnson's from this particular kind of cancer from spraying Roundup. We sued Roundup, and, and the way that multi-district litigation works is you get 40,000 kids, you try each one individually, one after the other, back to back, until, until somebody says uncle and comes to the negotiating table. The first case, we won $289 million from Monsanto. The second case, we won $89 million. The third case, we asked the jury for a billion, and they came back with $2.2 billion. At that point, Monsanto came to the negotiating table and said, we want to end this. They settled the case for $13 billion for all of the cases, and they agreed to take glyphosate out of uh, home gardening products. So you can stop them. You just need the right science because once you get the right science, the courts will allow that to be, you know, you, you go to front of a jury and that's what I'm going to do with all of these different exposures. There's only 13 of them. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on today. I'm getting the, I'm getting the times up symbol. I appreciate the conversation, man. It was really fun talking to you, Stephen. I appreciate you coming on. I hope maybe if you get a if you get a chance in the autumn when the falconry seasons opens that maybe you'll come I would like, with no, me. <laughs> I would, I, yeah, I would like to do that. I think it'd be fun. Yeah. Do you have uh, one last question? Do you ever uh, fix up the if you get? Do you ever like cook rabbits and stuff? Do you yeah, get it? Do you, you always know, give I, it to I, the bird? I used to, but my wife Cheryl. That's what I was going to start the show by telling you how much I'm in love with your wife, but I don't <laughs> want to get you. off on I the wrong too. foot. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's very lovable, dude. That, really? that 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 uh, you know, I know she's done many things, but um, I'll tell you one thing. She if I was going to measure like like uh, the highest laughs per minute thing in my life is is. 
curb curb your enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's not just cr- like that, that's, and, and she I, plays I do, such a um, she does such a quiet show stealing job on that show. You know, yeah, she you know. plays common sense. Oh, it's yeah, and it makes everything. No, it's really it's, 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 it's like it's it, it's it's so quietly her her it's so quietly brilliant how she plays that role. Yeah, I mean, Larry, I lived with Larry for two uh, two years in the, during the summer times, and then we vacationed together, and that's how I met Cheryl yeah. uh, when he was still doing the Seinfeld. But he, he, there was one season when he got divorced from Cheryl, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the next season he shot in New York, and that was the season when they shot the producers, and um, and Cheryl was not on that season. Yeah. And then he, the next season, she came back, and I asked Larry about it, and he said, "I couldn't do it. She makes me funny." Which is, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you one thing: she will not allow, which is a dead rabbit in the house or a dead, dead squirrel. So oh no, I, I don't love her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> tell her it's over between us. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Appreciate All right. It. Thank you, so. Steve.